going to um, repeat or read out what is in my heads of arguments, and that should be taken as yes. given, and that we repeat and stand by those um, averments. There are four eliminated yes. points. Uh, there are four eliminated points. Cases. We've just been advised in conference that one of them, non joinder is not being persisted with by either of the respondents. So I won't address that. My focus in my oral submissions to you will be the first two grounds of our review. Which we are namely the on point of question whether or not. Sorry, Sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask? Everyone on the platform to mute and turn off the videos. There is an interference. Mr. Mabunda, can you ensure that everyone is muted and the videos turn off? Yeah. Um, yes. Perhaps, Judge, uh, Mr. Mabunda, Council, Council for uh, the Commissioner can switch his, his camera off because he's still on camera. I don't know whether that affects the feed. Yeah, I think as the book is uh, procedure. Yes, we may proceed, but there is still uh, I think an interference. I can hear the interference, Judge. Um, not sure what I can do about it. Can you proceed and let's see how it goes? As the book is. Justice uh, Matujani, I'm yes. going to be focusing on the first two grounds of review in the oral submissions to you, and those are the Section 79 point, how that is to be understood, and whether its requirements were complied with in this case by the Commissioner. And the second aspect will be the question of irrationality, um, which is the second ground of review. I'll focus on those two aspects. And then time well, not time permitting, I will have to deal with some of the facts. I'm not going to deal with all the facts. Once again, we've set them out in some detail in our heads. But I will focus on some aspects in order to demonstrate that in this case, there was an entirely absent factual basis for the Commissioner's decision. I will deal at the end, um, time permitting justice, with the three remaining eliminate points and with the question of substitute. We, as I say, we have dealt with all of those in our heads and we stand by those submissions. So if I don't have time to deal with them, then we rely upon what is in our written heads of argument. So, if it pleases the court, that is the way I intend to proceed. Now, uh, Justice, um, if we go to Section 79, the Open Commission, Mr. Zuma, appeared to argue that it was not required for the Medical Parole Advisory Board. I'll refer to as the board here after it, to make a positive recommendation in order for Mr. Zuma to obtain medical parole. That's not entirely clear to us from either the answering apparatus or the heads of argument what the basis for this argument is or what the basis was. However, in the committee's heads, a legal argument is raised for the first time. In paragraph 5.7, it is contended that the written medical report referred to in section 79.2b. And I trust you have the relevant provisions to hand there. Um, now, proceed on the basis that you do have sight of, of, of the relevant section that you're dealing with. Um, the contention in the next paragraph 5.7, Justice Mabijani, appears to be that the written medical report that is referred to in Section 79.2b of the Act is only required where the application for parole is by the offender, him or herself, or a person acting on their behalf, and not where, as in this case, the application is by a medical practitioner. Now, we know that the application in this case was by Dr. Mata, who appears to be employed by the Department of Correctional Services. Now, as we intend saying, and just as that argument is entirely without merit. However, even sorry, Mr. Jimmy, can I? Sorry to interrupt you. you. You're not clear. I don't know whether it's your mic there, but you, you're not audible enough. There might be a problem when the record has to be tapped. 
I don't know if you could speak louder and slower so that you should uh, audible. You know. My concern is when the record has to be tied, there are instances where you are inaudible. Um, yes, Mr. Mbofu. Thank you, uh, my Lord. I just wanted to indicate that it's not just on your side. We also are struggling to hear Mr. Jamie, and now he's completely muted. Justice, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, this is better. Yes. Sorry, Justice, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Very quick. That's very nice. Sorry, Justice, can you hear me now? Yes. I'm terribly sorry for that um, for that glitch. I don't know whether you heard my initial submissions. Should I should I repeat them? Yeah, maybe just repeat your submission. Sorry. Yes. Justice, the yes. I'm dealing I'm dealing first with the section 79 point and the proper interpretation thereof and what it requires, and. We say that both Mr. Zuma and the commissioner appear to argue that it was not required for the board, the parole board, advisory board, to make a positive recommendation in order for Mr. Zuma to obtain medical parole. Now, we say it's not entirely clear from the answering affidavits, or from the heads for that matter, what the basis for that argument is. However, in the commissioner's heads, there's a legal argument put up for the first time you find that in paragraph 5.7 of their heads, where it is contended that the written medical report referred to in section 79.2b of the Act is only required where the application is about the offender, him or herself, or a person acting on their behalf, and not where, as in this case, the application is by a medical practitioner. Now, we know that in this case, the application for parole was by a medical practitioner, Dr. Martha who appears to be an employee of, of the Department of Correctional Services. So that's, that appears to be the legal basis for the argument. Now, as we are going to show, Justice, the argument is entirely without merit. I, however, even if it had legal, uh, a legal foundation, it would not take the matter anywhere, insofar as Mr. Zuma and the Commission are concerned, as the jurisdictional requirements of section 791A remain. So regardless of <clears throat> the way in which those requirements are satisfied, the fact of the matter is section 791A is the governing provision and its requirements as they appear from the act are mandatory and must be complied with. Now, J Justice, I take it that you have the Correctional Services Act and its relevant provisions to hand. Yes, yes. As the court business. Um, section 79, Justice, is located in Chapter 7 of the Act. And those provisions run from Section 73 to 82. If I can ask the court to go to Section 73, that's the basic, the default position, 73.1. says, subject to the provisions of this Act, a sentenced offender remains in a correctional centre for the full period of sentence, and an offender sentenced to life incarceration remains in a correctional center for the rest of his or her life. That is the default position. Then you have subsection 4, 73.4. In accordance with the provisions of this chapter, a sentenced offender may be placed under correctional supervision, day parole, parole, or medical parole before the expiration of his or her term of incarceration. And the important words there are in accordance with the provisions of this chapter. <clears throat> now, the one provision, um, Justice, which I must draw to your attention, which is not um, 
contained in Chapter 7 and which is relevant to Section 42. If one goes to Section 42, that section deals with the case management committee, which must be established at every correctional centre. And in terms of 42.1d, one of its obligations is to submit a report together with the relevant documents to the correctional supervision and parole board, which in common parlance is called the parole board, regarding a range of matters, one of them being what is dealt with in 42.2d Roman 7 which is the possible placement of such sentence offender on day parole, parole, or medical parole, and the conditions for such placements. So that is section 42, and it indicates how one of the ways in which a medical parole application can originate. It can originate from the case management committee at a correctional service or correctional center. Now to get back to chapter seven justice, and you will know that one of the arguments of our learned friends who oppose us is that we have this entirely wrong, uh, our whole legal approach is wrong, and that 79 is not of application, and that this um, parole application in respect of Mr. Zuma was undertaken in terms of section 75. Now, we disagree with that contention and interpretation. If one goes to section 75, um, Justice, its introductory words, 75.1, a correctional supervision and parole board, the parole board, having considered the report on any sentence offender serving a de determinate sentence of more than 24 months, submitted to it by the case management committee in terms of section 42, which I've just alluded to, may, and then A, is place a sentence offender under correctional supervision or day parole or grand parole or medical parole. So this is what the board can do. And then B is, in the case of a dangerous criminal, make recommendations to the court. And then C, in respect of um, a sentence of life imprisonment, make recommendations to the minister. Now, this is of some importance, Justice, because you will see the role players identified in 75.1 and its various subparagraphs contain a numerous clauses of the persons who can grant parole, including medical parole. They are respectively the board, the commissioner, the court, obviously, which is not involved here, and then finally the minister. And the minister is implicated in the case of life incarceration. So that's the numerous clauses of the actors who can participate in um, a medical parole, specifically for our purposes, application and decision. And we submit that that is the principal purpose of 75. If one looks at 75, and goes through its various provisions, you will not find any um, provision in that section dealing with the criteria for any form of parole, including medical parole. Um, and that is the relevance of that um, justice is that that section 75 is not intended to do the work of delineating and indicating what the requirements are for parole at all. With regard to the architecture of the act, could I ask the court once again to have regard to section 42? Because section 42 provides the criteria um, justice for a parole application and consideration and decision. You find it in 42.2d, and if you look at that section, it requires regard to be had to the offence for which the offender is serving uh, a sentence, the previous criminal record, his conduct, likelihood of a relapse into crime, etc. All the typical considerations which a body that's considering parole must have regard to. None of those provisions are to be found in 75. And 75 must thus be read um, together with other provisions of the Correctional Services Act, which do provide the substantive content for a determination of any form of parole. So 42 does the work of delineating the ordinary parole considerations to which regard must be had. It doesn't deal with the requirements for medical parole, nor does 75. Um, 75 
as we as we know justice, and this is the provision that's relied upon by um, the commissioner and Mr. Zuma, contains 75.7, which says, despite subsections one to six, the national commissioner may place under inter-alia medical parole an offender serving a sentence of less than 24 months. Now, that is what applies in the case of Mr. Zuma. He was sentenced to 15 months. And we have no quibble with that, that the source of the power of the commissioner, of course, subject to any delegation, which he can always withdraw, which is what he said he did in this case. We have no quibble with that from a legal point of view. We don't challenge his withdrawing his delegation and taking the decision himself. But all that 75 does, Justice, is to indicate who the actors are who may act. And in 75-7, we see it is the commissioner subject to any delegation. We're having a difficulty with that. But what you won't find in 75 is any indication of how he must do it and the factors to which he must have regard. That is not to be found there. That is to be found squarely in Section 79. And Section 79, Justice, in our submission, is the fonts at origo of what the commissioner must do. So we've now established he may do it, but how does he do it? And if one goes to 79 and goes through it carefully, you will see that it makes entire, entirely sense our approach to the matter as opposed to our learned friends. 79 is the governing provision and 79 applies to any um, parole application, whether it emanates under Section 42 from the Case Management Committee or from any of the other parties who may apply for medical parole. The first point to note about 79.1, Justice, is that it refers to and covers all the possible actors who may grant medical parole. That is apparent from 79.1. Any sentence defender may be considered for placement on medical parole by the National Commissioner, the board or the minister, as the case may be, precisely because 75 indicates who may do what, under what circumstances. Now, here is the crucial part of this case, if, and then there are three requirements. The first requirement, Justice, is a medical requirement. Such offender is suffering from a terminal disease or condition, or disjunctive, if such offender is rendered and these words are important, physically incapacitated. Not mentally or otherwise, but physically incapacitated as a result of injury, disease or illness, so as to, and then these words are also important, severely limited, sorry, severely limit daily activity or inmate self-care. Now, unfortunately, none of these words are defined in the act, terminal disease or condition, physical incapacity, a daily activity or inmate self-care. They're not defined. But indisputably, they all refer to medical requirements. So that's the first thing, or the second thing, rather, to note. The third thing is that um, B and C of 79.1, and we say they are properly construed to be conjunctive. In other words, all three must exist together. The second requirement is the risk of reoffending is low. And C, there are appropriate arrangements for the inmate's supervision, care, and treatment within the community to which the inmate is to be released. Those are the three jurisdictional requirements for a medical parole decision to be made. And if all three of them are not present justice, then an inmate may not be granted medical parole. We submit that is clear from the very clear language of 79.1. Um, and we assert and submit that the A requirement, terminal disease or physical incapacity, can only be decided and determined by a doctor, a medical practitioner. The functionary who acted in this matter, Mr. Fraser, who was the National Commissioner of the time, on the papers, not in dispute, is not a medical practitioner. He has no medical knowledge, expertise, or expertise. He's not in a position to make that decision as to whether any particular inmate is suffering from a terminal disease or condition or is physically incapacitated in the manner required by the section. Where his expertise comes in, Justice, is in determining B and C, and we accept that, that he may determine B and C. Obviously, he must have facts at his disposal to do so. And if challenged, he must be able to justify those facts. But we accept 
the source of his, um, that he made his side, the PNC. Now, justice, who can apply for medical parole? That is dealt with in sub two. It must be done firstly in the prescribed manner, and that is prescribed by regulation. And it may be done by one of two um, persons, either a medical practitioner or a sentenced offender or someone acting on his behalf. And then 2B says, in the case of an application by someone acting on behalf of or by an offender himself, the application will not be considered by, once again, the full um, gamut of persons who can make such a decision, the National Commission, the Board, or the Minister, as the case may be, unless it is supported by a written medical report recommending placement on medical parole. In sub three, I mean sub C rather, 79.2C deals with the content of that report. It must contain a complete medical diagnosis and prognosis of the terminal illness or physical incapacity, a statement by medical practitioner indicating whether the offender is so physically incapacitated so as to limit daily activity or inmate self-care and reasons as to why the placement should be considered. Now that, that makes complete sense, that list of requirements, because that tracks um, what is required by 79 a to be established before you may obtain medical parole. Now, Justice, we then have 79.3a, which says that the minister must establish the board, the Medical Parole Advisory Board, to provide an independent medical report to once again the commissioner, the board, or the minister, as the case may be, in addition to the medical report referred to in sub 2c. So this is the second report which the Act, the section requires. There must be an initial report, which is referenced in 79.2a, and then there must be this independent report. And then 3b says that nothing in the section prohibits a medical practitioner or board from obtaining a further medical report from a specialist practitioner. So the section overall um, contemplates at least three possible reports, possibly more, if there's more than one specialist report. That is the essential architecture of the provision justice. And the important point that we say the court must draw from section 79 is this. The legislature quite clearly intended the board to play a significant and indeed central role in the determination of medical parole. And we'll come to what that role is. It's to be found in the regulations. With regard to the regulations, the other relevant aspect of 79 is that it deals in 79, before I go there, can I just point out, Justice, that in considering medical parole in terms of 79.5, the Act or the section directs attention to be given to the following matters, and they are to be found in 79.5. Um, and once again, they are the type of, and it, it demonstrates that the legislature was not concentrating solely on the interests or the position of the offender who applies for medical parole. It still requires attention to be given to other factors, such as whether, and you'll find them in A to E of 79.5, whether at the time of sentencing, the presiding officer was aware of the medical condition, any sentencing remarks of the trial judge or magistrate, the type of offence and the length of the sentence outstanding, the previous criminal record, etc. And, and then a pointer back to, to section 42, any of the factors listed in section 42 2D, which I've already alluded to. So the, the legislation requires a balanced approach to be adopted to medical parole. The mere fact that you are ill or incapacitated does not mean that you get a free pass out of jail. Now, the last submission I want to make about 79 is 79, draw the court's attention to 79.8, which requires regulations to be made within six months after the act comes into existence. And then importantly, Justice 79.8b, the regulations must be submitted to parliament for approval. So these regulations are not your um, run-of-the-mill regulations that we find every day in, in, in our work. These are a special species of regulation which requires parliamentary ap approval. In other words, it enjoys 
we would submit a higher status than regulations that are simply brought into existence through the executive minister. Um, the other, sorry, the other submission I just want to make in order to deal with what I submitted to you earlier was the new argument which we found in the Commission's heads, i.e. that 79 doesn't apply, or rather the report that is referenced in 79 2b and c is not required when the application for parole is by a medical practitioner as opposed to the offender him or herself or someone acting on their behalf. I said the argument was without merit and we were going to explain why and this is the reason, Justice. The reason why it was necessary specifically to refer to the need for a report, a medical report in 79.2b and to indicate its contents in sub C is precisely because if the application for medical parole is brought by someone other than a medical practitioner, they may not have that information at their disposal. And you simply cannot bring a medical parole application without those, without a medical, medical report that deals with the matters set out in sub C. By definition, I for to your eye, where the application for medical parole is by a medical practitioner, there would be a medical report, which would be the application itself, which would be, be attached to the application. And it would obviously deal with those factors, which are found in C. Thus, it was unnecessary and would be superfluous and incongruous to require that of the medical practitioner. That is the reason why the, the section differentiates between the two types of applications which may be brought. Nothing further can be read into it. And the notion that you don't have to comply with 79's requirements when a medical practitioner is the applicant only needs to be stated with respect, given the statutory architecture of the Act and the contents of the section, to realise that, that cannot simply that simply cannot be the way to understand this. So we submit there is nothing in the Commissioner's new argument which assists either him or Mr Zuma, and it doesn't justify um, what was done in this case. If I can now go to the regulations, ju Justice, and ask you, do you have a copy of Regulation 29A at hand? We understand yes, that we, yes, have, we have uploaded a bundle on case lines and, and as the regulations. Now, I'm working off a slightly different bundle, but I can't give you a page number to the bundle. It's, it's page 11, Justice. I do have it. You have it. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Now, the regulations govern, obviously, um, the matter together with the provisions of the Act. The regulations are not challenged by anyone and have not been challenged by anyone, so they stand. I've already made the submission that these regulations were approved by Parliament. The content of Regulation 29A is dispositive, we submit, of the respondent's case and indicates in um, unambiguous terms why the DA and the other applicants are correct in their approach to the matter. Um, sorry, one provision that I omitted to draw to your attention in my discussion of the architecture of the Act is Section 6.5 of the uh, Correctional Services Act. That is a section which I'm sure the Court would be well aware of and familiar with, which requires, as soon as possible after admission, the undergoing of a health status examination by every inmate who is admitted into a correctional facility. They must undergo a medical examination as soon as possible after admission. That is required by Section 6.5. Now, we can accept, Justice, that Mr. Zuma, I think the papers, in fact, advert to this, <clears throat> underwent such an examination. So, Regulation 29A1 says, if it is established by the health status examination as contemplated in Section 6.5 of the Act, or any subsequent health status examination that a sentence, a sentence offender is suffering from a condition of which the prognosis indicates a condition listed in subregulation 5, such facts must be recorded. Then two, an application for medical parole in terms of section 79.2 of the Act. That is the only mode, it's the only route to a medical parole application. It's the only route you can follow, not, not 75. You will find no reference in, to 75 
in this regulation. An application for medical parole in terms of section 792 shall be initiated by the completion of the applicable form as contained in Schedule B. Then three, when the head of a correctional services center receives an application for medical parole, he or she must refer the application to the correctional medical practitioner who's a correctional services official, justice, who must make an evaluation of the application in accordance with the provisions of section 79, once again, and make a recommendation. Then four, the recommendation must be submitted, once again, to the board, who must make a recommendation to the national, sorry, to the Medical Parole Advisory Board, which is the board at issue here, which must make a recommendation to the National Commissioner, the Parole Board, or the Minister, once again, as the case may be. Now, sub-regulation 5 of Regulation 29A has a list of dread diseases and conditions. And what this regulation contemplates is that, prima facie, if you're suffering from one of these, Justice, you will, it will be possible for you to be considered for medical parole as you would almost certainly fall within the ambit of 791A, i.e. a terminal condition or physical incapacity. And I'm not going to run through them, but they contain a veritable list of dread diseases, including stage four cancer, um, AIDS, um, cardiac disease with multiple organ failure and the like. Now, um, sub six says the board, the medical advisory board, may consider any other condition not listed in sub regulation five, if it complies once again with the principles contained in se section 79 of the act. In other words, if you are either terminally ill or physically incapacitated, so as to bring yourself within the ambit of 791A, then that could be considered even if it's not one of these conditions. Now, here is the crucial provision, which we say puts an end to the respondent's case. The Medical Parole Advisory Board, this is sub-7, must make a recommendation to the National Commissioner, the Parole Board, or the Minister, once again, as the case may be, on the appropriateness to grant medical parole in accordance with Section 791A of the Act. Not Section 75, this is Section 791A. Couldn't be clearer. And here is the provision. If the recommendation, if the recommendation of the Medical Advisory Board is positive, then the National Commissioner, the Board or the Minister, as the case may be, must consider whether the conditions stipulated in 791B and C, i.e. the non-medical provisions, are present. Now, nothing could be clearer, and we are not for a moment suggesting, Justice, as I think we may be criticised for doing, that you interpret the provisions of the Act in terms of regulations. You can't do that. That's against legal principle. We're not submitting that. We're submitting something different. We say that the drafters of the regulations, subsequently approved by Parliament, understand quite correctly the act as we do and in the only manner that it can be understood there's only one route to medical parole that's 79 and if you don't comply with 79 you out and in order to comply with 79 you must also comply with the regulations and in particular regulation 29 a 7 which was not complied with deliberately and unambiguously by the um, authorities in conclusion on this point, before I go on to the facts, <coughs> just, just make the point, and I'm not, I don't have the time to go there, but nowhere, you, you will search the two sets of answering affidavits. You will not find any assertion in those documents that as a fact, Mr. Zuma is suffering either from a terminal condition or from physical incapacity so as to render him within the scope of 79 1 and we submit the court, in fact, on the latter aspect, can take judicial cognizance of the fact. Well, first, it's a legal submission. Secondly, the judicial cognizance. The first point is, as I've already submitted, Mr. Zuma would have, upon his admission to escort correctional facility, un have undergone a health status examination. That was, he did, it's in the papers, I'm told. And that would have been on the 8th of July. The early hours of the 8th of July, or maybe the 9th of July. What is significant, Justice, is the papers are silent on any, in fact, don't suggest at all the answering affidavits and the documents put up as part of the redacted record do not suggest that any life-threatening condition was detected on the 8th of July when Mr. Zuma was admitted. 
But suddenly, we know from the papers, the commission's affidavit says on the 23rd of July, Mr. Zuma's condition began deteriorating, and then there were a series of medical reports and interventions. But the point is, as I'll show you in a moment, his condition had been deteriorating. Whatever his condition is, it had been on the decline since 2018 in terms of Dr. Martha's report. There was no sudden onset on these papers. There was no sudden onset of a terminal condition or physical incapacity. And on the latter score, Justice, the judicial cognizance, you with respect can take judicial cognizance of the fact that Mr. Zuma is on the public stage just before his admission to, to, to prison, he conducted a very uh, well-publicized um, press conference at his home in Nkandla without a mask, flanked by his legal representatives. He was in a, if I may say, a combative mood. He was defiant of the constitutional court to the end. There was absolutely and is absolutely no indication that he is physically incapacitated as required by 791A. After his release on medical parole, again, well publicized, he visited a casino in, 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 in Durban, Justice, in order to meet political um, um, allies. Absolutely, he was seen leaving his vehicle, going into the casino, coming out with files under his arm, etc. Absolutely no indication of physical incapacity. Um, that is the statutory architecture of the act. If I can now take the court, and I don't have much time on the facts, but if I can take the court to our supplementary filing affidavit justice and to DA 17, which is the application by Dr. Martha. Now, in preparing for the matter, it occurred to me that, can I ask the court, do you have it? It's at case lines 5-89. Dr. Martha's report. Yes, yes. Do you have a justice? Yes, I have it. Yes, I have it. As the court pleases. Sorry. Justice, this document upon um, closer scrutiny is actually, even though we put it up as one document, sorry, go, even though we put it up as one document, it's actually two documents. The document you find at 589 is the Schedule B document referred to in Regulation 29A. Um, two. So this is actually the application for medical parole, this page. And then the document from 90 onward, 590, you'll see at the top, addendum to the medical parole application form and then C, medical report. This is the document contemplated in um, sub-regulations 3 and 4 of 29A. This is the recommendation, or, or sorry, this is the evaluation of the application for medical parole. Um, rather incongruously, since Dr. Martha undertook the evaluation, which you found from 90 onward, he also made the application, which suggests some degree of conflict. But that's not a point we've taken in the papers. So I don't make any submissions in that regard. If I can ask the court to go to page 90, and you will find the first important question, Justice, is to be found at D at the bottom. Now, this is a form. We don't know the provenance of this form. It was presumably drawn up by a functionary in the executive. It doesn't have legal force, the form. And it can't be used to interpret the act, let alone the regulations. But the question asked is, is the offender suffering from a terminal disease or condition which is chronic? is progressive, has deteriorated permanently, or reached an irreversible state? Now, the answers to this uh, question, as inelegantly framed as it is, are significant. Before I get to the answers, can I just make the point, Justice, that this question appears to be attempting to ascertain matters relating to the suitability of an, an applicant for medical parole be given medical parole. In other words, whether the applicant complies with 791A. But it does so in an unfortunate manner because it doesn't accurately or properly or completely track the requirements of 791A. So there is reference, for instance, to a terminal disease, which is one of the requirements. But then it goes on to chronic. Is a condition chronic? Is it progressive? 
Now, the word chronic is not a word that you will find in the Act or the regulations. So the introduction of that concept is confusing. And in fact, having a chronic disease, Justice, is generally the antithesis of having a terminal one. A terminal one is going to kill you in the long term or the short term. A chronic one, even though a very debilitating condition, you can live with for many years. So it's unclear why there's a reference to chronic, but in any event, in respect of the question, is the condition chronic? The answer Dr. Martha gives is yes. And then is it progressive? Again, he says yes. But then significantly, very significantly, in response to the question, has it deteriorated permanently or reached an irreversible state? He does not say yes. He says deteriorated significantly. In other words, on Dr. Martha's own evaluation of the application, based on a medical report which we obviously haven't seen, because Mr. Zuma won't give it to us, the medical report is referenced in this very document, the two paragraphs above, see medical, see attached medical report, see attached medical report. But in answer to that very important question for purposes of this form, has there been a permanent or irreversible deterioration? The answer is deteriorated significantly. In other words, prima facie, this doesn't bring Mr. Zuma with him 7918. Then also, interestingly, there's a definition of terminal disease or condition in, at, the, at the foot of this page. A terminal disease or condition is a condition or illness which is irreversible with poor prognosis and irremediable by available medical treatment, but requires continuous palliative care and will lead to Im imminent death within a reasonable time. We have no quibble with that definition. It accords on our instructions generally with how physicians consider terminal conditions. Now, if you turn the page, Justice, um, page 91, E, the E question, what is the long-term prognosis? And we struggled to make this out. It seems to say referred to report, but I can't be clear on that. And then F, is the second crucial part of this document, because F says, the question is, is the offender able slash unable to perform activities of daily living and self-care due to the above mentioned, if unable, please attach occupational therapist report. Now, this is an attempt, again, it doesn't do so correctly and completely, but this is an attempt to track and ascertain whether the person falls the applicant for medical parole falls under the second of the stipulated conditions in um, 79, 791A. In other words, if you're not terminally ill, are you so incapacitated as to bring yourself within 791A? This is an attempt to ascertain that. Now, the answer here is entirely destructive of the respondent's case for medical parole, because the answer is patient is under full-time comprehensive medical care of medical team. That's all it says. It doesn't answer, and it also does not delete, as clearly the question intends, one of the options. Is the offender able slash unable? To answer the question and to bring Mr. Zuma even remotely within 791A, Dr. Martha had to delete the word able and to convey that Mr. Zuma was unable to perform the activities. But even that, so he fails at that level, the application, or rather medical parole fails at that level. But even if that is not so, which we submit indisputably it is, the other problem is that ordinarily a medical practitioner would not be in a position to opine about whether a person is so physically disabled so as not to be able to undertake the various activities of daily living, precisely because that's not within the um, the heartland of what a doctor does, a physician does. That is left to another specialist, usually an occupational therapist. That is why in this questionnaire, Justice, in brackets after the question at F is the, is the following. If unable, please attach occupational therapist report. So the architecture of this form requires an occupational therapist report if the assertion is that the person is so unable to look after them, or so, sorry, is so physically um, incapacitated that they can't look after themselves. A doctor say so would not be sufficient. 
there has to be an occupational report. So that, with respect, um, is, un is, is the difficulty that um, is faced. I'm told I have five minutes left, Justice. So I've run out of time, except to wrap up. We submit that on a factual, and, and I trust my, Lynn, my two Lennon friends for the other applicants will deal with such facts as I haven't been able to deal with. Um, and, and sorry, the last submission I want to then deal with is the argument that you find at paragraph 514 and onward in the commissioner's heads of argument. I'm not going to take you there. I'm just going to summarize the argument in our response. Um, the argument is, Justice, that the commissioner in approaching the question of um, whether Mr. Zuma should be admitted to medical parole um, approached the matter on the basis that he exercised a true dis discretion where he had to determine the weight to be given to different competing factors, both those for and against Mr. Zuma being granted parole, and then had to strike an equilibrium. That is the language of Beta Star. It is entirely inappropriate in this case. There is no balancing exercise to be undertaken. As we've submitted, Justice, if 791A is not present, if its requirements are not met, that's the end of the matter. And as I've submitted to you, if the requirements of Regulation 29A7 are not met, which indisputably they're not in this case, that's the end of the matter. There was nothing for Mr. Fraser to balance. In approaching the matter on that basis, that he had a free discretion, and he says the positive factors were all the medical reports, which I'm sure some of my learned friends will refer to, but which are referenced in our heads, were all the reports which um, recommended medical parole, including Dr. Mtats was one, and he, as you will recall, was a member of the board. The only negative um, um, factor they say, or, or Mr. Fraser says, or rather the commissioner says in their heads, is the negative um, recommendation by the medical board. Well, unfortunately for them, Justice, that negative recommendation is a, a positive um, jurisdictional requirement for medical parole to be given. And absent it, the route to medical parole for Mr. Zuma was closed. Mr. Fraser never got, never should have got, to 791 B and C. He was precluded from getting there because Mr. Zuma did not pass 791A. So there was no balancing. And if authority is required for the fact that where there is a necessary precondition in the form of a jurisdictional fact that must be um, present, and if it's not present, the authority has no power to act. If authority is required for that, we submit trite proposition of law which is entirely destructive of the commissioner's argument, then it is to be found in Kimberley Junior. This is cited in our heads of argument and in the authorities bundle that we've uploaded to case lines justice. It's Kimberley Junior School of the Education Department, a decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal, and the reference is at Perry Little, and I won't repeat it. Um, so for all those reasons, Justice, and for the reasons that our learned friends for the other applicants will advance, we submit that the, and, and can I just deal um, with, with two final submissions? The first submission is that if we are correct on either the um, 79 point or the irrationality point, because with regard to the irrationality point, which is our second point, the, the basis of that is that you will look through, and we've referred to all of this in our heads, so I'm not going to repeat it. We've gone into detailed um, reference to it. None of the medical practitioners who recommended medical parole, none of them, not a single one of them, says as a fact that Mr. Zuma suffers from a terminal disease or is physically incapacitated as required by 791A. In fact, the high water mark of their case is Dr. Mtatswa's um, report. And there you will recall all that he says is that um, Mr. Zuma suffers from multiple comorbidities which affect his, um, his condition. And we don't dispute, Justice, no one with common sense would dispute that for a 79-year-old person, and indeed anyone, to be 
locked up in prison is not a happy circumstance and not a desirable one. But unfortunately for Mr. Zuma, the rule of law must um, trump his own personal um, interest in this in this case. And absent the necessary um, compliance with the act and the regulations, he cannot be given medical parole. I'm told by Mr. Willifi that from my time is up, Justice. I'm sorry that I haven't allowed you an opportunity to ask any questions. I don't know whether you have any questions for me. Just one question from, from my part. Assuming I'm with you, assuming I agree with you, which is not the case, is there a bar to my remitting this matter to the parole review board for reconsideration, especially in light of the fact that the former president, Mr. Zoom, now qualifies for ordinary parole, a matter that was not uh, before the parole review board. Justice, if, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, no. Um, in our heads of argument. Yeah, sorry, Justice. Yeah, you are saying. In, the matter, in our, you are saying the matter can be. You are saying the matter cannot be remitted to the co, uh, to the commissioner because he has no power to release Mr. Zoom. That's your argument, if I understand it correctly. But I want to find out. Yes, Joseph. I want to find out whether can I remit this matter to the parole board with an order that they must reconsider their decision, especially in the light of the fact that he now qualifies for ordinary parole. Justice, um, we, in our final paragraph, I think, of our heads, make the point that if you find for us on the legality or the irrationality point, in other words, the Section 79 point, then it's a foregone conclusion that absent the positive recommendation from the parole, the medical parole board, Mr. Zuma cannot get medical parole, and thus there's no point in remitting it. If you find for us on one of the other grounds, yeah. then you should remit. So that's the one argument. The second yeah, argument is there is at the moment, I'm sorry to interrupt you, there is at the moment no application. We accept he's now served a quarter of his sentence. In fact, I think it's either today or very recently that that time runs out. So he's now eligible, eligible justice or ordinary parole, not medical parole, ordinary parole. But that's an entirely separate matter. That's dealt with in a different section, as I've indicated. If you make such an application, the relevant authorities will have to consider it and decide on that application. And if we're unhappy with, or anyone else is unhappy with that decision, that's something for a different day. That's not relevant to your decision today, that the matter should be remitted in order for parole um, application to be considered because there is no no such application at the moment. If there is, but if I understand the papers correctly, yes. the reason why the parole board refused to recommend his release on medical parole was because there were certain outstanding documents that the former president refused to provide. No, 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 no. So, say, no. no I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's that, that's not correct. The the medical parole advisory board justice um, considered the matter on three occasions, two occasions in August and finally on the eighth of September, and or the, or sorry, the third of September. And on the first two occasions, there was there was insufficient documentation, and they requested further investigation and documents. But on the third occasion, they had all the documents that they required. Mr. Zuma never refused, he couldn't have, refused to disclose his medical reports to the board. He made full disclosure to the Medical Parole Advisory Board, and they considered the matter. Just, you find it in the heads. Um, I'm just looking for, because we have actually... Um, yeah, just give me a reference to the paragraph of the heads, please. Um, we reference the final conclusion by the by the um, Medical Parole Advisory Board, and it's clear from that, I, I hope to find, I'll give it to you in reply if necessary, Justice, that they had all the information and they were satisfied on the basis of, of the information they had. 
he didn't meet the requirement for medical parole. And they say as much. Sorry, it's paragraph 20 of our heads. Yes, the decision of the medical parole board is to be found at paragraph 20 of our heads, Justice, and it says not recommended based on the following. The board appreciates the assistance from all specialists with provision of the requested reports. They had all the reports. The board also notes and appreciates the use of aliases and has treated all submitted reports as those pertaining to the applicant. From the information received, the applicant suffers from multiple comorbidities. His treatment has been optimized and all conditions have been brought under control. From the available information in the reports, the conclusion reached by the board is that the applicant is stable and does not qualify for medical parole according to the act. That was a final definitive conclusion with all the facts at its disposal. And that shuts the door on medical parole. Whether Mr. Zuma qualifies for other parole justice, Matijani, is a different question. But with respect, you would not be entitled to refer the matter back for the commissioner to decide a non-existing application. The only application that there was and that we are reviewing is the medical parole application. There is no application for ordinary parole. We accept that he can, as a matter of law at this point, apply for ordinary parole. I don't know whether I've dealt adequately with the question. Yeah, thanks. I'm satisfied. As a good business, we then ask for, if you are with us, for the cost of two counsel. If we are unsuccessful justice, then BioWatch immunizes us from having to pay the commissioner's cost. As the court pleases. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mr. Duplessis. Thank you, my, thank you, my lord. Let me just double check that you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, my lord. For the HSF, we stress with respect, my lord, that for all the paper, this case is in truth a simple one, both as a matter of law and as a matter of fact. If I might just give my Lord something of a roadmap or an overview of what I'm about to say. First of all, my Lord, we say that for all of the defences, and there are many of them raised by Mr. Zuma and Mr. Fraser, we say the case remains simple because of four critical principles of judicial review. They are <clears throat> critical principles from which there is no escape, and each of them has been stressed by the Constitutional Court. Once I've had an opportunity to set them in place for my Lord, um, and of course, just to do so by way of summary, because we've already done this in detail in our heads. Well, then once they're in place, my Lord, then with respect, the road ahead is clear. Because despite the number of off ramps and dead ends and, and there are speed bumps uh, uh, plenty that the respondents have thrown up in defense, the case remains on these established principles, a straightforward one. The second thing I wish to do, my Lord, and this is again, simply by giving you an overview, is I want to deal with the merits and I'm not going to go through the multiple errors that we say have been committed by Mr. Fraser. We stand by all of those that have been identified in our heads, my Lord, but obviously given the pressure of time, in our address, I wish to focus on two points on the merits, which show why Mr. Fraser erred on the law and acted irrationally. The first abiding problem I want to highlight for my Lord is <clears throat> that Mr. Fraser thought that he had the power of override, my Lord. He thought that he could better the board's decision or ignore it. But I will show that he had no power to decide or ignore the jurisdictional fact that was reserved to the board. The statutory scheme does not permit Mr. Fraser to become a law or a doctor unto himself. He is, with respect, my Lord, he's the national commissioner. He's not the medical commissar. The second vitiating error committed by Mr. Fraser is a related one. As we will show, my Lord, having taken this power for himself, the National Commissioner then abused it by not bothering to apply the right test for medical parole. And the critical jurisdictional fact in this case is that the inmate must have a terminal illness or a severe physical incapacitation. And I shall show my Lord that nowhere in the evidence or in the National Commissioner's reasons is it ever shown that there is a terminal illness or a severe physical incapacitation that satisfies the test under Section 79. And so what we've got, my Lord, in truth, is that Mr. Fraser has released Mr. Zuma on medical parole, apparently accepting that Mr. Zuma is not terminally ill or is not severely physically incapacitated. And worse, my Lord, he has made up those reasons by misrepresenting what the board and Dr. Martha have said about it. 
And noticeably, we say Mr. Zuma is in the same boat because in his answering affidavit, Mr. Zuma never once says that he has a terminal illness or is physically incapacitated in a way that severely limits his daily activity or inmate self-care. So, my Lord, in short, on the merits, uh, I will show you on the evidence that nowhere is the test for Section 79 met. And as I say, my Lord, those are just two of the very many vitiating errors. But on both of them, the law is so clear, and we say with respect, the evidence is so over overwhelming that Mr. Fraser's defences go nowhere. Again, my Lord, just so that you know where I'm going, after the merits, I'll deal very briefly with relief. I say that because the road ahead is clear on the accepted principles and because the Commissioner erred with such alacrity, we say that the right relief is easy for my Lord to see. To use the words of Justice Fronham and in a recent case in the Constitutional Court, the relief is a no-brainer. And I will say something briefly about that and costs. And my Lord, I will leave with respect um, the issues of urgency and standing and mootness, um, if needs be, um, for later in the argument, perhaps in reply. Given the time, my Lord, I simply have to move immediately <clears throat> to what we say are the important principles of review which keep this case simple. So that's my first point, which I wish to spend a little bit of time on, my Lord. And let me start then by saying that with these clarifying or simplifying principles of review in place, the case really does remain very straightforward. And there are four principles which stand out. Lord, the first principle is that a legality review requires the commissioner to have the power to take a decision, to exercise a power in respect of a jurisdictional fact. And here, my Lord, we say he did not have that power. The jurisdictional fact was clearly reserved for the board. The second principle which stands out, my Lord, is this. It's what I'm going to be calling the Similane principle. And we've referenced the Similane case. My Lord knows it. it's the Democratic Alliance decision of His Lordship, Mr. Justice Yacoub, in the Constitutional Court. It's set out in our heads of argument at paragraph 62 onwards, my Lord. And I'm going to reference the Similane principle because, my Lord, even if Mr. Fraser had the power, he must consider properly all relevant considerations precisely under the Similane test to ensure that the purpose of medical parole can be met under the Act. And here's the critical extra point that Similane brings home, my Lord, for all of us. If he was going to overlook any of those materially relevant considerations, such as the advice of the board, the recommendation of the board, then he would have to provide very good reasons for doing so, my Lord. Here, Mr. Fraser summarily dismissed the board's decision, but there's no proper explanation whatsoever, as I shall show my Lord in a moment when we look at the merits, for ignoring that decision. And the Constitutional Court's decision in Similani, my Lord, makes this court's task easy in confirming this irrationality. Because the Constitutional Court said emphatically, also in a case that had political connotations, also in a difficult terrain, as our learned friends like to call this, where the court was being asked to interfere with a decision at a high level, well, the Constitutional Court said it clearly, my Lord. If there's a failure by a decision maker properly to take into account or explain the failure to take into account a material consideration, then it colors the whole process, to use the words of the court. And importantly, deference doesn't enter the picture. The Constitutional Court in Similani said, irrationality as a review ground has got nothing to do with deference. If a decision is irrational, it's for my Lord to say as much. And no amount of deference can give Mr. Fraser a power that the Lord does not permit him. The third principle, my Lord, is this. If one bad reason featured in the decision-making process if there was one bad reason that was in Mr. Fraser's decision making, then it's not the court's job to search around for sustenance for the impugned decision. And the point can be put through what we've referenced in our heads, my Lord, it's the Rustenberg principle by His Lordship, Mr. Justice Cameron, in the Supreme Court of Appeal. It's a case we've quoted in our heads, my Lord, at footnote 70, paragraph 67, and I shan't take it through them. Uh, my Lord, through it, it's there in the heads. And to, to simply make the obvious point, the rule is clear. It is Justice Cameron confirming a famous rule in the Patel versus Whitbank case, my Lord. And the rule is that if there's one bad point that infects a decision, then the whole decision goes by the board. The rationality of the decision cannot withstand the infestation of that bad point. And His Lordship, um, Mr. Justice Cameron, said the following in that quote, 
He said, Padger does not oblige us as the judges to pick and choose between the commissioner's reasons to try to find sustenance for the decision despite the bad reasons. Once the bad reasons played an appreciable or significant role in the outcome, it is, in my view, impossible to say that the reasons given provide a rational connection to it. So the rationale there, my Lord, is the same as in the Similani case, which I've already referenced. If there's a failure properly to take into account or explain the failure to take into account a material consideration, it colors the whole process to use the different words in Similani, but which are to the, the same effect. My Lord, the fourth principle, and I can be, be brief on it, and that is that you cannot, as a decision maker, make up new ex post facto reasons when the shoe pinches, my Lord. We've explained in our heads that paragraph 57, with all the cases collected there, that this is simply not permitted. It's illustrated, as we've said, in the Supreme Court of Appeals decision in the Zuma case, where the SCA rejected the NPA's revisionist efforts in its answering affidavit, importantly in its answering affidavit, to try and justify the withdrawal of charges against Mr. Zuma. The Lord would have seen the quotation in our heads at footnote 57 from the SCA decision. It's a decision by His Lordship, Mr. Justice Nafsa, where he said this, he said on the 6th of April, 2009, Mr. M. Shea announced publicly that he had made the decision to discontinue the prosecution of Mr. Zuma, and he issued a detailed media statement providing the reasons for his decision, and then the critical sentence, my Lord. It is against those reasons, and those reasons alone, that the legality of Mr. M. Shea's decision to terminate the prosecution is to be determined. Not the renovated ones, my Lord, that came later in the answering affidavit. And we know here, my Lord, that the National Commissioner's reasons are those that he gave when the record was filed. He tells us as much. I'm going to give you the case lines passage in his answering affidavit. It's 005-54, my Lord. 005-54, paragraph 83. There you'll see the National, National Commissioner very candidly says, as stated above, a copy of my reasons for approval of the placement of the fourth respondent on medical parole has been furnished to this High Court and the applicant together with part of the record that was in the possession of the department. So that, that's where his reasons were to be found. He filed them together with a record. He did so, my Lord, and he's not permitted to try and give ex post facto improved reasons in his answering affidavit. And we've said, my Lord, that that's impermissible on account of the Supreme Court of Appeal Authority, full court authority in this division. We've referenced U.S. Supreme Court decisions of just last year, which make the same point, my Lord. And a, a couple of weeks ago, I think 10 days ago, my Lord, in this division, her ladyship, Madam Justice Victor, in the Manuel Chang case, my Lord, her judgment is not yet publicly available, but the summary has been provided to us. And in that judgment, she too confirmed in this division that that is the law, that you may not renovate or excavate new reasons in your answering affidavit ex post facto. You are bound by the reasons you gave for your decision, my Lord. In any event, just to finish off this point very quickly, we say that those new reasons confirm that he, or at least his lawyers, thought that he might have been in trouble on his first set of reasons. But when you go and look at those new reasons, even if one looks at them, my Lord, they are palpably bad. They're the equivalent of self-dynamiting an already torpedoed ship, and I'm going to show my Lord why. So, my Lord, those are the four constitutional principles I stress that are being set in place in, in this particular type of review by the Constitutional Court, no less, and which they are, we commend to my Lord, uh, a very useful roadmap to ensure that the right outcome is achieved, but also to ease the path towards that right outcome. My Lord, let me turn then to the merits. I wish to make three points on the merits. Firstly, um, and uh, aligned with what our learned friends for the DA have said, we say that Mr. Fraser had no power to override or ignore the medical board. And second, if he had that power, he second guessed very irrationally. And thirdly, my Lord, if one looks at his impermissible reasons in the answering affidavit, things go from bad to worse on the irrationality front. Let me start with the first point. We say Mr. Fraser's decision was unlawful because he has no power to second guess the board's determination of terminal illness or severe physical incapacitation. Now, Mr. Jammy, my learned friend for the DA, has already explained the architecture of the, the act, my Lord, and the regulations, and I shan't go through those. We've also set that out in our heads, my Lord. Let me just immediately say, that it is particularly concerning to see an effort by our learned friends for the respondents to try and divorce the power of the National Commissioner under Section 75 to grant medical parole from the requirements, my Lord, under Section 79. 
And that is so not only as a matter of law, my lord, it's also because it's entirely contrary to the understanding that our learned friends themselves must have accepted when they applied for medical parole, my lord. You'll see that Mr. Zuma's application for medical parole was expressly and clearly made in terms of section 79. I'm going to give you the case lines reference, my lord. You'll see it's case lines 004-87. His own application, my lord. Mr. Zuma's own application is headed can you medical the, parole. Sorry, my lord. So can you repeat the case line reference? It's 004-87. Dash eight seven. Yes. And you'll see, my lord, his application is headed medical parole application in terms of section 79 of Act 111 of 1998 as amended. So there it is in bold capital letters, my lord. Mr. Zuma's application was made under section 79. Little more need be said about it, therefore. And in any event, my lord, when we look at Mr. Fraser's decision in his own reasons document, the National Commissioner says that he took the decision by virtue of his power under Section 75 as read with Section 79's requirements. And you'll find that, my Lord, at case lines 004-150. So, my Lord, it's a Section 75 power, but it is hedged about by the requirements in Section 79. And, my Lord, we say that in this case, Mr. Fraser, because of that hedging about, had absolutely no scope to ignore what the medical board had said. And that is clear for two reasons. The first, my Lord, is statutory purpose. And the second, my Lord, are the medical questions that are central within that statutory focus. So the statutory purpose first confirms, my Lord, that the National Commissioner has no power to second guess the board's determination about whether an inmate has a terminal disease or a severely limiting physical incapacitation. Why, my Lord? Because we've set out for you in our heads of argument at paragraph 45 onwards how this amendment came about. What Parliament has done, my Lord, is to ensure that this jurisdictional fact of terminal illness or severe physical incapacity is the board's prerogative, not the Commissioner's. Parliament enacted the current amended version in 2011, my Lord. Before that amendment, a diagnosis of a terminal disease or condition was based on the written evidence of the medical practitioner treating the inmate. And the amendment in 2011 to Section 79 law, and we've given you all the um, history and, and, and we've explained the amendment in our heads, Lord, but that amendment was a sea change in medical parole. Instead of an inmate's own trusted doctor making the diagnosis, Parliament introduced an independent specialist and multi-member body. Why? It did so, my Lord, because the legislative history makes clear that there was a need, a critical need for independence, actual and perceived, which drove the amendment. And the National Commissioner's interpretation, alongside Mr. Zuma's of Section 79, would row back that clear statutory purpose. The second important point, my Lord, is what are the questions involved here? The, the questions that are inherent in the consideration of medical parole. My Lord, those questions are medical questions. We've given in our heads of argument the definition of a terminal disease. And that, my Lord, you'll see in our heads at paragraph 41. And it's that the ordinary meaning of a terminal disease is a disease or condition that results in a short life expectancy of the prisoner where his demise is imminent. My Lord, we know that we're right in that interpretation or in that definition because it's confirmed by the addendum to the medical parole application form itself, the one that was filled out by Dr. Marfa. And you'll see that at case lines 004-110. It says at the bottom of that page, and it's important when my Lord has the time to go and read it, you'll see it says NB, a terminal disease or condition is a condition or illness which is irreversible with poor prognosis and irremediable by available medical treatment but requires continuous palliative care and will lead to imminent death within a reasonable time. That's the medical application form itself. So much for terminal disease. The next thing to ask oneself is, what about a severe physical incapacitation? And my Lord, again, that's a medical assessment under the Act. It's clearly reserved for experts who understand these terms. 
It's alleged by the National Commissioner that Mr. Zuma is physically incapacitated as a result of illness. Well, it's not just any physical incapacity, my Lord, that qualifies an offender for consideration for medical parole. The incapacity must severely limit daily activity or inmate self-care. That's obviously a very high threshold. And my Lord, we attempted to see whether there was any case law on the score and whether there was anything by way of the legislative history that could assist my Lord to understand what that would mean. And my Lord, we have found the notes on the proposed amendments to section 79 of the act which set out the legislative history. And there, my Lord, you'll see the National Council on Correctional Services in 2010 explaining what this amendment would be. My Lord, we put it up for my Lord's benefit at case lines 10-31. You'll see it there, my Lord. And here's the, the takeaway point, my Lord. The council proposed a revised medical parole system. The council proposed that the net be thrown wider under that revised system to include, and I'm quoting now, inmates who are physically incapacitated as a result of injury, disease, or illness so as to severely limit daily activity or inmate self-care. The quote continues, inmates who have suffered a severe stroke will, for instance, be covered under this broadening of medical grounds for consideration of placement on medical parole. So there you get a sense from the council what it thought would be the type of severe physical incapacitation it would be a severe stroke or something akin to that, <clears throat> which would then mean that the person met the test under the Act. So, to pull this down, the Lord, the Act carefully dedicates the side of the decision on this medical jurisdictional facts to the board. And to avoid any perceptions of political interference, it allowed the board, an independent body, to ensure objectivity and consistency to take that decision on those medical issues. It does not allow the National Commissioner the power to do so in his own right. And so if I might move then very quickly from the medical to the legal, because the way to understand this is through the law on jurisdictional facts, with which I think we're all well versed, my Lord. Our learned friend, Mr. Jammy, cited what he called the trite proposition in his right in the Kimberley Junior School case, my Lord. And he, he said he cited paragraph 11 of that judgment. My Lord, we too reference that judgment. We do so at case lines 010-498. And my Lord, we cite paragraph 12. And it's a, law, it's a judgment by His Lordship, Mr. Justice Brunt, my Lord, for the Supreme Court of Appeal. And he says the following, and I'm just going to read it to you, my Lord, because it puts to rest two of the points by our learned friends, which are central to their defense. The passage says this, the type of fact or state of affairs that must exist in an objective sense before the power can validly be exercised is an objective jurisdictional fact. Yeah, the objective existence of the fact or state of affairs is justiciable in a court of law. And then importantly, if the court finds that objectively the fact or state of affairs did not exist, it will declare invalid the purported exercise of the power. So two things from that passage which are dispositive of our learned friends' arguments. The first is, my Lord, is that you can't validly exercise a power if there's an objective jurisdictional fact that has to be satisfied. And here it wasn't satisfied. We know the, the medical parole board said that he was not going to be um, dying of a terminal illness or suffering from a severe physical capacity. And second point, from that passage, my Lord, is that if the court finds that objectively that state of affairs did not exist, it will declare invalid the purported exercise of the power. Deference doesn't enter into the picture at all. So, my Lord, the case by the Helen Sisman Foundation is that the issue in this case, the central issue in this case, is, a, ob, is an objective jurisdictional fact question. It had to exist before the statutory power in Section 75 could be exercised lawfully. And the reasons for us saying so, my Lord, are truly, we say this with respect, obvious. Firstly, whether a jurisdictional fact such as the one here is an objective one, it involves interpreting the empowering legislation. Our learned friend, Mr. Jamie, has already done so. Lord. What we'd stress for my Lord is that a reading of Section 79 makes it plain that whilst any sentenced offender may be considered for medical parole by the National Commissioner, such a consideration may only, only occur, my Lord, if amongst other requirements, the Section 79 1A requirement is met. And my Lord, in addition to that, 
the Section 79.3 requirement is met, namely that there is a recommendation from the independent medical advisory board providing an independent, an independent medical report in addition to the medical report referred to in subsection 2C. So we don't need to get into the debate about whether Mr. Marfa's report was or wasn't that type of Section 79.2B report. What we know is that Section 79.3 makes it palpably clear that in addition to that report, there must have been an independent medical report that was um, produced by the advisory board, because that's the only independent board under the statute. My Lord, the next reason, and it's again an obvious one, my Lord knows these well from interpreting statutes and trying to understand whether there's a subjective or an objective jurisdictional fact arising, is to look at the language here, my Lord. You look at section 79, Nowhere does it suggest that the National Commissioner or the Minister or anybody else entitled to take this decision may, in, in the classic words, my Lord, in his opinion, or if he or she is satisfied, or in his view, come to a decision on medical parole. The statute doesn't include those types of subjective phrases which we usually identify with giving a decision maker a discretion in a subjective sense regarding these types of facts. Now, the statute has no such wording, my Lord. It speaks emphatically about an independent board under Section 79.3, which must provide its recommendation, and that it makes the recommendation in relation to these medical aspects, my Lord. And then, finally, my Lord, we would simply make this point that it would be a farce of the process for the Medical Parole Advisory Board to be tasked with establishing that fact, but for the National Commissioner to depart from it at a whim and to do something else. And we know that that is so because the medical commissioner, as I've said, is not a medically trained doctor. Mr. Fraser has not a jot of medical experience, none. And we know that from Mr. Zuma himself because Mr. Zuma admits that the national commissioner, in his words, is not a doctor to have been expected to make medical conclusions on my medical health, my lord. That, it's an important concession by Mr. Zuma. It's in his answering affidavit at case lines 005, Dash 154, my Lord, paragraph 237. So, my Lord, in conclusion on this critical review ground, we say the board is no mere cipher. It's the board's recommendation, rather than the offender's medical practitioner or an interposer like Mr. Fraser, that must be decisive. And that is for all the reasons we've expressed. This is an expert body comprised of 10 medical practitioners appointed by the minister. At least five, my lord, must be present when the board meets to consider an application for medical parole. The board is designed under the statute to provide an independent report on the application. It was designed specifically to avoid political or other interference in the decision. It acts impartially in relation to the decision, my lord. And it has special expertise, critically, it has special expertise related to the medical parole requirements because that's its task under the statute. It has that special expertise, my Lord, in contrast to the National Commissioner who has no such expertise. And of course, the board's role is to ensure consistency in the application of the Act's requirements. It considers across the country all these applications for medical parole, and it does so through the lens of Section 79's requirements, and it does so in order to ensure equal and consistent treatment here, my Lord, rather than the exceptionality that was on display here by Mr. Fraser's decision. So, my Lord, then let me get to the second point on the merits. I've made the point that there, as a jurisdictional fact, <clears throat> was no power for Mr. Fraser to overrule, sidestep, ignore the board's decision. But let me argue against myself, my Lord. Let me assume that Mr. Fraser did have the power to second guess the board's decision. Well, even then we win, my Lord. We win then, my Lord, because of multiple errors that have been committed. We've identified the multiple errors in our heads and we stand by all of them, my Lord. As I've stressed, it's enough for us to win on just one of those bad errors. And I say that through the lens of both the Rustenberg decision that I referenced for, my Lord, as well as the Similani decision, because both of those decisions conduce to say that if there's a bad decision, it colors the entire process. If it's a bad material decision, which has an appreciable effect on the rationality. And here, of course, this is a central aspect of the case. 
the medical facts are clearly central to the question of whether somebody can be granted medical parole. So it is obviously a material consideration. So, my Lord, we say that the National Commissioner did not give proper reasons why he overruled the board. And we've said so at paragraph 70 of our heads of argument, and we've referenced for my Lord there the Constitutional Court's decision, as I say, in Similani. I shan't go over it again. But what we say is very important to recall is that the Commissioner was going to have to do some very careful explaining, my Lord, if he wanted to get away from the fact that he had ignored or overridden the board. And that mountain was very high for him to climb because my Lord will recall that the board's decision reads as follows, my Lord. It says that the board appreciates the assistance from all specialists with provision of the requested reports. So in the first place, my Lord, there was a series of reports that it had before it. Secondly, the board said, we also note and appreciate the use of aliases and have treated all submitted reports as those pertaining to the applicant. So they knew they were dealing with Mr. Zuma. From the information received, they say the applicant suffers from multiple comorbidities. And then critically, his treatment has been optimized and all conditions have been brought under control. From the available information in the reports, the conclusion reached by the board is that the applicant is stable and does not qualify for medical parole according to the act. It concludes its point, my lord, by saying, the MPAB can only make its recommendations based on the Act. So yeah, my Lord, an expert body, realizing that it was doing its duty under the statute, comes to the view on the basis of a series of medical expert reports that Mr. Zuma is not just not terminally ill, my Lord, not just not severely physically incapacitated. On the other side of the scale, my Lord, they make a finding that he is in fact stabilized and that his conditions are under medical control. Oh, my Lord, instead of carefully and credibly explaining that, my Lord, <clears throat> instead of carefully and credibly explaining that, what Mr. Fraser does is, is he makes reference in various places to numbers of documents which he attempts to use as a basis to get around his ignoring of the objective jurisdictional fact, my Lord. And I'm going to take, my Lord, very briefly um, through them. Before I do so, my Lord, let me just remind you, because the chronology is very important here, that the board produced its final report. And it did so, my Lord, in early September. The board produced its final report after Mr. Zuma had been receiving treatment at a specialized medical facility for nearly a month. You remember he had been temporarily, temporarily released, my Lord, under Section 44 of the Act. And he'd been receiving this medical treatment for nearly a month under that temporary release. And it concluded that his treatment had been optimized and all conditions had been brought under control. So the chronology is important, my Lord, because everything that the National Commissioner attempts to excavate for his reasons comes before the board's final view on what had happened. So let me take you through the various places where the National Commissioner attempts to explain away his overriding of the board, my Lord. The first place is the three medical reports by the South African Military Health Services. We've dealt with this in our heads, my Lord, at paragraph 71.2 onwards. And my Lord will know there are three reports uh, dated the 8th of July, the 28th of July, and the 5th of August. And it's enough for me to say, my Lord, you'll see them in the record. No doubt, my Lord, will we'll find them in his own time. But the, the simple point on those Psalms reports is this. None of them, my Lord, recommend medical parole. The reports were not even prepared or provided for the purposes of an application for medical parole. Those reports all recommend that Mr. Zuma be moved to a specialist medical facility for assessment and to optimize his treatment. And that is catered for in an entirely different section of the Act under Section 44. And here again, the critical point on the chronology. All of those reports precede Mr. Zuma's temporary release on the 5th of August pursuant to Section 44 to a specialized medical facility. Where my Lord knows from the board's ultimate view, his treatment was optimized and all conditions were brought under control. That the board said uh, nearly a month later on the 2nd of September 2020. So the board would know whether his conditions had stabilized or not. The second place we find an evidence to try and explain away the ignoring of the board's decision, my Lord, is the medical report by Dr. Marfa. My Lord, I don't need to spend time on that because my learned friend, Mr. Jamie, has already done so. We similarly deal with Dr. Marfa's reports in our heads at paragraph 77. It's enough for me to just give, my Lord, 
these submissions in conclusion. The first is, my lord, that Dr. Marfa's report does not conclude that Mr. Zuma has deteriorated permanently or reached an irreversible state under Section 791A. Uh, under 791A. And Mr. or Dr. Marfa does not allege that Mr. Zuma is physically incapacitated. And he certainly does not allege that Mr. Zuma is unable to perform the activities of daily living or self-care. And we know that he didn't even go into that because he doesn't attach an occupational therapist report, which would have been required if the application was based on physical incapacity. In any event, my Lord, Dr. Martha's report does not qualify as a Regulation 29A3 report by a correctional medical practitioner because Dr. Martha is not a correctional medical practitioner. He is, and we've explained this in detail in our heads, my Lord will see it there, he is a SARMS medical team doctor. He's not an employee of the correctional services. And so accordingly, he doesn't <clears throat> meet the requirements of the regulations. And as Mr. Jamie said, by him filling out the form and supporting his own version of what he said was the medical conclusion, he's clearly conflicted. But here's the really important point, my Lord, and it's again, it's one of timing. Dr. Martha's report comes months, months, literally months before the board takes its decision. The board takes its decision, my Lord, with the benefit of up-to-date specialist reports, and it does so on the 2nd of September. Mr. Dr. Martha's report was concluded on the 28th of July, my Lord, literally months earlier. So Dr. Martha's report of the 28th of July preceded Mr. Zuma's temporary release to a specialized medical facility on the 5th of August, where, as we know from the board, his treatment was optimized and all conditions brought under control. And of course, Dr. Martha's report predates the board's decision on medical parole. My Lord, the third place is the report by Dr. Mpachwe. It's dated the 23rd of August. And again, my Lord, we've dealt with this in our heads. It's enough simply to highlight that the report by Dr. Mpachwa simply says that there are unpredictable health conditions that he has observed when he looked at Mr. Zuma. Unpredictable health conditions. That's the high water mark of what Dr. Mpachwa says. But that's clearly not the test for medical parole in Section 79, my Lord. Then, my Lord, there's the Surgeon General's report, and that's of 30 August, my Lord. The Surgeon General's report. The Surgeon General's report simply says that he believes that the patient will be better managed and optimized under different circumstances than presently prevailing. That was said on the 30th of August, my Lord. Well, the Surgeon General's report doesn't say that Mr. Zuma has a terminal illness or is physically incapacitated in a severe fashion. And of course, better management of an offender's condition and optimization of treatment is not the requirement for medical parole. That can be achieved, my Lord, as we know it was in this case, through a temporary absence. And that's obviously what the board ultimately concluded as well on the 2nd of September. Fifth place, my Lord, and now we see it in the National Commissioner's decision and his reasons dated the 5th of September. Lord, I'm not going to take you through each of his reasons. I'm going to conclude for you because we've already done this in the heads, but just to give you the conclusion, the National Commissioner never says that Mr. Zuma is terminally ill or severely physically incapacitated. And none of the reasons given by the National Commissioner come close to showing so. He references old age, multiple comorbidities, unpredictable health conditions, and need for specialized treatment, my Lord. But that's not the right test for the jurisdictional facts in Section 79 1A of the Act. And he, in any event, incorrectly and with respect to him, misleadingly claims that the board found that Mr. Zuma's conditions are under control because of the care he was receiving from a specialized hospital. Well, my Lord, we've highlighted in our heads of argument that that's just plain wrong. We've said it at paragraph 71.4, my Lord, in our heads. You'll see it where we explained that the board did not say that. He's misquoting the board. And in any event, it's an irrational consideration by him because, as we know, Mr. Zuma has not been released to a specialized hospital. He's been released back home where he's not receiving that specialized hospital care that the National Commissioner attempted to place so much store by. My Lord, the sixth place is the answering affidavit by Mr. Fraser. And it's dated the 26th of October 2021. He relies, as we know, my Lord, on two things. He relies firstly on Dr. Martha and my Lord, he, in various places, he relies on the supporting affidavit of the head of the Escort Correctional Center, and he also relies on what 
are apparently his own observations, my lord, about Mr. Zuma. Let me just deal with each of those quickly. Mr. Or, uh, the, the Mr. Fraser's reliance on Dr. Martha, my lord, goes nowhere because first and foremost, Dr. Martha's report only appears in the ex post facto reasons that are given by Mr. Fraser in his answering affidavit. So, my lord, it's impermissible for him to try and lift out what Dr. Martha said in his answering affidavit. And you'll recall that the report by Dr. Martha is not mentioned in the reasons that were given at the time that the decision was taken. Mr. Fraser does not quote from Dr. Martha's report in his original reasons. And so we know that he is, in effect, renovating these new reasons through Dr. Martha in his answering affidavit impermissibly. In any event, as I've already said, and Mr. Jamie highlighted, there are no clear findings by Dr. Martha at all on the Section 79 requirements, quite the opposite. And third, and in any event, the National Commissioner, unfortunately, again, misrepresents the findings of Dr. Martha. Martha. He quotes from what he says is Dr. Martha's report, but he, in fact, misquotes from Dr. Martha's report. And again, we've set it out um, in our heads, my lord. But here's the critical point, again, unfortunately, missed by learned friends on the chronology. It's the question of timing. Dr. Martha's report, as I've already said, came a long time before the board made its decision. The board decided on the basis of up-to-date evidence and up-to-date expert reports. And it did so coming to its conclusion on the 2nd of September that there was no risk to Mr. Zuma on the terminal illness requirements or that he was severely physically incapacitated. In fact, the opposite. They said his condition had been stabilized. My Lord, the commissioner never explains in his answering affidavit. This is important. He never explains in his answering affidavit why or how that particular finding could be disregarded. The seventh place, my Lord, and it's the last place we find an effort by our learned friends for Mr. Fraser to try and excavate new reasons is in the supporting affidavit by the head of the escort correctional sentence, uh, correctional center rather, Ms. Khadebe. You'll see, my Lord, that that supporting affidavit is at case lines 005-77. And the high water mark of that affidavit, my Lord, is that at paragraph seven, Ms. Khadebe on the 10th of July, my Lord, noticed that Mr. Zuma didn't make his bed or clean his cell. And she indicated that he often feels weak and unable to make up his bed or clean his cell. And you'll see at paragraph eight on the 21st of July, my Lord, she's, uh, she says that uh, there were concerns registered about the physical state of Mr. Zuma. Now, my Lord, the supporting affidavit, let me just again say, is ex post facto. It's dated the 26th of October. But even that affidavit never makes the positive claim that Mr. Zuma is terminally ill or severely physically incapacitated. It speaks only about one occasion on the 10th of July when Mr. Zuma didn't make his bed or clean his cell and other health concerns that were registered on the 21st of July. But critically, these concerns, again, my Lord, relate on the timeline to July. They all precede Mr. Zuma's release to a specialized medical facility where his treatment was optimized and all conditions brought under control as had been concluded by the board. So, my Lord, what we say then is that Mr. Fraser fails the Section 79 test on the evidence and he fails the Similani test on the law. Let me finish in the last couple of minutes left for me, my Lord, to say that having jettisoned the test under the Act, Mr. Fraser then roots around for other reasons as though this were permissible. And he tries, as I've said, to do this incorrectly in his answering affidavit. But each of these are in their own terms irrelevant. They make things worse. Firstly, my Lord, there's irrelevancy number one, that Mr. Zuma is 79 years old and undeniably a frail old person, says Mr. Fraser. Well, old age and fragility are not terminal illnesses or severe physical incapacitations in the form of a severe stroke or such like. If there were, of course, <clears throat> there wouldn't be pensioners in, prisoner, in prison. The second irrelevancy, my Lord, is that he took into consideration the events that occurred during the public unrest and destruction of property in July. Well, those public unrest and destruction of property my Lord, are obviously irrelevant to whether Mr. Zuma met the statutory requirements for medical parole. That's the medical question. Threats of violence are not a legitimate excuse in any event, my Lord. If they were, all prisoners could threaten prison riots unless they were given medical parole. And instead of meeting the conditions of the Act, showing terminal illness by an objective test, for instance, the mantra would become, give me special treatment or else. 
my lord and then there's a final um irrelevancy and irrationality that is produced by the national commissioner in his reasons my lord and his answering affidavit he says mr zuma needs care from a specialized hospital and medical parole was justified because this type of specialized care cannot be provided by the department of correctional services oh my lord asks the question to himself surely alongside all of us where would mr zuma get the specialized care the national commissioner says that while mr zuma is on medical parole the south african military health service would provide the necessary health care and closely monitor his condition but my lord that's a fundamental mistake by mr fraser the reasoning makes no sense because that isn't specialized care south african medical health services are not providing specialized care indeed my lord will recall that one of the reasons stated by mr fraser for needing to be able to move mr zuma away from the escort correctional services center was so that he could get something more than the care that he was receiving there the care that he was receiving there was from the south african military health service lord with respect the reasoning makes no sense it was irrational for the commissioner to grant mr zuma medical parole on the basis that the full time medical care of the south african military health service in jail was inadequate but only for the solution out of jail to be the very same full time medical care of the south african military health service lord sir i can conclude very briefly if i might with relief and costs we say that for all of these reasons but we only need to win on one of them as we say under the rustenberg or similani principle the decision is palpably bad and unlawful and a violation of the objective jurisdictional facts that are required under the statute and for remedy my lord the starting point is that invalid administrative decisions must be declared unlawful so the default step my lord is that there must be a declaration that the grant of medical parole was unlawful the only way to give effect my lord to that is to set aside the decision and the practical result would be that mr zuma must then go back to jail um in order to serve the rest of his sentence we say that substitution is in any event justified as well my lord because the decision here depends on the application of a simple straightforward rule does mr zuma suffer from a terminal illness or severe physical incapacity as i've shown to my lord on the evidence not the national commissioner and not mr zuma suggest that that test is met at all what my lord has is the board's decision and the board the expert body has determined as a foregone conclusion that mr zuma doesn't suffer from a terminal illness or severe physical incapacitation and so therefore it's in the words of his lordship mr justice funnerman as i started my address i said it's a no brainer as he has said the question of what should happen to mr zuma is that he must be returned to prison and that is also so because as i've suggested the evidence does not suggest for a moment that he is in fact suffering from a terminal illness or that he is severely physically incapacitated the hsf further asked my lord for an order that mr zuma's time on medical parole shouldn't count towards fulfillment of his sentence and an order along those lines clearly falls within my lord's powers under section 172 1b of the constitution you have very wide remedial powers here my lord this is the just and equitable relief required to give full and proper effect to the corrective principle my lord and the constitutional court's contempt judgment the constitutional court made it clear that never before had there been such a challenge such a threat to our rule of law and democracy and the constitutional court than the conduct of mr zuma it said that the only sentence that could possibly be just and equitable was 15 months imprisonment and hence that answers the question my lord of what a just and equitable order is in this case that is that mr zuma must be returned to prison to serve that 15 month period my lord finally <clears throat> we ask my lord for costs as well we ask for costs of two counsel and with respect my lord we will see what our learned friends have to say about standing and if they continue um their invective against the parties in their arguments but my lord we have explained why we in any event uh, say that punitive costs are warranted and uh, that the application ultimately should be um successful my lord if the hsf isn't substantially successful then of course we uh, contend for bio watch protection uh, under the ordinary principles my lord those are our submissions and i hope that i've been able to come in just under the time um that was allocated to me my, by my lord yes thank you lord. one you must do please you seem to suggest that uh, 
Mr. Zuma is not saving his term of imprisonment. Uh, yes, is Mr. Zuma a free man? Is his freedom of movement not limited while he's out on on parole, which which impacts on his right to dignity? The, the impression that I'm getting is that since he was released on parole, he, he was no longer saving his term of incarceration because you understood it to say that period that he was out of prison and undergoing medical uh, treatment should not be taken into account. Do I understand you correctly? Yes, my lord, absolutely. And, and, and that set out in our heads of argument, my lord, we say that there is a palpable difference between medical parole and imprisonment. My lord. They're both part, your, my lord is correct, they're both part of the correctional services machinery, but they're certainly not the same type of punishment, my lord. You would just ask any inmate whether they would prefer to be in a jail cell or, or whether they would prefer to be returned to their home under medical parole. My lord. And, and that's my that's design. My what I'm trying to understand is... Are you saying Mr. Zuma is free now? No, he's not free, my lord. No. His mind is not restricted. Can he can we say Mr. Zuma's freedom of movement is not in any way curtailed? He can go wherever he wants to, he can do whatever he wants to do, like uh, any free man can do. No, my lord, we don't, we don't equate medical parole with freedom. We're not suggesting that he is free. But one cannot equate medical parole with imprisonment, my lord. And the Constitutional Court was very clear. It didn't choose house arrest or correctional supervision or any other form of lesser punishment when it decided that 15 months imprisonment was the just and equitable sentence that had to be imposed. It specifically said imprisonment, my lord, which is in prison. Yeah. And so that's yeah. the difference. I'm trying to work... I need to assistance here. I'm trying to work uh, this through my head. The Constitutional Court has sentenced him to prison for a determinate period. Yes. But now he's in the custody of correctional services. If he gets released on parole, or if he gets to spend a lot of time in various hospitals as he's doing. Can we say that he's released? No, in which no. case, only if we accept that he's a free man, he's released, then one could look into your argument that we should ignore the period that he's been out of prison attending various medical uh, centers and treatment. I think I think the bottom line point, my lord, is that there's a very significant difference between what is regarded as imprisonment and medical parole, and there, there are three reasons Absolutely. for that. Yeah. There, 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 there are three reasons for that, my lord. Obviously, a person wouldn't be applying for medical parole and seeking a release from prison prison if it didn't permit a difference of treatment, and so it's not imprisonment; it is a release from prison. And in this case, as we know, it's a release from prison for Mr. Zuma to return home and serve the rest of his sentence at home. And as we know from the papers, to also then move about the province to attend casinos and events and other things, my lord, and to vote and so on. So, my lord, it, there's, a, there's a very significant difference. At, at but, least, but we do agree that he is released to go and serve the remainder of his term of incarceration. Yes, but I understand. Yes. Our list is a free man. Thanks, uh, Mr. Duplessis. I think this is an appropriate time to adjourn for tea. The time now is already 12 o'clock. Uh, can we take a 15 minute break and come back at. Uh, no, we'll take a 15 minute break. The time now is uh, 12 o'clock. Let's come back at Kurapa Strength. Thank you, my lord. Yes. Court and James for tea.
Over to you, Mr. Labuska. May I please, Your Lordship? In order to make efficient use of court time and to avoid the repetition in argument, AFRI Forum makes common cause with the argument presented by Mr. Jamie for the DA and Mr. Duplessis for the Helen Susan Foundation. AFRI Forum also defers uh, to its heads of argument, and any argument uh, therein not repeated here uh, should not be considered as to have been abandoned. I intend to address your Lordship on the declaratory relief as an additional set of relief sought by AFRIFORUM and costs, particularly the personal costs order sought against Mr. Fraser, as the two aspects are closely related to each other. Now, just on that score, and I will elaborate on it below, your Lordship would have noted from the practice note that the applicant is not persisting with a personal cost order against Mr. Fraser, and that is still the case. Yes. The declaratory relief and the grounds there under, of course, speaks relief sought in terms of substitution in lieu of a remittal. Starting with the declaratory relief sought, my Lord, in terms of Section 81D and Section 82B2D of PAJA, this court can declare rights of the parties. And this includes the rights of the commissioner, which he may or may not have in respect of the relevant administrative action. Or this, law, this court can declare the rights in relation to the action of the decision. The relevant administrative action, of course, of course relates to the granting of medical parole and the jurisdictional requirement underlying the same that the Medical Parole Advisory Board must make a positive recommendation to that regard. The applicant seeks in terms of the amended notice of motion, which your Lordship will find at case line 10-2 uh, at paragraph 5. To due effect of the correct interpretation of Section 791A of the Correctional Services Act, and that the Commissioner cannot make the medical determination, which is, of course, reserved for the Medical Parole Advisory. Uh, your Lordship also note that subparagraph 5.1 of Prayer 5 in the amended notice motion refers to Section 71. That's incorrect, it should be 79. Our Lord, AFRI Forum deals with the declaratory relief sought in the supplementary affidavit. Your Lordship need not go there. Uh, case lines 11 24 at paragraph 65. Mr. Fraser fails to answer there to in substance. Uh, your Lordship would find his answer at paragraph 48 of the answering affidavit. And that is at case lines 13 to 49. The submission is that based on the unlawfulness of the uh, medical parole decision taken by Mr. Fraser, and Mr. Fraser usurping the role of the medical parole advisory board, the declaratory relief is not only required, but essential. It is patent that the legal obligations of the Commissioner in relation to medical parole and Section 79 must be set out and declared and clarified. What is more disconcerting is that the Acting Commissioner, Mr. Tobakhale, supports the affidavit of Mr. Fraser and the perpetrated illegality and unlawfulness of the assertion of the Medical Parole Advisory Board. Now, my Lord, that much is evident where Mr. Tobakhale states in his confirmatory affidavit to Mr. Fraser's affidavit, your Lordship would find that as an annexure to the answering affidavit on case lines 13-67. 
that's the concern to us by the current acting national commissioner, Mr. Tobakwale, where he states that he is against substitution and that he supports the content of Mr. Fraser's affidavit. Mr. Dubokfale goes as far as to state that a decision must be remitted, which we know now cannot happen, absent a decision in the positive from the Medical Parole Board and an application for medical parole. My Lord, absent the declaratory relief, we will be back here in a month's time, perhaps days. That's evident that Mr. Dubokfale will also commit the illegality and unlawfulness which Mr. Fraser committed by usurping the role of the medical parole board. If I might take your Lord sir, briefly through the affidavit of Mr. Tobak Khan, this does not only relate to the declaratory relief sought, but also uh, lends credence to the substitution argument. What, I will go to the specific paragraphs now, but by, in, in summary, Mr. Tobacardi says the following. He agrees with what Mr. Fraser says in his affidavit. He takes responsibility for the decision taken by Mr. Fraser. And then he attacks the substitution, so, and he favors a remittal. Your Lordship will find at paragraph 5, Carly's confirmatory affidavit, case lines 13-67. He states, I've had read the affidavit. Council, can you repeat the case line reference? You said paragraph, you said 13-67, my Lord. Thanks. And it's, I refer your Lord to now to paragraph 5, where Mr. Fraser or Mr. Tobacoli states the following that he's read the affidavit of Mr. Fraser, his predecessor, and he agrees with the contents thereof, especially those allegations that relate to the Department of Correctional Services. If one then turns to case lines 13, Hyphen 68, paragraph 7 of Mr. Tobakali's affidavit. Your Lordship will note at the last line of paragraph 7, Mr. Tobakali states, as successor in title, I take full responsibility for the said decision as it was, as it was taken by my office. And if one then goes to case lines 13, Dash 69. Paragraph 10. Mr. Tobacale advocates for a remittal so that the commissioner, he, in his acting position, can deal with it de novo. But we know now, of course, that he agrees with. The, the stance adopted by Mr. Fraser in respect of the interpretation of the legal framework and the empowering provision. And we also know that it is an incorrect premise, a point of departure. Paragraph 11. This deals then with the, the cost order, which I will allude to. And this, of course, links students again to the declaratory order sought, the last paragraph of paragraph 11. Mr. Tobakale states as follows. I submit that Mr. Fraser did not suffer and have a personal cost order pronounced against him. This is the important part, my Lord. When he was doing what was right in terms of the prevailing laws of the country and in relation to correctional services. Now, my Lord, it is submitted that, and I deal with the, the question as to remittal versus substitution at length in the heads of argument uh, on case lines uh, 16 16 to 18. But the following can be taken in respect of 
be a false one. one. A declarative order as sought for is essential. You are dealing with state officials who fails to correctly interpret the legislative provisions and the legislative framework. Two, in respect of costs, we know now, of course, that the National Commissioner, uh, Mr. Tobakale, acting as such, has taken responsibility. So in that premise, Active Forum does not persist with personal cost order against, against Mr. Fraser, because the, the conclusion is logical. In casting, what is Fraser? Sorry, I'm going to Mr. Labuskan. Mr. Labuskan, are you still on the platform? Yes, my lord. Can I proceed? Can your lordship hear me? Yes, you may proceed. <coughs> um, Mr. Fraser acted in his position as uh, acting uh, or as the uh, National Commissioner. And that decision is now, of course, supported uh, by Mr. Tobakali. The situation would have been entirely different in relation to a personal cost order had Mr. Tobakali adopted, with respect, the correct approach. Uh, in terms of uh, washing his hands uh, pertaining to the Fraser decision, the medical parole decision, and supporting the correct legal position. My Lord, in respect of costs, then, submitted that costs should follow the outcome, uh, subject in, of course, if your Lordship is not with the applicant uh, to biowatch immunization. May it please you, my Lord. Thanks, Mr. Dabus uh, Let's see. Mr. Bachel? I would please your lordship. My lord, the high water mark in this particular case as advanced by the argument of the applicants is that the National Commissioner has overruled the medical parole and advisory board under circumstances where it was not support, the national commissioner was not supposed to do so. That is the, the high watermark of this particular matter. But however, my lord, there are certain preliminary points that have been taken by the first respondent in this matter. I'm not going to spend too much time on those since my learned colleagues in the, uh, were representing the third respondent will be dealing with that in detail. I just wanted to confirm the fact that we're still taking those points, save for the point relating to joinder of the South African Medical Health Services. We're still taking the point on agency and we're still taking the point on standing. I see my learned colleagues have not dealt with the issue of agency and I'm going to touch with that briefly. This application has been brought on an agent basis and as a result of which the requirements pertaining to agency as prescribed in Rule 612 would have to be complied with. And those requirements are to the fact that the applicant has to set explicitly the circumstances which it adverse renders the matter agent and the reason why it could not be afforded substantial redress at the hearing of the matter in due course. And my lord, the, the, the important aspect is the second part, in particular. In that, it seems like the, the applicant, you know, his contentions are, are moving from the assumption that the first respondent must be incarcerated from the date of the order until October 2022. Because they're alleging that, after all, the conduct of the National Commission and granting the medical parole in itself amounted to an infringement of the rule of law and also amounts to infringing the constitutional 
uh, court judgment that was uh, imposed on, on, on Mr. Zuma. We are saying that is not correct, because in any event, the third respondent was due for consideration for parole in October 2021, and might ordinarily have been released on normal parole. And as a result, the fact that this sentence expires on, the, on October 22 is of no assistance to the agency of the application itself. Now, Malo, the second point that they are raising, which, which is in their notice of motion, and I just wanted to be brief on this agents because I need to deal with the high water mark of the case, is the fact that they, they are seeking that Mr. Zuma be returned to the custody of the Department of Correctional Services, and that the period for which he was allegedly re released, and they call it unlawful, which we disagree, on medical parole, should not be counted towards commuting his sentence. My Lord, our submissions on the point is that that in itself is a clear indication that they could still be afforded a substantial redress of the hearing of the matter in due course. Because they can, in the normal course of an opposed application, you know, seek for that very same order. And, and this in itself flies against the fact that they're saying that the sentence is due to expire in October 2022. Those affirmations in themselves works against their submissions that the matter is And on that, on, on that, on that alone, my Lord, we submitted that the matter is not urgent and that it should be uh, dismissed with cause. Alternatively, my Lord, it should be struck off the road. Having said that, my Lord, I then would like to briefly, before I then take your lordship through my response in respect of all the submissions made by the applicants, deal with the issue of what I now regard as the high water mark of the case. And your lordship, you see that this is based uh, on, on, on the fact that um, the applicants are saying the national commissioner cannot and was not supposed to, to overrule, and they call it an overrule, the recommendation of the medical parole and adversary board. But our submissions on that point, my Lord, is that the, 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 the National Commission never overruled the medical parole and adversary board because the functions of the MPAB or the, of the parole board and that of the National Commissioner are different. In terms of the law, the functions of the MPAP is to make a recommendation to the National Commission. And the decision on whether to grant medical parole or not lies with the National Commission. As a result, if, if it is the National Commissioner who has the discretion on whether to grant medical parole or not, it cannot be said when the recommendation made to him is positive or negative, then it cannot be said that that decision in exercising of, of his legislative power amounts to an overruling of the decision. In actual fact, he considered the decision and, 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 and will show that as... as, 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 as we, 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 we proceed with our, our submission. Now, my Lord, the, the applicants are relying on Regulation 29A, sub-Regulation 7, which states that the Medical Parole Advisory Board must make a recommendation to the National Commissioner, the Correctional Supervision and Parole Board, or Minister, as the case may be, on appropriateness to grant medical parole in accordance with Section 791A of the Act. If the recommendation of the Medical Advisory Board is positive, then the National Commissioner, the Correctional, Service, uh, uh, Correctional Supervision and Parole Board, or Minister, as the case may be, must consider whether the conditions stipulated in 791B and C are present. Now, in our heads, my Lord, we've made that submission to the effect that the National Commissioner is not precluded from granting approval of the placement of an offender on medical parole 
We submit that there is authority to the effect that it is not permissible to treat the act and the regulations made under they under as a single piece of legislation and to use the latter as an aid of interpretation to the former. A regulation cannot be used to enlarge the meaning of the section in an act. And for that, we made reference to the Moody's case. Model. But the point that we're making is that Regulation 29A7 is very important that it should be read in conjunction with Section 79.7. I mean, Section 79.8. Section 798A of the Act, my Lord, says the following. The minister must make within six months after the promulgation of this Act regulation regarding the processes and the procedures to be followed in consideration and administration of medical parole. So regulations that are promulgated are intended, and this is very clear from the section, they're intended to regulate processes and procedures. And from the conduct of the applicant, what they are trying to do is to try and read substantive provisions into regulations that are intended to deal with the issues relating to processes and procedures. Now, if we now interpret the provisions of Section 29A in the light of the fact that they are intended to deal with processes and procedures, one could only be able to interpret these regulations to say, now, if there is a recommendation of the medical parole board, which is positive, what the regulations now requires the national commissioner to do is that the national commissioner must then consider conditions stipulated in section 79 1A or C. And our, and, and, and our submission on that point is based because of the fact that the Regulation 29A does not deal with instances where there is a negative recommendation. Because if there was a regulation of both positive and a negative recommendation, then that would have taken away the discretion that is lying with the National Commissioner in determining whether to grant medical parole or not. Now, if the, if, 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 if the legislature intended that and, and 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 i could see that my learned colleagues have tried to, to elevate these regulations to 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 be to to the status of an act or legislation by merely because they're saying the the regulations themselves have to be in terms of the act approved by parliament but that cannot be so my lord for a very simple reason because this legislation has not been drafted by parliament there still remains regulations and there still remain subordinate legislations. And therefore, they cannot be utilized to interpret the substantive provisions of the Act. We must, in actual fact, look at the Act itself. And the Act prescribed that, that the regulations are only intended to deal with processes and, 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 and procedures. What that then means is that Section 29, A7, will then imply that once there is a positive recommendation, then it, 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 it makes it necessary that the national commissioner should not stop there. Should not say because there is a positive recommendation for medical parole by the parole board that, that ends there, then grants medical parole. It then says that don't stop there, go further, go further and consider the outstanding provisions relating to 71B and 71C. That's all that could be understood within the context of this regulation. Note that the, if there's a, 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 a no positive recommendation, then the National Commissioner can do nothing. Now, if there is no positive recommendation in this case, then the National Commissioner must exercise his discretion, and his discretion would be to look into all the reports that are before him, to also look as to what the reasons are for the Medical Advisory Board uh, not to grant or to not to recommend pa uh, medical parole, and consider all the circumstances, and then make 
a decision in the exercise of his own discretion. Now, for one to suggest that if there is a negative recommendation by the Medical Parole Advisory Board, then that precluded the National Commissioner from granting medical parole. Our submission on the point is the legislator wanted that to be the situation. The legislator would have explicitly said that so. And, and secondly, this will also negate the exercise of the discretion by the National Commissioner. And, and the provisions relating to the exercise of the discretion by the National Commissioner would also become superfluous. The fact that, that the legislature... Mr. 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 I just want to make sure that I understand your submission. You are saying if the parole adversary makes of experts makes a determination that the former president is not terminally ill. Are you saying the commissioner can ignore that recommendation and exercise his discretion, taking into account other reports? <clears throat> Do I understand your submission correctly? No, my lord, that is not my submission. My okay. submission is that if there is no positive recommendation, Firstly, the National Commissioner must also look into the reasons why there is no there is no positive recommendation from the Medical Parole and Adversary Board. You must look into that. But you must not only look into that also, but must also look into all the other reports and the information that is before him and exercise the discretion that has been afforded to him. So, so, so he still has to look into that because And and, and, and and my lord, maybe 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 what I need to do, I need to 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 go a little bit back and take your lordship through why we 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 think that there was a report that was before the national commissioner, and that report itself was in terms of regulation twenty nine a, for which report itself, which is the report of Dr. Mafa. That particular report in itself, it is satisfied the criteria that has been set out in terms of Section 791A of the Correctional Services Act. Because we have a, the, the Commissioner had a report that satisfied the, recommend, uh, the, 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 the provisions of Section 791A of, of the Act, and that particular report in itself recommended uh, or stated that uh, explicitly that it recommended that medical parole as a result of medical and physical incapacity, that if we, there is such a report, and also there is also a report of the Medical Parole and Advisory Board, which makes a negative recommendation, then the National Commissioner is obliged to consider them both and make his decision in the light of all that information that is before him. That's the submission that I'm making on that particular point. Not that it should, it should ignore that report of the medical parole and pass report. But the, the, that the first issue was, was on, the, on, the, on the interpretation of, 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 of the fact that there must be a positive recommendation. We say that that is not a substantive provision because it is a provision, provision that does with the process and procedures. It also it, it, it's, it's, it's intended to inform the National Commissioner on what to do if there is no positive recommendation. And that's the intention. And and and, and, and there. Now, Mano, the second issue that has to be determined by the Honorable Court is whether the 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 third respondent's application for medical parole satisfied the criteria that has been set out in Section 791 of the Correctional Services Act. 
the application's contentions and, and, and your lordship had had that was that it does not satisfy that uh, the, the requirements. And, and we submitted that, you know, the, the contention itself is misplaced and baseless for the following reasons. One, in the medical report, and, 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 and we submitted that the, 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 the report by Dr. Mafa, my lord, is a medical report. Why do we say it is a medical report, my lord? Your lordship, you would see, and this is contained in, in the case line as part of the record. That is on, on page 004 88. In fact, 004 87, Malot. Your Lordship, we see that that is a medical parole application in terms of Section 79 of the Act Triple One of 1998, and and we've made we've made we've made our argument in our heads of argument to the point that under those circumstances where this application for medical parole is made by a medical practitioner, it is not necessary to have another medical report that this particular addendum B and C would constitute the medical report for the purposes of Section 79 and also for the purposes of Section 9A. And, and, and if one looks at, at, at 004-88, it says addendum C, medical report to be completed by the correction of medical practitioner, uh, regulation 29A3, registered in terms of the Health Profession Council of South Africa. And, and our contention is that, after all, that it, it is not necessary that it should be completed by a, a correctional medical practitioner if the application itself is been made by a medical practitioner. And 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 and, and that itself, your Lordship would see in terms of where where one reads uh, the, the the provisions relating to the application itself in the in the act. And I want to refer your Lordship to to. to section 79, 2A, which says that an application for a medical parole shall be lodged in a prescribed manner by a medical practitioner or a sentence offender or person acting on his or her behalf. The, the, the application for, 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 for the third respondent in respect of this matter was 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 um, lodged by the medical pro, uh, uh, practitioner, and therefore, as a result of which, then the report that has been filled by Dr. Mafa would constitute the medical report for the purposes of say, of Regulation 29A3. And in the medical report. Your Lordship would see that after all, where he makes the clinical or non-clinical information, of course, that information has been redacted. And, 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 and for, for obvious reasons, my Lord, that uh, you know, this is one of the information that has been objected to by the third respondent. And I think uh, uh, that's the reason why it was redacted. But, but there was, uh, there is uh, clinical and clinical uh, and non-clinical information on that. And if one looks at D, 5D, is, is the offender suffering from a terminal disease or conditions which is chronic? The answer is yes. Which is progressive? The answer is yes. Has deteriorated permanently or reached irreversible state? Is it deteriorated significantly? And on page 004 91, my lord. Dr. Mafa says the following in respect of the application. Medical parole should be considered or not considered, not considered has been scratched out, which means that medical parole should be considered and medical functional physical incapacity says the reasons thereof is medical incapacity. So in terms... So Mr. Bofella, I want to follow you. Yes. Uh, you are saying that according to that medical report, Former President Mr. Zuma suffers from chronic condition. Yes. 
Do I understand you correctly? In terms of this, is same is is it suffers from a terminal disease or condition which is chronic. Yeah, but what is the answer? Is 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 is, is Dr. Martha saying he suffers from a terminal illness or is saying he suffers from a chronic condition? From my understanding, because section, section yes. 79 talks of terminal illness, not chronic condition. Yes, my lord, and this is exactly what he's saying. He's saying he's suffering from a terminal disease or condition that is chronic. Chronicness, I think, is something that has to do much more with the fact that, you know, is something that um, cannot be um, treated and healed by medical condition. Something that is continuing. Yeah, what I'm trying to understand, uh, Mr. Mbashele, is the question, is it, I take it the form is asking the question whether the applicant suffers from a terminal illness. Is that what the question says? Because the answer from what you say seems to be that instead of saying he's terminally ill, it says he suffers from a chronic condition. No, my lord, it's actually saying he's suffering from a terminal condition or disease, which is chronic. It's both. Okay. It's both, my lord. And 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 and, and we, we we stated that in our heads of argument that the addendum there of Dr. Marfa makes the following findings, my lord, and that is on page 30 and paragraph uh, uh, 6.18. We said Mr. Zuma is suffering from a terminal disease or, or condition that is chronic and progressive, which has significantly deteriorated. That's how we can capture what the uh, Dr. Marfa is saying. And it says Mr. Zuma is unable to perform daily activities and self-care and is under full comprehensive medical care of his medical team. Dr. Mafa then recommended that medical parole as a result of the medical or physical incapacity. And on the basis of the above finding, my lord, and the facts, together with the additional uh, South African Medical Health Services medical reports filed as part of the record, the National Commissioner reasonably believed that the third respondent application for medical parole squarely fails within the provisions of Section 791A of the Act, read with the Correctional Services Regulation 29.85. Now, Malot would, 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 would understand the dif that the, the difference between a review and, and, and an appeal. And, and the crux of the matter here is that, after all, it's not that the decision itself should be correct. Because if, if the test is whether the decision is correct or not, that would blur the, the distinction between an appeal or an, 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 an a review. The question that needs to be determined is whether the decision itself is reasonable or rational. And under the circumstances, with this information that was before the National Commissioner, which cannot be ignored, and the fact that there is also a recommendation by Dr. Mpatwa to say that the, that the third respondent should be released on medical parole immediately, that is, if one looks at it, it's a, a, a decision that a reasonable make, a decision maker would take under the circumstances of this particular case. Now, in determining whether a particular decision, my lord, is, 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 is irrational or not, your lordship would have to, to take into consideration is that, is that particular decision itself supported by evidence or facts? That's the first point. The secondly, whether there is a connection or no connection between the facts and the evidence and the reasons that were provided for it. And lastly, whether decision in which the, uh, the, the, the decision in which reasons are, are provided are, are, are intelligible. So we, we, we submit, my lord, that. And, 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 and my lord, I wanted to refer to 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 page 004 page 14 which is the supplementary founding affidavit in the Helen Sussman Foundation matter in the supplementary affidavit did they concede that in the application 
for medical parole by Dr. Mafa. Dr. Mafa states that Zuma is suffering from aid, and, and I read from paragraph 40 Malo. They say in the application, Mr. Mafa, of course it's Dr. Mafa, states that Mr. Zuma is suffering from a terminal disease or condition that is chronic and progressive. He further states that Mr. Zuma's condition has progressively deteriorated since 2018 and that he is accordingly unable to perform the activities of daily living and self-care. They, 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 they concede in their own supplementary affidavit that those are the findings of, uh, of Dr. Mafo. Now, my lord, I would then like to then deal with what has been required in terms of Section 79.1. I think you should be aware that um, we, the, 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 the National Commission has pointed out that the decision to place the third respondent on medical parole was taken in terms of the provisions of Section 75.7a read with section 791A and together with the regulation 29A. And Noloship is, is aware that the, the provisions relating to section 70, uh, 77, 7A of the act provides that the National Commissioner may place under correctional supervision a day parole or day, uh, a, a day parole or grant medical parole to a sentence officer serving a sentence of incarceration for 25 months or less as pres uh, and prescribed conditions in terms of section 52. It is not in dispute that uh, um, Mr. Zuma is serving uh, a 15 month sentence and that sentence is less than 24 months. So as a result, it falls within the ambit of section 70, 70, uh, 75, 78 in that it is a a, 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 a was serving a sentence of less than 24 months. Though, so the discretion to grant medical parole in terms of this particular section lies with the National Commissioner. And my lord, our submission in respect of this is that this is a substantive provision of an act and which provision or the discretion granted in terms of this particular section cannot be curtailed or limited or circumscribed by way of regulations. And the suggestions that has been made by the applicants under circumstances is that the suggestion that is made is that by the applicant is that uh, the provisions relating to regulation 29A seven curtail those powers and we say that is based on the wrong interpretation of the law then in relation to section 79 one uh, the act provides that any sentence officer may be considered for placement on parole by the national commissioner I, i'm leaving the others as the case may be if such an offender suffering from terminal disease condition or or if such an offender is rendered physically incapacitated as a result of the injury or disease or illness, so as to severely limit the activities of the inmate. We submit, my Lord, that this application can be lodged by the medical practitioner and that the, the National Commissioner shall not consider an application unless the application that has been lodged if such application is not supported by a written medical report recommending placement on medical parole. Now, the, the report, my lord, of Dr. Mafa would therefore constitute the written medical report and it is also recommending parole and therefore it complies with the provisions of section 79 2b. Now, the provisions of 79.2c, my lord, of the Act further provides that the written report referred about must include, among other things, the provisions of a complete medical diagnosis and prognosis of the terminal illness or physical incapacity from which the sentence 
offender is suffering. Your Lordship, we have referred to the report of Dr. Mafa. And, 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 and our submissions are, is that that particular report has a medical diagnosis or prognosis, as is found in 004.88. And two, a statement by the medical practitioner indicating whether the offender is so physically incapacitated as to limit daily activities or inmate. Of course, that is also contained in page 004.91, which says that medical functional or physical incapacity, then it talks about medical incapacity. And the reason why the placement on parole should be considered. So, my lord, the MAFAS application dealt with the application for medical parole, dealt with the provisions of Section 79, and recommended the placement of Mr. Zuma on medical parole. And then Regulation 79A provides that the application for medical parole shall be initiated and complete, uh, and com uh, 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 by completion of an application form contained in Schedule B. And that's what has been done. So, my lord, having dealt with the fact that there was a medical report by Dr. Mafa, and also that the National Commissioner also considered a report by Dr. Mpazo, who in itself is a medical practitioner that has been appointed by the Medical Parole Advisory Board to do an evaluation of Mr. Zoom. He has been appointed by them. He has done that particular evaluation, and he then submitted a report to the Medical Parole and Advisory Board. And in that medical report, uh, Dr. Mpazo recommended that Mr. Zuma be placed on medical report with immediate effect. That is information that could not be ignored by the National Commissioner in determining whether, in exercising his discretion as to whether medical parole should be granted to the third responded or not. Now, there's been an issue that has been raised by our colleague, by the applicants in the, in the fact that the, 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 the situation of the third respondent has stabilized. Our submission on that point, my lord, is that the situation stabilized because of the care that the third respondent has received and the fact that the the the, 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 the that the respondent condition has stabilized in itself it's not a reason why he should not be granted medical parole because there are circumstances in which that condition has stabilized after he has been hospitalized and after he has been under the care of the South African Medical Health Services for 24 hours, and, and, and which is the kind of treatment that is not likely going to receive in a correctional institution. The report of, of also Dr. Mujua, or Mujua, which is the Surgeon General, also indicated that Mr. Zuma's condition was only brought under control, under a hospital care. And also the fact raised the issue that the correctional center has no capacity to ensure his optimal care and he require he require a 24 hour medic. So the National Commissioner also considered these different reports from the team of the South African Medical Health Services, medical uh, doctors. We are attending to the third respondent's treatment, the last one being that one of the Surgeon General dated the 30th of August 2021. And in that report, the report makes the following. It says that it is the view of the Surgeon General that this report taken individually may paint a picture of a patient whose condition is under control but together reflect a precarious medical situation, especially for optimization of each of them. 
three, then we would remember that the patient was fairly op optimized prior to his incarceration and took only four weeks for his, it, it took only four weeks for his condition to deteriorate such that the glucose and, uh, and I think this is part of the reducted report um, and, and uh, function were completely out of the kilter. The Surgeon General believes that the patient will be better managed and optimized under different circumstances than the pre uh, than presently prevailing. And the different circumstances, my Lord, we submit, uh, that has been referred to in paragraph E of the Surgeon General report, are uh, referred to above means the circumstances different from incarceration. It is therefore important to know that this regard, that the third respondent's conditions was only brought under control under hospital care. It is also common cause that correctional services had no capacity to ensure such an optimal care. The conditions of the fourth respondent also required that he be under care of a 24-hour medic base or uh, on a 24-hour uh, basis, a situation that was not possible within the Department of Correctional Services that can only accommodate inmates overnight. Therefore, the medic could not be allowed to spend 24 hours with the third respondent as a medic could not be accommodated in the correctional facility. The third respondent was considered as being a low risk in terms of the re offending as envisaged in, in, in section 79 1b of the act. It is particular common cause that he is the first time offender and did not pose a security risk and the uh, 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 risk to the community into which he has been released. There were appropriate arrangements also for the third respondent uh, supervision, care and treatment within the community into which he was released. Now, We have also pointed out to your lordship and, and, and in respect of uh, the fact that the, the, the medical parole and advisory board has noted that Mr. Zuma is suffering from a multiple comorbidity. But however, if your lordship could look into the, the, the recommendations that we've made, there is no way where they are they are commenting on the findings that were made by both Dr. Mpatwe and Dr. Ma. They're not commenting on that because that would have shed even more light in terms to, to the National Commissioner in Exercising Discretion. If they're saying that after all, what has been raised there is something that uh, uh, could, could be ignored. There are very serious findings that are made. They ignore that completely. Though the, 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 the MPAB reached a conclusion that the third respondent condition had been stabilized and brought under control, it was clear from the other medical reports, in particular the report of the surgeon general, which was referred to above, that these conditions were only brought under control through optimized care that he was receiving at an advanced health care facility, while the correctional center environment lacked capacity to ensure of, or ensure such a care. And, and we're saying it is, it is, it is a very dim, dimming for the Medical Parole Advisory Board to ignore having pronounced that the third respondent has comorbidities and to also fail to make any comment on the findings and the recommendations of Dr. Mafa and the, and the report of Dr. Mpazo. We have been assigned by the MPAP to conduct a medical assessment on the third respondent. And this raises a question as to what was the rationale behind the omission thereof. It is important to mention in this regard that Dr. Mafa had made some worrisome clinical diagnosis findings, which in the interest of the third respondent's privacy could not be divulged in the answering affidavit. And the said findings has led to Dr. Mafa recommending that the third respondent should be placed on medical parole. On, on, uh, it is therefore our submissions that the provisions relating to Section 79 have been complied with, and, and as a result, the National Commissioner correctly exercised his discretion in granting the third respondent medical parole. Now, there are certain issues that were raised, which I would like you to deal with. Yeah. 
One is that, and I've dealt with that one, that said the National Commissioner does not have the power to override the MPAB. We say that, after all, he's not overriding them, he's exercising his discretion in terms of the act, and therefore, because there are two separate uh, functions of the MPAB as opposed to that of the National Commissioner, the MPAB only making recommendations and the, the National Commissioner exercising his discretion, it was within his discretion to do so. Then there was this argument that uh, the regulations were have the force of law. They have been approved by Parliament. Uh, we've dealt with that issue to say there remains the regulation, there remains subordinate legislation, my lord, irrespective of the fact that, that they've been approved of Parliament because it was not the Parliament that has actually drafted those those legislation, and therefore they cannot be used uh, to interpret the substantive provisions of the Act. There's also argument that has been advanced that the reasons that have been provided by the National Commission in making this decision were ex post facto. My Lord, that, 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 that is based. The mere fact is that in terms of Rule 53, there's a requirement that there should be, this should be provided and also there's a requirement that a, 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 a record should be provided. What, what is being alleged in, in the answering affidavit is to give clarity in terms of, of what was done by the National Commissioner in relation to the record itself or the information that is contained in the report. It therefore cannot be regarded that that in itself would amount to providing of reason ex post facto. And well, the fact that a patient has stabilized malone does not mean that that particular patient has been cured from a terminal condition. When a condition itself has stabilized, that means that after all, it has been brought under control. And therefore, it becomes of critical importance for your lordship to then un interpret that particular finding in the light of the fact of the care in which the third respondent is enjoying while in a primary facility. The, the, the other points that were raised were the fact that the, the decision was irrational and unreasonable. My Lord, said, with uh, my submission on that one is that if ever your know, Lordship considers the reasons that are provided and the reports, um, it cannot be said that they, they, they were irrational or unreasonable. It was also submitted that the decision was taken for an ulterior purpose or motive, and that the National Commissioner relied on irre irrelevant considerations and ignored the relevant consideration. And, and for that, they make allegations that, you know, uh, the National Commissioner relied on on the fact that it was unprecedented uh, that uh, the third uh, as the, the third respondent as a former head of state was in, uh, incarcerated um, and, and secondly they said the irrelevant consideration also related to the fact that the, the escort cor correctional center could not risk the life of inmates and that um, uh, there could be dark consequences if uh, the third respondent were to to die in in in, in, in the in the correctional facility. Our submission on that point, my lord, is that it is correct that the above was indeed stated by the National Commissioner in his answering affidavit. But the applicant is being disingenuous in suggesting that these were the primary consideration by the National Commissioner. As stated about the National Commissioner stated 
of his reasons that after consideration of all relevant information that was placed before him, he was satisfied that Mr. Zuma's application met the requirements of Section 79.1 of the Act. In the process of exercising that discretion conferred upon him in terms of the Act, the National Co Commissioner had to consider a range of positive factors that were in favor of the placement of the third respondent on medical parole against factors that milit milit militated against such placement. And only one negative factor came to the fore. And, 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 and one is that with that, it was namely that the, the Medical Parole Advisory Board, Malot, did not recommend the placement of the third respondent on, on medical appeal. That is the only negative factor. And upon weighing of the last factor against all positive factors, the National Commissioner came to the conclusion that it was reasonable decision to place the third respondent on medical parole, in particular based on the fact that this application met all the jurisdictional facts as contained in Section 79.1 of the Act. So, we submitted that the applicant's contentions to the effect that the decision of the National Commissioner was taken for an ulterior motive or that irrelevant considerations were taken into account and relevant consideration were ignored is misplaced, my lord, and must fail. The next point that was raised was the fact that the applicant alleged that the decision taken by the National Commissioner was biased. Yes, Mr. Um, Pakele, just a reminder, your time has run out. Please sum up your submissions. Uh, my, my Lord, in, in summing up my, my, my submissions, I just wanted to do one important aspect. And this has to do with the issue of substitution. Submission has been made, my Lord, in relation to the fact that uh, the decision of the National Commissioner should be substituted with the decision that um, it is unlawful and that the, that, that the third respondent should be uh, reincarcerated. This part has a, 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 a just and equitable jurisdiction in terms of the provisions of the Constitution to determine as to what is fair, uh, that is just and equitable. And under the circumstances, there's a new acting National Commissioner was indicated his willingness to relook into the matter. That's the first point. And secondly, it, it is also based on the on the wrong assumption, my lord, that if a person is on medical parole, then that particular person uh, is no longer serving his sentence. We've said that the pathless authority in our heads of argument to indicate that parole itself is another way of punishment. In the sense that, after all, the third respondent is not free to do whatever he wants to do. And then as a result, because of that, uh, it, it, it cannot be substituted with the decision that he must be reincarcerated. And on the issue of the cost model, our submission is that um, under the circumstances, the cost should follow the, the cost. And we submit that, after all, the application itself should be dismissed with cost. Those would be our submission, unless the Lordship would want me to do that. No, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mbashele. The court will now adjourn for lunch. We will reconvene at 2 o'clock. As the court is. Yes, you are all excused. <coughs>
Well, uh, your camera is on, uh, Judge. Thank you.
Yes. You may put. Mr. Mbok. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Uh, as God pleases, my Lord. My Lord, uh, we are, are going to split our argument between the points in limine and the uh, argument on the merits. My learned friend, Mr. Masuku, will go first dealing with the points in limine, the preliminary legal points, and I will thereafter deal with the merits as the court pleases. Yes. And can I remind you, Mr. Mpofu and Mr. Masuku, that we still have the DA, the announcement after forum to reply. So if you could uh, stick to the agreed time, time allowances so that we could finish on time. I'll hand over to Mr. Masuku. Yes. Over to you, Mr. Masuku. Thank you, thank you, my lord. <clears throat> I I I have the uh, unenviable task of of persuading your lordship that you should dismiss this application at the at the on the basis that uh, the applicants have not shown that they have local standing. Um, on the basis that the applicants are, uh, have not uh, demonstrated agency in seeking an urgent review of this particular uh, med medical parole decision. And also on the basis that uh, they, uh, there are no real uh, consequences of the nature that they wish to, to achieve through this application, given that uh, uh, um, Mr. Zuma now qualifies for uh, an ordinary parole. So what they are asking you to do is something that uh, in, invariably has no has no uh, practical legal effect to the extent that the 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 person they wish to have incarcerated will in fact uh, be eligible to be on parole as soon as that as soon as I mean is already at the, at that level where the, the 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 is eligible for it. My lord, anyone? So I'm going to deal with the with the local standing for every other preliminary objection that we have raised uh, depends on whether or not we're able to show that the applicants do not have, they have not demonstrated standing to um, to bring this particular application. My Lord, bearing in mind that all the applicants, all of them, do not allege that there is a right, whether they're acting in, the, in, the, in their own interest or whether they're acting on the public interest, they do not allege that there are any, any rights in the Bill of Rights that have been violated. And that's a, um, um, obviously a requirement under Section 38, 1, 38, 38A and 38D, that they must allege that there is a right that has been, a, a right in the Bill of Rights that has been uh, uh, infringed by the medical decision. In fact, what seems to be the case is that they are seeking orders that invariably would uh, violate the right of someone they say they accept is not well. Whether, at whatever degree, their main complaint is not that is the, Mr. Zuma is not, is not, uh, uh, is not, is not uh, uh, they, there is no medical condition of concern that, uh, that, is, that his doctors are dealing with. Their main argument is that Mr. Zuma is not in a wheelchair, Mr. Zuma is also not about to die. So he must not get out of prison or any other dispensation permissible uh, in our law to go to to uh, to go and, and save his time in prison under conditions of of of, uh, of dignity and 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 um, uh, co which are consistent with the the medical parole that he has. So you will see, my, my my lord, that there is not a single basis in by reference to Section 38A and 38D that the applicants are able to show that their rights, their own rights are not affected. The, uh, so the, the DA can't claim that they have any rights that are affected by the medical parole decision. And I'll come back to that because a lot is made for, on, uh, a lot is made about the manner or the manner in which Mr. Zuma is reacted to the allegations that are made against him in this parole application by the DA, by the HSF, and by the AFRI Forum. So, we so we we know that the 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 application is based on a rule a rule of law concern, uh, which the DA claims it has a it has, and and sorry which the applicants claim they have uh, uh, that gives them standing, 
to bring bring this particular application. But of course, I mean, our, ca our cases that, are, uh, that we've referred to in our heads of arguments make it very clear that there is, a, there is no cut lunch or taking for granted the right to bring a, a, a litigation in the public interest. You've got to show uh, certain facts that uh, that uh, give you the the right to uh, to bring a, an application. So the question must be asked: Why has this political party, or why has these political uh, organisations, why are they interested in having Mr. Zuma physically incarcerated, put in the in in prison, uh, in the terms that they suggest would serve? The, their understanding of what the constitution of the what the order of the constitutional court uh, says. In other words, why do they believe that serving his sentence under conditions that are clearly uh, conditions consistent with the medical condition that has been has been given by medical experts? Why is it a problem for them? What is it they are really looking for? What is what does it serve? And no one needs to go further than to see how, with the context in which they have sought to peg their right uh, to bring this application. And that context is the, 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 uh, the, the, all of them. Their view of, uh, their view of the contempt uh, uh, order that was granted, that, sorry, the, the, their view of um, Mr. Zuma's uh, uh, violation of the set out in the constitutional court judgment. So you'll see that all of them start off by saying, well, the context is this one. Mr. Zuma violated two issues. He undermined the Zondo Commission's uh, 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 proceedings, essentially, which was investigating him and investigating uh, issues that were de dealt with under, under him. And then they say, well, he also violated the constitutional court order. And if this uh, is physical incarceration, uh, Forget about the degree of his illness, his physical incarceration. That's what is what they are looking for on an agent basis, physical incarceration. So they they give that context, and that context we submit, uh, 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 my lord, is a context that simply demonstrates that the reason why this application has been brought by these political by political organisations is to pursue a political agenda. They do not claim while they are claiming that they have a human rights, they have human rights uh, 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 interests. Here they are arguing in court, asking for the rights of Mr. Zuma to be violated. One of which is the right to privacy, rights to, uh, in, in, is, is the privacy of his uh, medical, medical records. To be splashed in newspapers and to be made a subject of political rallies and other organi organizations that they are interested in having. So their, their, their commitment to human rights doctrines that govern the constitution is questionable because clearly what they are seeking to do, my lord, I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Yes, continue, Mr. Masu. Thank you, thank you, my lord. So, so what, what, they are, what they are really seeking to do is to, uh, is to humiliate Mr. Zuma it is also to um, uh, to ensure that the he only comes out of prison when he is on a wheelchair, uh, or he comes out of prison when he's about to die. And that's mean. That's wrong. It is not consistent with their claim to be a human rights organization. It is undignified. It lacks the spirit of the constitution, which at the heart of it is Ubuntu. So, but it's understandable because they are political organizations. I will start off with the DA. And my Lord, you can take judicial notice of what they said in public when this parole condition, when this parole decision was made. The leader of the DA was reported in the newspapers as having said that there was an ulterior motive of placing Mr. Zuma on medical parole. And this, this, this ulterior motive was to solve a political problem for President Ramaphosa. They say he knows 
The elections are seven weeks away. He knows that the structures in KZN were in open revolt against him. There was a political imperative to ensure that Zuma was released so he could participate in the ANC's election campaign. Now, clearly, they place uh, the parole, they question the, the bona fides of state institutions to carefully engage with the facts before them relating to the, the, the considerations that must be taken into account when medical parole is being, is being considered. They question the bona fides. Oh, of course, my Lord, they don't want us to question their bona fides because, as you will know, all of them complain that we've been abusive because we've questioned their motives. And they say we should accept that their interest is legality, the rule of law, and nothing more. But what they can't do is to suggest that the DA is a friendly force to Mr. Zuma. It's known DA is a political force of Mr. Zuma. It enjoys political mileage by, by, uh, by humiliating both in public statements that they make and in, in court proceedings. The intention is to, is to humiliate their political opponent and not to pursue a good faith uh, litigation which is intended to vindicate a principle of law. Because if that was the case, they must accept certain propositions. In public, they've clearly suggested that there is a political motive for Mr. Zuma's release on medical parole, not because Mr. Zuma is sick. They've even questioned the claim that uh, Mr. or the medical view that Mr. Zuma is not is met is a, is got medical conditions that are acute or that are, in their words, uh, in the words that they would like uh, us to use, the the, the the medical condition is such that uh, Mr. Zuma is dying or is on on a wheelchair. They, so, so, so we, we say this, the, the, the motivation and what they're seeking to, 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 to vindicate is not a legal uh, uh, contention, but it is a political, it is using the courts in order to pursue a political narrative that Mr. Zuma and certain members in the executive and, the, and, the, and, and, and certain officials in, the, in, the, in government are involved in corrupting law they are involved in manipulating the system of medical parole in order to extend to Mr. Zuma a benefit that he does not deserve. Essentially... Mr. 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 Masuku, can I come in there? Yes, I'm not in, in any way trying to curtail your submissions. Look, a lot is being said on Twitter, on media, you know, there are all these allegations and counter-allegations. And I would that we try and confine ourselves to the law. I hear where you're coming from. These things are in the public domain. There are allegations and counter-allegations. And I just have a feeling that it would help matters. It would assist me in, our, in writing the judgment if we could really try to concentrate on the law. What does the law say? Yes, I, I, and that's the question I'm answering, my lord. I, I'm sure maybe I've, yeah. I've been inelegant in trying to, to, to set out what the law uh, says on standing. Yeah. I'm, I'm challenging yeah. what the courts have said uh, about standing, that the issue uh, when one is, is challenging standing is to say uh, uh, whether a person or organization acts genuinely in the public interest. That is what we're challenging were saying, are these organizations genuinely engaged in a public interest? And I've said, in relation to the arguments that they are acting in their own interest, I've shown, my lord, my lord, that they have cited not a single right on which Section 38A says they must cite. They don't say what rights would be violated, their rights, in their own interest. They don't say what it is that they would be violated. They also do not say, in relation to uh, a subsection 38D, when they are acting in the public interest, that they are genuinely, and this is the challenge that we're putting to, we're put to them, that they are genuinely acting in the public interest. And I'm putting to your lordship that when you engage with the issue of, of whether they are genuinely acting in the public interest, 
you as as a as a Justice Yakub in the Lawyers for Human Rights versus Minister of Home Affairs case on paragraph 18 said a distinction must be drawn between a subjective position of a group and its beliefs that they are acting in the public interest on one hand and whether objectively speaking they are in fact acting in the public interest and one way of showing that they're acting in the public interest is at least to make reference to what it is that they contend are the rights that are they are affected by this medical parole decision and what it is that they say the public's interest has been affected by the parole decision i mean i accept that rule of law is a very important uh, in fact is the cornerstone of our constitutional system and where it's been violated yes a party is entitled to litigate on that issue but the courts say a bit more has to be alleged for standing because every one of us have a right to uh, have an interest that a uh, rule of law is is uh, is is, uh, is engaged with but here what we have in my, my let, and, and i knew that i would be a, a a fly in the ointment given the very neat submissions that were made by my learned friends for the applicants that when i bring up this issue that questions the bona fides that questions the the motives that questions whether they are genuinely bringing these applications in the public interest that i may well be uh, I may well be uh, trading in trading on 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 on, on very uh, 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 uncomfortable terrain, given what threats we we now know are in the papers regarding what we've said about their motives. But it's true, my, my, my lord. We've got to be sincere about what we do here. And I'm not suggesting that the applicants are not sincere. What I'm suggesting to your lordship is that when they say they are acting in their own interest, and when they say they are acting in the interest of the of the public, the, you must accept. <clears throat> that they are acting in their political interest rather than in their legal interest. It is the political interest that they are involved in. And those interests are to humiliate Mr. Zuma. Because what is it they really want? They are not suggesting that Mr. Zuma is not well, is, is well except the DA, of course, they, 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 they do cite uh, 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 the fact that he was seen uh, addressing people, he was seen uh, in, in Inspire Casino, and they make they appear to 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 suggest that that is a that that their views of seeing him in motion are medical views that ought to be taken into account for purposes of de, of determining whether or not he is not well. I mean, the fact that he's walking, the fact that he's interacting with people, does not give the DA or any of the political parties the right to express a medical view of of, of on him. In other words. Questioning the medical uh, 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 status of Mr. Zuma, as set out by experts, is in itself bad faith. They are not doctors. They have never conducted Mr. Zuma's uh, medical 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 examination. On what conceivable basis, other than political uh, 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 interests, are they seeking to challenge the the parole board? Other than to see Mr. Zuma go back to jail and be humiliated as their political as their political foe. So, the 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 and, and my lord, we we've re, we've also referred to the case of Giant Concepts uh, versus Ronaldo, which makes it very clear that uh, that when a party and I, I would I would urge your lord to 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 look at paragraph 41 of that of that judgment where the where justice cameron had, 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 had summarized certain cases that had dealt with the issue of standing and said concluded by saying these cases make it plain that constitutional own interest standing is broader than the traditional common law standing but that a litigant must nevertheless show that his or her rights or interests are directly affected by the challenge law or conduct and then he sets out the under 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 underneath that paragraph 41 the, the, the a number of uh, uh considerations that go that go into it so my lord on the issue of standing we, we we submit based on what we've set out in our heads of arguments and based on the submissions that i've made that the the you, you, the, the 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 to the extent that the applicants base their right their their um, right to bring this application uh they have not met the requirements of section 38 uh, a and d which requires them to at the very least point out what rights in the bill of rights 
are violated by their by their by the decision the medical parole decision. <clears throat> My lord, then then I I come to the issue of um, the issue of whether. So, but before I go there, my lord, perhaps let me just um, make this submission on on the or still on the issue of standing. One of the common cause complaints uh, between the uh, between the applicants is that Mr. Zuma's uh, 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 refusal to disclose his medical his medical condition uh, is is in itself a problem because he wants to enjoy medical parole, but he doesn't want to disclose what. It is that uh, is bothering is is a, is a is a medical is a medical issue. With respect, Mr. Zuma does not have to disclose to his political opponents what his medical condition is. We just know that from 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 the applicants' own submissions that what they would like to see, what would make them feel vindicated in their conception of what rule of law and the and and the and the and the, and the tenor of the constitutional court order says that they would like to see Mr. Zuma walk out from prison uh, either in a wheelchair or walk out in prison uh, 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 to die at, 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 at his home. If, if absent that, in their, in their view, the medical parole cannot be granted. And I say this in relation to the fact that uh, such, a, uh, such a, a, a position does not raise, does not uh, 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 reflect a, a, a litigable interest. In other words, an interest that can be litigated upon by, by, the, by the applicants. The fact that they want him to endure maximum punishment uh, is not a basis on which they can bring this, uh, 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 this application. So it doesn't give them the, the standing to do that. My Lord, on the issue of uh, agency, the agency is premised on the on the false assumption that Mr. Zuma is not in is not in, in is not serving a prison sentence on medical parole. That's a false premise. So they are, they've brought a, a case on on an agent basis because they contend that uh, he is not suffering as they would want him to suffer. As they would want, is not humiliated as they would want him humiliated by being in a physical prison. So they would want him. Uh, they, 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 they essentially want an urgent inter intervention by the courts, so that a court would pronounce that he must go back to prison, so that their political interests of uh, of parading themselves as paragons of virtue and human rights uh, are vindicated. That, with respect, my lord, is not. Is not is not uh, does not ground agency. The truth of the matter is that Mr. Zuma is in fact serving his prison sentence. He's serving it under conditions that the constitution allows him to serve uh, under those conditions. And my learned my learned friend, Mr. Ms. My leader, Ms. Mr. Mpofu, will deal with the merits. But if one looks at, at, at our heads of arguments, right on section 35.2 of the constitution, right at the preamble of our heads of arguments, we say we we say that uh, we quote from the uh, the constitution which says that the rights of detained and incarcerated person includes the rights of living conditions consistent with human dignity. This entails, amongst other things, article medical treatment and the right to communicate with other spouses, next of kin, religious counselors and medical practitioners. So we say he is still in he is still in, in sort of in prison because he's serving his sentence. So this agency is, ba is based on a false premise, fa false factual and legal premise regarding uh, whether Mr. Zuma is serving his sentence. And it is also placed based on a false premise because it's a, it is based on the fact that there is a rule of law breach so egregious that uh, Mr. Zuma, the court must immediately intervene and get Mr. Zuma back into a physical prison. With, with respect, uh, that cannot ground agency. If there is any, 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 and, and it's, it's worse, my lord, because the applicants cannot say that Mr. Zuma is not, uh, doesn't have a medical condition. They accept, and they should accept, 
that all the medical experts. Hello, Judge Chiledwaba. All the medical experts in the in the um, in the uh, in, in that have dealt with directly with Zuma, who are interested in providing a, a proper management of his uh, medical condition. In other words, um, contrary to the applicants who are bringing this application, not because they want to assist in the management of his medical condition. No, they they are not interested in that. The, the medical team of Mr. Zuma is interested in providing a, a, a medically sound uh, management of his medical condition. What the applicants are suggesting uh, on the basis of their speculation is that they, their view of where he is, where Mr. Zuma is in his medical, in his state of med, med, medical uh, condition must be, uh, is such that he must not be given the benefit of a medical, a medical parole. So, so, my lord, we, we we submit that there is no agency that has been met by uh, by the by the by the by by the applicants because it is not agent, and it's worse because it's a, it's a, it's it's agency in terms of which they don't have the full facts. They've up, the, the applicants basically decided they were not going to to contest the is Mr. Zuma's claim to medical privacy. They were not going to bring that to court and to have the court rule on his claim of a medical, uh, 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 a medical uh, uh, privacy, which would have allowed them access to the documents that define with sufficient clarity uh, what his true medical position is. They, they decided, no, they are going to skip that, and they are going to simply come on the basis that uh, what they have uh, sufficiently grounds their, 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 their application for, for review. That, my lord, the issue is not so urgent uh, 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 as to as to as to warrant the court's intervention, uh, as 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 the applicants claim. Every case brought under the, uh, brought by this political organization is potentially urgent because it has something to do with uh, human rights uh, uh, abuses, and in good circumstances, yes, the matter could be urgent. But this is not one of those cases where they've been able to show that it is urgent to have Mr. Zuma sent to jail physically uh, and, and to, put, to be put in prison, even under the current medical and uh, medical conditions that they suggest is not terminal. And then the third point, my, the third aspect I, I must deal with, my Lord, is the fact that uh, you are being asked to set aside a medical parole decision because the applicants contend if you don't do so, you, you, the constitutional court order sentencing Mr. Or sending Mr. Zuma to prison would be undermined, so would be the rule of law, so would be the administration of justice. But here is the problem. He already enjoys the prospects of get, getting medical parole. So if, if you send him to prison today and within a few uh, 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 weeks following the processes of the medical parole, a system he's out again on medical parole. It just reinforces the 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 absurdity of the applicant's contention that uh, the right remedy for what they are looking for is that you should use the power of a constitu of a statutorily governed uh, 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 body to uh, consider all the relevant facts and to replace that yourself by an order that he must, he, must, he, must, he must go back. So with respect, my Lord, the fact that there is no application uh, for parole doesn't, doesn't at all uh, 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 support the view advanced by the applicants that uh, the only remedy that should be given against Mr. Zuma is that of him being sent back to jail uh, uh, to, enjoy, to, to endure the indignity of a physical incarceration as they would want it. So we, we submit, my Lord, that on the basis which your Lordship put to my learned friend, Mr. Jeremy, that uh, Mr. Zuma or, or, or Mr. Ma, Mr. Uh, Duplessis, I can't quite remember who it was, but on the basis that you, you, you put to them that Mr. Zuma already qualifies for, for parole, why would it be in the interest of the rule of law, 
the administ proper administration of justice to send Mr. Zuma back to prison on the basis that a decision was taken by a functionary, which if your lordship finds was not properly taken, was not properly taken. All that we suggest, we submit, my, my, my lord, is that the, the interest of justice would require that uh, uh, you, 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 accept, you accept that the, what they are asking now is really, render, is a, really a moot remedy uh, in the sense that uh, it would not achieve what they want, what the applicants want. And we know that what the applicants want is an order that Mr. Mr. Zuma is sent back to prison and endures the indignity of a physical incarceration and the punishment so that it matches the gravity of what they see as a, as, as a, a, a or, or the gravity of the violations that, or the gravity of the sentence that uh, Mr. Zuma was was uh, was convicted was 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 uh, was convicted of. So 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 my, my lord on those just, three. Let me just quickly. I just want to understand your submission. At the moment, there is no pending application for either normal parole or medical parole. So you are saying I should. What, what do I do? There's no pending medical parole application or ordinary parole application. I accept that uh, the third respondent now qualifies for release on owner. No, he qualifies for consideration to be placed on parole. So I just yes. need some assistance from you. What is the next step? We but, but, know that he qualified for consideration to be placed on parole. Yes. There is no such application pending. There is no pending application for medical parole. What is the next step? My Lord, the, 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 um, the issue we're raising is that is, is a response to what the applicants are seeking. The applicants are seeking that you revoke the medical parole uh, that Mr. Zuma currently enjoys, and you send him back into prison. So what would satisfy the, applica the applicants is that Mr. Zuma is physically incarcerated in prison. And we are suggesting to your lordship that uh, it, it is, it is the, that, that the, there is an issue of mootness in the, in the remedy that they are, they are looking for. It is moot in the sense that the statute on which they are seeking to invalidate Mr. Zuma's medical parole also allows that at, as of now he is given his give, give, consideration is given to his parole his, his actual parole. So what your lordship is being really think, asked, Mr. I think this is an important point. I just want to understand. I'm seeking guidance from you. No, assuming, no, 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 no. assuming the court is to review and set aside the decision by the commission, what should happen? The, the, the court, in my, in my submission, and I think Mr. 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 Mpof will deal with it, but, uh, but, but if, if your lordship uh, uh, would, would care to, 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 to uh, because your lordship has directed the question to me, the, if the court were to find that uh, the medical parole was not granted uh, lawfully, your, your lordship must consider that there is no dispute about the medical condition of Mr. Zuma. The only difference is that Mr. Zuma's condition has, has not been characterized as one that is terminal in the in the terms that the applicants are contending for, or that Mr. Zuma is not in a wheelchair. So your lordship has got that fact, that Mr. Zuma is in fact not well. So would it be consistent with the court's uh, discretion in setting aside this oh, this this uh, this relief this this remedy? to then send back Mr. Zuma to physically endure in a prison, in circumstances where the court is also aware that the medical views that or medical uh, 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 opinions uh, are given by experts who have treated and are involved in managing Mr. Zuma's medical conditions. So I'm saying to your Lordship that when you decide on the remedy and you exercise your discretion, you have that in mind, that what you are really being asked is uh, the sting you are asked to introduce the sting that the applicants wish to Mr. Zuma to, uh, to endure, which is the indignity of physical okay. incarceration. Uh, anyway, you said that Mr. Mbofu will deal with that question. I'm just looking at the time constraint. I'm not going to 
I think I'm happy with your answer, and then we'll leave it to Mr. Mpofu to, if he's so minded, to 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 take that matter up. Uh, yes. I hope that you you sum up your submissions so that we can, depending how you've agreed with Mr. Mpofu to apportion your time, I'm looking at my time allocation here that you have up to half past three for both of you to finalize the submissions. My Lord, I, I've gone way beyond what I intended to, to cover, to, uh, the time I intended to look, to look at. But so on the basis that there is no, the, the, the applicants do not allege material and relevant constitutional require, constitutionally uh, 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 required uh, uh, grounds for asserting uh, local standing in terms of Section 38A and 38D, my Lord, they have no standing. And secondly, yes. they, have, they, is, they have not been able to show that the matter is urgent, so urgent as to uh, uh, as to even be, force the court to adjudicate it without all the material facts relevant uh, for determining whether or not there is, in fact, uh, uh, a medical uh, situation of the nature that justified medical parole. But thirdly, that it would be superfluous to grant the order that they want, because the order that they really want serves not any justice, but it serves politically driven interest, uh, and it serves to, uh, to, 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 to really satisfy the political humiliation that these applicants would like to subject Mr. Zuma to. Those are the submissions that I, 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 I make. I'll hand over to, Ms., to, my, to my learned leader, Mr. Mpofu. Thanks, thanks, Thank Mr. Mr. Masuku, over to Mr. Mpofu. Thank you very much, my lord. Um, my lord, let me just, just so that the point doesn't get lost, call, almost just start at the end so, to tie up this point of, of mootness that your lordship raised. My lord, I will just sum it up in one minute. We raised the point in two uh, separate ways. One is uh, as a point in limine, which Mr. Masuku was arguing. Namely, that the matter would raise an academic uh, or hypothetical situation. And then we raise it again in respect of a remedy, which is what Mr. Masuku was addressing now. So I'll deal with it later in respect of a remedy. But as a point in limine, we simply say this, my Lord, and your Lordship's question is exactly on point. Because your Lordship is saying, well, as a mootness point, well, how, what, how does the Lordship deal with the fact that, as we speak, there is no uh, application for, for uh, parole, ordinary parole, not medical parole? Our submission, my Lord, is contained in our heads in that regard, and it is simply this, that the principle of parole, the, the purpose of the parole, of rather, of the mood, moodness rule is to discourage litigants from bringing to our courts matters that are not going to serve any practical purpose, that might be very interesting academic questions, but will not really come with a tangible result. So what are we saying uh, there? We're saying, my Lord, we acknowledge and we concede that the, the, the parole decision or the, the parole application is not there. But it's common cause that it kicked in as at the 30th of October at, at the latest. Remember that it, we say that it starts from the 1 6th uh, point, but that 1 6th point was reached, I think, sometime towards the end of um, uh, 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 September. But it's common cause from uh, page, I th uh, it's MHRD, uh, DA 28 that the so-called parole, non-parole period en ended on the 30th of October. So th there's no doubt that uh, uh, now in, in November, we're in the parole era. So the answer to your Lordship's co concern is the, is the following. That decision, my Lord, has to be taken by either the head of prison or the national commissioner. The, the decision on, on ordinary parole. Now, in this, on the facts of this particular case, that person is the same person who actually triggered the entire process of medical parole. You'll remember that it was the um, uh, Commissioner Khadebe 
who, who, who said, I saw Mr. Zuma, I saw the, the way he was looking, I was concerned, and that is why uh, I triggered doctors to come and see him, and then he was hospitalized. Secondly, when the, MP, the, the, the parole board uh, um, made the negative finding, it was the head of the prison who, who triggered the national commissioner and said, I'm worried about this decision because we don't have facilities to accommodate this person. So clearly, the only point we make is that that person, if the application comes before her, she will obviously come to a conclusion that they don't have the facilities and therefore it is moot on that basis. It's almost 99.99% guaranteed from what she has said in this proceedings, not some speculation. She has put an affidavit in these proceedings to say that they, they cannot accommodate uh, this person and therefore it is moot from that point of basis. So admittedly it's an extension of the normal mootness rule, uh, rule but on these facts we submit that it is uh, competent. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Let's now, my approach my, my lord on the merits is based on the assumption that your lordship is not with us on the um, uh, preliminary points. And I will then delve directly on the, to, uh, on the law. I will even go as far as to say that my second leg of my argument will be based on the assumption that section 79 applies in the manner that my learned friends say it does. I say that as an assumption because of the following. This application, my Lord, is in my experience, one of the most frivolous uh, uh, applications because it's based on false uh, foundations. And I will demonstrate just now. It's based on distortions of the facts and it's based on make-believe. And what is worse, it's based on, 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 a, on the arrogant uh, assumption that the court is just going to entertain this uh, even though it does not uh, comply with even the most basic um, uh, rules of, of litigation. Why do I say that, my lord? These applicants expect this court to climb three mountains, if you like. The first mountain is that this court must second guess medical experts, medical evidence, from professionals whose bona fides have not been questioned by anybody. How is this court going to do that? How can this court, without medical qualifications for the court, take a medical decision that uh, is against uh, professional experts whose uh, bona fides have not been questioned? It does not happen. These applicants, if they really were serious, if, the, if this was not about politicking, as Mr. Masuku has said, they know what to do, my lord. If you are going to challenge medical evidence, you bring medical evidence. That's what happens. You can't expect a court to now interrogate those, these big medical terms and big medical conclusions, because the court is not qualified to do that. So once the one side even in a criminal matter, brings a medical expert to say this person uh, is, is, doesn't have the competency or whatever to stand trial. Then the prosecution brings their own expert to say, no, they do. And then the court has to choose between the two. In the normal way, road accident fund cases uh, all the time uh, work on that, on that basis. How can any litigant come to court to question medical expertise of four medical doctors and say uh, the court must just decide on its own that uh, the, these doctors, without saying these doctors are bought or they are drunk or I don't know what, or, or, or they are biased or whatever, but the court must simply, um, it, it does not happen, my lord. There's not a single shred of evidence uh, that they bring. We rely on the medical evidence of Dr. Mafa, Dr. Mpatswe, Dr. Mdujwa, Dr. Dabula. 
Dr. Tabula has even put an, an, an affidavit here. Nobody says no, Dr. Tabula, because of this and that reason, the court must not believe them. If you look at the form, my Lord, these are, uh, let me make this example, my Lord. <clears throat> if this court, for example, all the affidavits before the court, they've all been attested before attorneys. The court cannot question those are professional attorneys, unless if somebody says, no, this is not the signature of the right attorney and so on. The court has to take for granted that those attorneys, those people saw those affidavits in front of those attorneys. Similarly, if the doctors are saying, we've inspected this person, I, and we, we find that this and, the, and this, he needs 24-hour medical care, and, and so on and so on, then the court has no option, quite frankly, but to accept that evidence when there's no countervailing evidence. So that's the first fallacy that uh, the, 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 this so-called application is based on. Just the DA says, no, the doctor is wrong. <laughs> so what? Because they are not medical experts themselves, neither are their counsel, neither is the court. So on what basis can the court um, uh, second guess that, uh, that opinion? Secondly, the second mounting, which is also unclimbable like the first one, is that this court is, is expected to second guess the, the, the views of the National Commissioner of Prisons, who knows how the, pres the prison system works. When he says uh, in, um, in his reasons, I think it's um, 002-147. No, no, 005-120. That's where he gives the, the, the reasons, my lord. He says, uh, among other things, that... <coughs> I'm reading at 1.22, my lord, at 12.4. The last sentence. It is the type of specialized care that cannot be provided by the Department of Correctional Services in any of its facilities. In other words, in any of these facilities in South Africa. We don't, I don't know those facilities. Your Lordship doesn't know them. Mr. Jamie doesn't know them. Mr. Duplessis doesn't know them. Mr. Labaskarte doesn't know them. But the person whose job it is, who knows all the facilities in South Africa, says that this care cannot be provided in any of the facilities in South Africa. And the court must say, no, it, it can be provided in, in Uppington. On what basis? On yes. what basis? Mr. Because <clears throat> I, I, I hear your submission, but there is something which is bothering me, which is critical, and that I have to decide upon. I understand the applicants to say <clears throat> the commissioner did not have authority to ignore the recommendation by the by the panel. Yes. Uh, by the by the by the panel the yeah. review panel what do you call it the 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 parole advisory board has made the determination yes. and they are saying the third respondent is not terminally ill and they're saying they, they are not recommending his release on parole i understand the argument by the applicants to be that it was an error of law for the commissioner to ignore the recommendation by this board of experts and consider. I, I don't understand them to undermine or challenge the capabilities of the various doctors. I understand them to say it was irrational for the correctional service minister to ignore the recommendation by the by the parole board, parole adversary board, and rely on this uh, separate reports. That's how I understand the argument that comes okay. open to let, let, let me assist you with that, my lord. The, I accept that. The, but the gist, I listened very carefully, both of Mr. Jamie and Mr. Um, uh, Duplessis, 
said to your lordship, the, what your lordship is saying wrongly now, which I'll, I'll come to, that anybody said is not terminally ill. Nobody ever said that. Not even the board said that. So let's put that aside. The board did say that it is not recommending uh, medical parole, but it has never said it's not terminally ill, as your lordship is saying. And even my learned friends did not go that far, because the board never said that. The, 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 uh, what they are saying on that score, my lord, is that, and your lordship is quite correct, that they are saying that the, the mere fact of so-called overruling the, the, the parole board was irrational. I will show your lordship that there was no overruling whatsoever. Whether it's rational or irrational, it doesn't arise, because there, there was no actual overruling. It's, it's, a, it's a make believe, it's a mirage this idea that the, the, somebody was, was overruled. Now, firstly, the, the argument of the applicants, my Lord, as you correctly point, is based on the assumption that the doctors did not say that um, Mr. Zuma was terminally ill in, in terms of Section 79. That is false. That is a false assertion. If your Lordship goes to 005-90, uh, You will see that that is it's just it's just false, quite frankly. The question is put to a medical doctor, and this court must now second guess this. A doctor trained for six years was put uh, his hands up on the Hippocratic oath, says, and who is registered? Look at the top of that medical report re for a person registered in terms of the Health Professional Professions Council of South Africa. So that's a person who is subject to the professional rules of the Health Professional Council and has taken the Hippocratic Oath. And they are asked a simple question. Is the offender, that is Mr. Zuma, suffering from a terminal disease or condition which is chronic? Yes. Is progressive? Yes. So in which world can the answer is yes, whether he is suffering from a terminal disease or condition that, that, that is chronic, and, and it says yes. And as Mr. Patele was at pains to point out, forget about whether it's chronic or not for, for now. Is he suffering from a terminal disease or condition? Yes. So that's the end of their case. If they, because their case is based on the fact that there is nowhere where it says that he suffers from a terminal uh, disease. But he has a doctor saying he does. So how can this court then find that this doctor, I don't know what, you are smoking something, or when he said yes, he meant no. What? Because the, 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 it's on that basis that they say that, uh, and the, uh, I, I had quoted Mr. Jamie, I think he said it specifically, that he says nowhere does any doctor say that his terminal is, uh, is, he suffers from a terminal disease. Those words, my Lord, that you see at D come directly from the section that they say is not complied with. Go to section 79.1, my Lord. The one that they say is not complied with. It says uh, the National Commissioner and so on may, may uh, grant parole if such offender is literally the, the, the words, word for word uh, at page 90 suffering from a terminal disease or condition, full stop, forget the all on the other side. Those are the words there, and the answer is yes. So on, in which world can the court then say no, that yes means no. So they are the, 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 the very basis of their, of their, of their uh, case falls flat, because it's a, it's a, false, uh, it's a false start. And Mr. Uh, Fraser, says that he took into account these uh, reports, including this one, that says that he's, he, he suffers from a terminal disease or condition. And it's even de, de, uh, explained at the bottom there. A terminal disease or condition is a condition or illness which is irreversible with poor prognosis and irremediable by available medical treatment, but requires continuous palliative care and will lead to imminent death within a reasonable time. It is to that that the doctor said yes. Right. So 
even if they are case on Section 79, if this whole thing depended on Section 79, they are wrong. Why? Because Mr. Jamie speaks with both sides of his mouth uh, on this point. He says that the reason why that point about Section 79 2B, um, which says an application lodged by, which excludes an application lodged by a, a medical practitioner, is because if the application is lodged by a medical practitioner, it already has the, the report. So let's assume he's right about that. Then that report, in terms of this case, is this report of, of Dr. Mafa. So the report that is envisaged in Section uh, 79.1.2b, uh, on his own version, Mr. Jeremy, is this report. And that report says that the man is terminally uh, is suffering from a terminal disease. So what more does he want? Now, so, but that, let's even put aside, so even if the, 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 this decision was solely based on Section 79, it would be it would, it would, it would meet the requirement that they say is not met but more than that my lord section 79 does not stop there about terminal diseases it also talks about uh, someone who's rendered physically uh, incapacitated as a result of injury uh, to the extent so severely to limit their daily activity or inmate self care your lordship has an affidavit of me of uh, the host of the of the commissioner of the prison who says that the man was physically unable to make his own bed so in which world that does not qualify as a, a disease that severely limits daily activity or inmate self-care you don't have to be a doctor to, to, to see somebody is not able to do their daily activities. Let's say their daily activities are to wake up and clean their windows and so on. You, if you, and there's an affidavit in front of this court, which is not refuted, that said uh, Commissioner Hadebe saw that he was not able to make up his bed. So even if they were right on the terminal disease. Let's forget about the Dr. Mafa for now. There's evidence before this court that he was uh, he, he met the condi the other conditions of Section uh, 79.1a, and nobody has said that no, she's wrong, or uh, or, or, or that uh, she uh, she made a mistake. He, he actually just did not want to make up his bed or the fact that uh, he, he was looking sick was not a, a sickness. But more than that, my Lord, when they say to your Lordship, he needs 24-hour care. And Ms. Hadebe and the National Commissioner say, we do not, we are not able to provide accommodation for a medic for 24 hours in any uh, facility in South Africa. So your lordship must say no. They say we can accommodate during the day, we can bring a, a medic, but we can't have them for 24 hours. So your lordship must say no, these people, I don't care. He must go back there and have 12 hours at night where he doesn't get this 24 hour medical care that the doctors say he must get. Why? Because he's Mr. Zuma. I mean, why? When the law says that he is entitled Section 35 two of the Constitution of, of the Republic of South Africa, my Lord, says that, I'll just read it out now. It's the right of prisoners. Everyone who is detained, including every sentenced prisoner, such as Mr. Zuma, is entitled, has the right to conditions of detentions that are consistent with human dignity, including at least exercise and the provision at state expense of adequate accommodation, nutrition, reading material, and medical treatment. Everybody has a right to adequate medical treatment. Medical, adequate medical treatment in this case has been explained to be 24 hour care. The prison says we do not have the capacity to give that adequate medical care. 
But this a, a court of law must say, I don't care. He must go still to that place where if he doesn't get 24-hour medical care, he might die. I want him to go there. I'm the court. How can that be the law? The, 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 uh, without anybody saying that decision, because remember, my Lord, they could have said, no, no, we've got evidence to show that this thing that he needs 24-hour medical care is wrong. It's based on the wrong whatever. They could bring their own doctor to, to, to tell the court that, no, no, actually he needs eight hours, not 24 hours. But this court is bound to accept that he needs 24 hours care because this court has no basis to question that. But this court must simply what, must. What? I'm sorry, man. What did you respond to their argument that that 24 hour care was not on the Rule 43 record? It's something that was uh, manufactured uh, ex post facto. No, no, but it's not, my lord. The, the, the 24 hour care comes from the, uh, the that's why I, I just read out to your lordship, to your lordship where the, the reasons are, where he says this is the type of care that is contained in this report is not the care that is available in any facility in South Africa. That should be enough for your lordship to say hey, whatever it is, whether it's 23 hours or 24 hours or two hours, but it is not uh, the type of medical treatment that can be offered by a prison in South Africa. So I'm saying, then your Lordship is supposed to say, I know, I accept that the medical treatment that he needs is not available in South Africa. I accept that he has 35 two rights to adequate medical treatment, but I'm sending him there in that place where he's going to die or get worse, or I'm sending him there, why? So the 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 the, uh, the evidence that is before the court already of Dr. Mafa, the summary of Dr. Mpato, which is even worse, uh, because Dr. Mpato puts the, the the issue even higher. He says that they are at page 105, my lord, uh, 005 105. He paints a gloomy picture. Uh, uh, despite the, all the, the, the redacted information, he says, my lord, uh, it's a, a complex medical condition which predisposes him to unpredictable me medical fallout. Oh, so I'm sorry, my lord, I thought this thing was charging. To, to medical uh, fallout. Uh, he's gener generally looks unwell and lethargic, total look outlook of his complex medical condition and association factors and environmental limited to support him uh, support his optimum care in the extreme concern more worrisome he says is the unpredictability of his plausible life threatening i mean must he use the word terminal ill life threatening means terminal ill yeah okay of, of his plausible life threatening cardiac and neurological events cardiac means something in the chest uh, uh, could be the heart and so on and that's consistent with the fact that the court knows that he was admitted in a heart hospital it says the risk of potential surgery has become in my assessment a personal one albeit potentially uh, development of a malignant condition arising from a high grade lyosical and colon lesion lyosic lyos uh, that word uh, lyosic Cal, like C cal, uh, means uh, gastrointestinal. Intestine, in other words, a lesion, a, a, a wound in the intestines, okay, uh, exists, they say, he says. And then he says, um, total clean colors are motivated by high risk factors, um, applicant to be released on medical parole with immediate effect, that is prognosis because of his clinical picture presents unpredictable health conditions. Now, listen to this, my Lord. This is a person who talks about life-threatening cardiac, uh, neurological events, uh, intestinal lesions, and high risk. But who is this person? It's Mr. It's Dr. Mpatwe, who's a member of the board. 
So you can deduct, my lord, that Dr. Mpatwa knows exactly about Section 79.1. So because he's a member of the board. So he would not say, I wish to recommend that the applicant be released on medical parole if the conditions were not met, because he's a doctor. So the, the, it's very clear that uh, not only is this prognosis uh, serious, as he, as he puts it, but it reinforces what Dr. Mafa had said about life-threatening or, um, um, or what you call terminal illness. But my Lord, that is not all. This, the other false premise of this case is the fact that my learned friends assume, well, they don't assume, they dodge the fact that this application is based on section 75.7. This is despite the fact that the Mr. Um, uh, uh, Fraser makes it clear, firstly in his um, um, in, in his media release, I'll get the, the I think it's one fifty nine. I'll get the, the reference just now, my lord. In his media release, he says that the decision is based on seventy five seven. That's all. Admittedly, in the reasons that he, he, he gave later, he still says 75-7, and he says red with section 79. But there, is, there can be no doubt in anybody who reads that, that the primary section relied on is 75-7 of the act. Now, this is the question I want to put to my learned friends. Where in section 75-7 does it say that there must be uh, all these requirements of section 79.1. Nowhere. That's the answer. Why? And it's not irrational. If it was irrational, then they, must, they can challenge the constitutionality of the, of the act, which they have not done. So they must accept that the act is, is, is perfectly legal. The act is very simple, my lord. It puts a general section called 79 for all inmates. But before it does that, it has a specific section called Section 75-7 for those inmates who are serving sentences under 24 months. It's a very simple, I don't know why this is, seems to be, uh, 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 well, it's so simple, that's why they're evading it, because there's no answer to it. Section 75-7 simply says, if you are under 24 months, and there's a reason for that, my lord. It's a logical reason. These are people who have light sentences, uh, presumably because their sentences are not as serious as those that are above 24 months. So the law, the legislature has decided that for those people, there is a special dispensation because their sentences are low. What is that special dispensation? It's in section 75.7, my lord. And it says, it's very simple, that the National Commissioner uh, may grant those people parole, medical parole. It says nothing. They want to rewrite the law. They want it to read like this, my lord. Instead of saying, despite subsection 1 to 6, they wanted to say, despite subsection 1 to 6, but subject to section 79.1, uh, the National Commissioner may place under correctional supervision or medical parole a sentence offender serving a sentence of incarceration for 24 months or less. But it does not say that. How can your logic read things that are not in the legislation? It's very clear that this, this legislation, that is why that decision, my Lord, is not taken by the minister, is not taken by the board, the, the legislature, with its eyes open, excluded all those people from taking this decision. And it gave that decision only to the National Commissioner. Whereas Section 79.1 is a different animal altogether, because that's a decision that is taken by either the medical board, parole board, or the minister, or the National Commissioner. So that's the first sign to show the court that we are dealing with two different animals here. So, 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 so 75.7 and 79.1 do not um, have the same conditions. So, which means that the 
under the section 75.7, the commissioner was entitled to take into account, of course, he did take into account the section 79 uh, documents. That, that's not a secret. He says so himself. That's why he says read with section 79. But the decision itself was taken under section 75. And he explains this so clearly, my lord, in his reasons. He says, here's the sequence, it's very simple. He says, there was an application. He was not involved in that. The, the, the application was um, considered by the board. He was not involved in that. And then it was rejected. He was not involved in that. How did he get involved? His involvement was triggered by the uh, head of prison who said, I am concerned because the board has rejected the application and this, this person is clearly ill and we cannot accommodate the, the person. Then he says, he doesn't say, oh, well, I'm going to overrule them. Like uh, your, my learned friends want you to believe, my Lord. No. He says, okay, I'm now going to revoke the delegation under section 75.7. In other words, even if you accept their version, their version is that once the uh, board says no, then the door is closed. So let's assume that is correct. The door is closed under section 79, which is the question your Lordship asked me earlier. Let's assume that they are right. Then he says, okay, what other avenue do I have now that the door is closed under section 79 uh, application? Then he says, let's take an example, my Lord. Let's say there was Mr. Zuma and Mr. Kumalo. Mr. Kumalo was serving 20 years and Mr. Zuma is serving 15 months. If at that point the commissioner then said, what other avenue should I, can I pursue? In the case of Mr. Kumalo, on the version of the applicants, the answer would have been, there's no other avenue. If the board says the door is closed, that's the end. So that would be the end of the road for Mr. Kumalo. But not for Mr. Zuma, because his sentence is 15 months, which is less than 24 months. So there is another avenue in this case, which is what? Section 75.7. And that is what the commissioner Julie did. He, he, he then went and, uh, uh, and, and revoked the um, delegation and implemented 75.7, which is entitled to do by, the, by parliament, because they say he may, that means it is in his discretion, the National Commissioner may place under medical parole a sentence of offender serving a sentence of incarceration uh, for 25 months or less. That's what happened here. So what is wrong? Where is this irrationality? Because the National Commissioner exercised the power that he has under that section to the right prisoner. If, if his sentence was 26 months, they could come and say, ah, he, 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 he applied the wrong sentence. So there is clear evidence of, the, um, of compliance with the law. And my Lord, your Lordship has to look into that uh, in relation to um, the, the rights of prisoners that are, are spoken about. There is, your Lordship will see in, the, in, in our heads, there is uh, the, the, the issue that we call the residuum principle. The residuum principle paraphrased is this, my lord, that prisoners, the, the, the fact that you are in prison does not mean that you automatically get disentitled to your normal constitutional rights under the Bill of Rights. Only those rights, like the right of movement, which are necessitated by the fact that you are in prison, but all your other rights, dignity, health care, uh, privacy, and so on, are retained because you are still a human being. Now, what does that do then, my Lord? It triggers section seven of the constitution. Section seven of the constitution says the state has an obligation to fulfill all the rights in the Bill of Rights. So all the National Commissioner was doing was to do that which the constitution compels him to do, which is to fulfill the dignity, healthcare rights of Mr. Zoom. But here's the, here's the, the way it becomes very clear, my Lord. The, 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 
this situation triggers, on their version, triggers a Section 36 analysis. Because on their own version, they say that uh, the, the, the imprisonment, physical imprisonment, is, is, a more, is, is a higher type of punishment than medical parole, which means they accept that the rights will be limited. Now, we know in constitutional law, once your rights are limited, your rights can only be limited only and if Section 36 applies. And Section 36 says there must be a law of general application. What is that law of general application? It's the, it's the uh, Commissional, Comm uh, Correctional Services Act. So whichever way you look at it, from the point of view of the Constitution or directly from the point of the Act, you come back to the same place. You must interpret Section 75.7. And Section 75.7 is very clear that it gives the uh, National Commissioner the powers to grant uh, uh, medical parole without any further ado. So if 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 he, um, he let's say he's uh, uh, it's only based on forget about terminal illness for now. Let's say that he only gets the report from uh, the head of prison who says this person is physically incapacitated. He can't wake up. He can't uh, even wash himself. Uh, if if that person is serving a, a sentence of under 24 months, then the National Commissioner is entitled to say, well, I'm not going to have this person collapsing here or is not eating or whatever. I'm granting them medical parole. That's the law. If the law is wrong, then they must go to the Constitutional Court and uh, challenge it. But as we speak now, that is the law, that the National Commissioner has got that power to, to, to do so. It is true, and I want to make this clear, that in this particular case, his starting point was the 79 application. And he looked at Dr. Mafa's uh, documents. He looked at other documents. He listened to, he obviously listened to his head of prison and so on and so on. He, he puts all the reasons why, that he put, that, and all of them are, are, are plausible reasons. He says the person is 79 years old, uh, is a former head of state, and the other side wishes to rubbish this to mean that if he's a former head of state, well, it means that he's asking for favoritism. That is pl plain nonsense. All the, the relevance of the, of the fact that he is a, a former head of state is the fact that he is entitled, unlike you and I, my lord, to 24-hour medical care as a former head of state. And therefore, in his case, unlike Mr. Mkise or whatever, the, he is able, when he goes home, he will have that 24-hour medical care. If it could have been another prisoner, they might not have had that access. But he, because he's the head of state, he's got... So those are all relevant considerations. Sorry, my lord. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Um, no problem. Just sorry. Sorry. You are left with 10 minutes now, please. Thank, thank you, my lord. Thank you very much. So, 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 my lord, in, 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 in sum, this is what, what we're saying. If your lordship goes to our heads, um, it, I think it's paragraph uh, 7. I'm um, sorry, my lord, just one second. Yes. We 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 rely, my lord, on uh, what the, the Constitutional Court recently said in the Sonke, this is a paragraph 85.3 of our heads. Sonke Gender Justice, NEC versus President of the Republic, my lord, um, where the Justice Tehran said the following at um, um, paragraph 32. All the rights in the Bill of Rights apply on inmates, save where justifiably limited in terms of section 36 of the Constitution, the point I've just made now. There are, however, a number of non-derogable rights that become especially important when an individual is incarcerated and thus directly subjected to the state's coercive powers. These include the right to dignity, the right to life, 
the right to freedom and security of the person, the right and to be detained in conditions that are consistent with human dignity, which include opportunities for exercise and the provision at state expense of adequate accommodation, nutrition, reading, material, and medical treatment. Okay? Um, and and the, the, in the Van Billion case, which is at 85.2, the following was said by the, the Constitutional Court as well. Um, once it is established that anything less than a particular form of medical treatment would not be adequate, the prisoner has a constitutional right to that form of medical treatment, and it would be no defense for the prison authorities that they cannot afford, or in this case, that they don't have the facilities to provide that form of medical treatment. What is adequate medical treatment cannot be determined in vacuum. In other words, adequate medical treatment for a particular prisoner must depend on what the doctors have said. And then the, the, the court there also said that the fact that the prison cannot afford uh, uh, the, 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 this specialized medical treatment is not an excuse. The person is entitled to. So a person who suffers from any condition, if I say to the prisoners, the, I, I'm a prisoner, and I say, I have a, a sore throat, and then they say, well, in all our prisons in South Africa, we, we cannot treat that particular condition. Then what must happen? It's either they must fi find a way of providing that uh, medical, because I'm, I have a constitutional right to the treatment, remember? So it's either they must make it happen. If they can't, then they must do that, which will make sure that I have access to that medical treatment. And in this case, that thing is called a medical parole to a, a person who, who has access to doctors 24 seven, unlike uh, most of us uh, ordinary um, human beings. So it doesn't matter if they say, if they said, no, that, that uh, treatment for you, Mr. Mpofu, we can only find it in Zimbabwe. Then they must either take me there to get that treatment or they must release me on medical parole so that I can go and get it myself. But they can't deprive me of my constitutional rights simply because they uh, are unable to, to, to provide. So, my Lord, in sum, really, the, 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 the case is very, very simple. Whether If you look at it in terms of Section 79.1, you must look at the, the report of Dr. Mafa that says that the man uh, is, is suffering from a terminal disease. Um, if you look at it from the, the interpretation of the regulations, then you must uh, accept this proposition of Mr. Patele that you can't, you, you, can't the, 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 you can't work the dog, as they say in America. So the regulations cannot determine the interpretation of the act. It's the act that, that determines the, the interpretation of the, of the uh, regulations. But my Lord, if... if all of that is not uh, doesn't make sense. Then your lordship has a, a an, an old and reliable uh, canon of interpretation, which is called generalia specialibus non derogant, and it simply means in English that if there is a statute that provides for something general, it cannot overcome a section of that same statute that provides for something specific. Very simple. So in, in tax law, it's used in tax law, the case that we cite there is called Commissaris versus Van Benelance and Comste versus Van der Valt. And the, the, the principle there by Elof uh, um, was this, that uh, Elof, I think DJ, uh, JP as it then was, was that if there's a, 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 an act that says you, may, you can have these general deductions in tax law, but there's another section of the tax act that says you may have a deduction for cell phones. You can't then go and look at that general se section. You must look at the one that deals with cell phones. Otherwise, you are, what's the point? As, as, as they say, otherwise it says it, it would make that section a dead letter. I think that's what the, uh, the, the quotation says there. Why is that so? 
so if there is a section that deals with under 24s, let's call them that, those people who are serving a sentence of under 24 months, you cannot go to the general section that deals with all prisoners when there is one that provides for people like Mr. Zuma specifically. It's not allowed in law. You, you, you must go to that section that deal with the Zumas of this world, the people who are serving a, a, a section of under 24. That's a, an old uh, 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 and, and, and um, uh, time-tested principle of statutory interpretation. It will be the first time now that we're, we're told that when the decision maker says, I've relied on the specific issue, this person fits there, then we say, no, no, forget that. Well, let's write off the fact that he says himself he relied on Section 75.7 and run to the one that, that looks like it's difficult uh, to, to, to meet. It doesn't work like that, my lord. So the, the, the last point then I want to make, my lord, is about, um, and your, um, it will be quick because your lordship already addressed this, on remedy. Assume that uh, everything uh, uh, we're saying is wrong. Then on what basis can your lordship substitute? You can't substitute, my lord, in a situation where there are new facts. One of the new facts is the fact you have that... one minute left. That's Sorry, fine. You have one minute. Okay, okay, my lord. The, the, but the, you can make a point. No, I, I, I will, my lord. Well, my, my learned friend strayed over a little bit, but it's fine. I'll, 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 I'll stick to the time here. Yeah. The, 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 the point is, is simply this, my lord. One... The, the, as your lordship pointed out, there's now a new, a big new fact, which is that he now qualifies for ordinary parole. That was not the case uh, when the decision was made. But uh, more importantly, we also don't know what the, the medical uh, uh, situation is uh, as we speak now, because the, the, the situation that, that was there in, um, in, in September, also uh, might have changed now, because we know that this was a, mo a moving target. But also, my lord, the, I just want to, there's a note that I made on this. Thing. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the mere fact that he, he, he has, uh, uh, he qualifies for, 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 for parole. And more importantly, my lord, the fact that there's a new national commissioner. The, the, uh, those are the facts. So the, we, we know that from Trancon, uh, one of the reasons why your lordship might do a substitution is if the decision maker says, well, I'm not going to change my mind. Here we have a unique situation where we have a different decision maker a new national commissioner. So on what basis can your lordship say, no, I'm, not, I'm going to deprive the new national commissioner, despite that there are new facts, despite that there might be new medical evidence. <clears throat> and, and I'm even going to deprive the board from, uh, uh, and if your lordship, and I, just give me one, literally half a minute, because this is a point I have to make. Uh, <clears throat> it is uh, Mr. Jamie, uh, very uh, referred your lordship to paragraph to, to, to his heads. I think it was paragraph 20, where he says that. Um, I'm sorry, my lord. Yes. It, funnily enough, I almost put a bet with my juniors that he's not going to read this part. He read out the decision of the, of the board, uh, which is at paragraph 20 of their heads. And he stopped right at the important part. It says, the board also notes and appreciates the use of aliases and so on. From the information received, the applicant suffers from multiple comorbidities. His treatment has been optimized and all conditions have been brought under control. From the available information in the reports, the, the conclusion reached by the MPAB is that the applicant is stable and does not qualify for medical parole according to the act. And Mr. Jamie stopped there, as I predicted. Read the next sentence. It says, the MPAB is open to consider other information should it become available. So your Lordship is now asked to ignore that. And uh, on the basis, that now we know that there is new information. We are two months down the line. There's a new national commissioner. There is, um, and, and the uh, normal parole has kicked in. 
but your lordship must deprive even the board in the, when there's this new information from considering and uh, your, your lordship must make the decision himself and overrule medical practitioners there's no basis in law or any basis that your lordship can do such a thing uh, the, there's no court in this country that is capable of overruling uh, med medical expertise when the decision maker has said, I would like to, to uh, I may re-look at the thing when, when once there's new information. So on those, on those basis, my lord, there is no case whatsoever for review, but even if there is, uh, it's, this is a matter uh, that would that would be crying out for remittal and not substitution. And for the because of the things that were said by Mr. Masuku, we asked for a cost for for three council. We had to deal with three separate applications. And BioWatch does not apply to us. Even if your lordship applies BioWatch to the national commissioner, it does not apply to Mr. Zuma. He's not uh, uh, an organ of state. As the court pleases, my lord. I'm indebted for the Thanks. extra. Couple of minutes, my lord. Thanks, Mr. Mbuku. Uh, Mr. Jammer. In a reply. As the court pleases, can you see and hear me, Justice? Yes, I can see you. I can hear you. It's a better start than I had this morning. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Justice, I'm going to run through my reply um, and try to keep it as succinct as possible. And basically, in the order in which um, we heard the submissions. So I'm sorry I don't have the time to group them thematically. As to my learned friend, Ms. Masuku's um, submission, and where he read out to you what I understood were extracts or an excerpt from a newspaper report, which is not itself before the courts, um, we submit that there's no basis for him to, to do that, and the court will ignore that. Um, um, what he said in that regard. With regard to his imputation, which was also foreshadowed in the affidavits and in the heads of argument, but his oral submissions with regard to the presumed intention of my client to humiliate the former president and to only wish to see him, um, as it was bluntly put, die and to, to be returned to prison for no other reason than public humiliation. The court, I think, did with respect, quite correctly, point out to him that um, the case should be limited to legal submissions. We are not going to um, elevate those insinuations and insults to any level which requires address, simply to say that there is absolutely no factual basis for those assertions. And to put it politely, we decline to accept that they are correct. Um, as to the legal submission that the Mark Lander DA, in order to succeed, is required to assert a right, that is simply an incorrect legal argument. Precisely that argument, um, Justice, was advanced and rejected by the Supreme Court of Appeal in a case concerning my client again, the DA versus the Acting National Director of Public Prosecutions. It's a case we've cited in the heads. And there are two passages I wish to read to you. And as I say, it's the very same argument that was adduced today, that it was, it was necessary to assert a right. And the judge, or the court per NAFSA JA reasons as follows at page 503i in para 44. Section 48 of the Constitution provides that before members of the National Assembly begin to perform their functions, they must swear or affirm faithfulness to the Republic and obedience to the Constitution. All political parties participating in Parliament must necessarily have an interest in ensuring that public power is exercised in accordance with constitutional and legal prescripts and that the rule of law is upheld. They represent constituents that collectively make up the electorate. They effectively represent the public in Parliament. It is in the public interest and of direct concern to political parties participating in Parliament that an institution such as the National Prosecuting Authority act in accordance with constitutional and legal prescripts. It can hardly be argued that, sorry, it can hardly be argued that citizens, citizenry in general would be concerned to ensure that there was no favoritism in decisions relating to prosecutions. Few members of political parties or members of the public have the ability, resources or inclination to bring a review application of the kind under, under discussion. 
And then in paragraph 45, it is a fundamental importance to our democracy that an institution such as the NPA, which is integral to the rule of law, act in a manner consistent, consistent with constitutional prescripts and within its powers as set out in the act. Certainly the membership, and this is the important part, Justice, certainly the membership of the DA can rightly be expected to hold the party they support to the foundational values espoused in the DA's constitution and to expect the DA to do whatever is in its power, including litigating, to foster and promote the rule of law. Therein lies our locus standi, we with respect submit. With regard to the second point in limine that Mr. Masuka argued, Justice, the point of urgency, the argument goes like this, that um, Mr. Zuma is still serving his sentence, and thus the mere fact that um, he has been released on medical parole is no reason to render the matter urgent. In our heads of argument, Justice, on urgency, which you find at page 12, we deal with the relevant principles and the facts. And we make the point that in this division, and we quote the authority of, of Apleni, the President of the Republic, of South Africa for that assertion. In this division, <clears throat> the law is that matters wherein an abuse of power on the part of a public official is alleged, which may impact on the rule of law, are generally regarded as urgent. Um, that is the holding in Apleni. Um, in the ordinary course, Justice, Mr. Zuma's term of imprisonment ends in October 2022. With this matter brought in the ordinary course, it may well not um, have been decided by then, or if it is, there may only be a very short period left for Mr. Zuma's detention in, in prison. And we submit it is of vital importance for the reasons we've set out at some length in our main um, applica or application, rather, and our main address and the written argument. It is not a question of we would like to see Mr. Zuma in jail just because we want to punish him. The fact is he is being punished by the Constitutional Court because of contempt for the Constitutional Court order. But what we want to uphold is the rule of law. And the fact that it's Mr. Zuma or could be someone else is neither here nor there. So with respect, the matter is urgent and the parties, it is in the interest of everyone that there's certainty as soon as possible as to Mr. Zuma's position, more importantly, because he now we accept qualifies for ordinary parole. With regard, with regard to the question of mootness and um, justice, um, Matujani, the argument appears to be that as he qualifies for parole, he could be out in a few weeks, and this and thus it is purposeless to persist with trying to send him back to prison, which would be we submit and agree the natural outcome of um, a successful application. We submit and we deal with mootness at. Sorry, Justice, there is suddenly. I'm sorry. There is suddenly a noise that I can detect on, on my microphone. I don't know. Can you still hear me clearly, Justice? Hello, Judge. Yes, I can hear you, uh, Mr. Jim. I'm going to mute myself, but I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. We deal with mootness justice at page 34 and onward of our heads of argument. And we submit that the matter is clearly not moot in accordance with the ordinary principles of um, mootness. Um, mootness is where a um, Matter, a matter will raise no justiciable live dispute, or rather no justiciable live dispute is raised in the matter. And here, with respect, one very clearly is. The issue in the matter, the issues that arise in the matter and that are live for determination, is whether Mr. Zuma's placing on medical parole was lawful or not, and if not, what the necessary consequence of such a finding should be. Those are both live issues. They are neither precluded in fact or in law by the fact that Mr. Zuma, by any of the factors um, detailed by um, counsel for, for Mr. Zuma or the commissioner, they are not affected by the fact that he now qualifies for ordinary parole 
for the simple reason that there is no such application. But even if there was such an application, till it is determined, till such an application is determined, the issues in this matter could never be factually moot. And as a matter of law, they could never be legally moot. And that is because of the strong authority that we refer to in para 82.2 of our heads. For Telezi in the Supreme Court of Appeal and PECO in the Constitutional Court, which are both authority for the proposition that a determination of whether the state acted lawfully can never be moot. So factually, they're not moot. Uh, this case is not moot, Justice, and legally it can never be moot. And for those reasons, with respect, the mootness argument is without merit. Now, to turn to the merits which I intend traversing, um, the points that, that, that we believe require a reply, I point out it's of some importance, giving the centrality to the arguments of my learned friends for the other side, that neither Dr. Marfa or Dr. Mpatswa have made confirmatory affidavits. You will find the confirmatory affidavits, they follow in the DA bundle, um, Mr. Fraser's affidavit. And what, are, what is signally missing is a, funny, a confirmatory affidavit by either of those two doctors. Now, they are at the center of the National Commissioner's case. The National Commissioner, as I've pointed out, now tries to build a case, having initially denied that Section 79 is, um, is the governing provision. He now appears to accept it today through counsel in argument, but tries to demonstrate how they have complied with Section 79. Mr. Zuma, on the other hand, appears to vacillate and adopt an ambivalent position on what, on some levels ap appearing to accept that Section 79 was applicable, but then, as we heard from Mr. Mpofu this afternoon, asserting that um, Section 75 is a standalone provision, which I'm going to deal with in a moment. But the important point for the, for the present is neither of those two doctors um, have put in confirmatory affidavits which either confirm what is said about them and their reports or explain, particularly in the case of Dr. Martha. And I dealt this morning at some length with the fact, Justice, that Dr. Martha's, and it's not as so much a report, the Part C, it's an evaluation, as I pointed out, um, as per the regulations. The Part C document is an evaluation of the attached report, which has been kept away from the court and from us. So it's an evaluation of the report. It's not a report on its own. That's important to bear in mind. And you get that from Regulation 29A, sub 2 and 3. Um, with regard to the approach, Justice, to the factual aspects, we are not asking the court to second guess, as we've been accused of, the, the medical reports, or for the court to try to um, decide whether Mr. Zuma is medically um, falls within Section 79 1A or not. We accept the medical reports. We accept all the reports insofar as we can see what they say because they've all been heavily redacted. But what we do say, having looked at them, is that none of them say what Section 79 1A requires. That's what we say. That is the DA's case. The court doesn't need a second guess. The court doesn't need to interpret or divine or try to, and there's no reason for us to put in countervailing medical evidence because the medical evidence that they've put up simply doesn't assist them. It doesn't get them over the line. That's the point. And the court, as courts do all the time, only need, court only needs to look at the evidence that they've put up. And you'll see, and I repeat the assertion, the submission I made this morning, never in the affidavits do they assert, whether obliquely or directly, that Mr. Zuma is either um, terminally ill or so incapacitated, physically incapacitated, so as to fall within the compass of 79 1A. That's the point. Um, in para 519 of the um, heads that the Commission has put up, Justice, and this is of some importance, they paraphrase in 519 what um, they say. Dr. Martha says, now, I don't know whether you have access to, to those heads at para 519, but this is of some importance. Um, and you heard Mr. Mpofu this afternoon make very vigorous submissions. He pointed, he took the court to the Part C document at 590, and he went to question 5D, and he 
read that and he said, well, what else could it mean? And he says, that's the end of the case. Now, with respect, I made submissions in that regard this morning. The problem with 5, 5D, Justice Matajani, to reiterate is that it doesn't track the wording of um, 791A. That's its first problem. The second problem is it's unclear what this formulation means. But we know this formulation has no relevance or origin in law. This is simply a form. So the purpose of this form, I reiterate, is to get the evaluating physician, who should be a correctional services official, to evaluate the medical parole application. That's the purpose of this form. And you see it says on top, to be completed by the correctional medical practitioner. It appears that it was improperly, improperly as it were, completed by Dr. Marfa, who it seems from the papers, I was incorrect in my submission this morning, is not an employee of correctional services. He's an employee of SARMS, the South African Medical Health Service. See, it's not clear why and how he can fill out this form. But leaving that aside, as I said, it's not an issue that we've raised as a ground for review. The point is, the way he filled this form out and the form itself can't lend any legal validity. It has no standalone legal validity. It doesn't constitute, and especially because of the unhappiness with which it's framed, it doesn't constitute justice, a finding upon which the court can rely to the effect that Mr. Zuma is either um, terminally ill or that he suffers from physical incapacity as provided for. And I just reiterate the position or, or the submission I made. There's a fundamental dissonance, dissonance, sorry, between being terminally ill and being chronically ill. Terminal suggests death within a reasonable time, as you reflected in, in the very um, definition at the bottom of this page. Chronic suggests a long and, and very often debilitating. Um, you can have a question, just sum up your submission. Sorry, Justice, I was told I had 20 minutes and I, I have five and now four minutes left. Can I utilize that time? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm always done, Justice. Um, sorry, the one point I just want to make is this, and it's, it's quite an important one. In the heads of argument, at para 519.1, at 519.1.1, um, the heads attempt to summarize the question and answer that I've just dealt with in 5D. But then in 5.19.1.2, it attempts to summarize the question and answer on at para 5F at page 591. And there, its summary is the following. Mr. Zuma. So the assertion is that Dr. Farmer, Dr. Marfa's report clearly states that 51912, Mr. Zuma was unable to perform daily activities and self-care and under full-time comprehensive medical care of the medical team. Now that is a misstatement, Justice. As I as I tell you this morning, submitted to you, 5F, if you go there at 591 of the papers, he was given a choice, Dr. Marfa, to delete the word able or the word unable. He doesn't do either. He leaves both there. So it's not correct to say that his report states that Mr. Zuma was unable. His report does not state that. And I, I ask you to bear that in mind. Um, and with regard to the question, and, and, and this will be um, my last submission to you, um, Justice, with regard to the question of 24 hour care not being available, that is a red herring with respect, because whatever treatment Mr. Zuma is receiving at the moment, now that he's out of prison, from um, South African Medical Health Services, is precisely the treatment that he could have received inside prison. There's absolutely no distinction. We deal in our heads with why it's a fallacy, and in fact an absurd argument to say that correctional services cannot accommodate people and therefore you can't have 24 hour service. If you are there on a shift, working the night shift, you're not being accommodated. You're working. If you're a, a SAMS doctor to take care of a patient, Mr. Zuma, doesn't require accommodation. That's a, a, a misconstruction. 
So just this, and then, sorry, I know I've said the last submission, but um, there are two more submissions, if you will allow me. The one goes to Mr. Mpofu's argument based on there being a distinction between less than 20 months and more than 20, less than 24 months and more than 24 months. And he says, well, 75.7 deals with less than 24 months. Therefore, it's a standalone provision. We point out that 75.1 deals with more than 24 months. And that also contains no reference to Section 79. So on Mr. Mpofu's argument, there'd be no reason whether you above 24 months or below 24 months and you require medical parole to ever refer to Section 79 or utilize it. And that's an absurd construction. The more um, reasonable construction is that, as we submitted this morning, 75 governs the who and 79 governs the how. Then my very last submission, I promise you, Justice, on substitution, Mr. Mpofu says they're new facts. We don't know what the medical condition is, um, et cetera, in order to say substitution is not warranted. With respect, Justice, the application that is being considered at the moment is an application involving the placing of Mr. Zuma on medical parole as revealed in this case. If we are correct on either of our first two grounds, then there's only, then he can never get medical parole on those facts. And thus, that application, which is the only one being determined in this case, the result of it is a foregone conclusion. Hence, the court is permitted, in accordance with TrendCon, to substitute. We accept if we come home on one of the other um, bases, then we don't, we don't ask for substitution. But our submission is nothing is going to change. The new facts, the fact that he now um, qualifies for parole, changes nothing. Those are our submissions. We persist with the relief. As the court pleases, thank you for the opportunity of addressing and running but over. Thank you, Justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my lord. Yes, thank you, Mr. Dickerson. My lord. I'm going to attempt to reply thematically as best I might in answer to Mr. Mpachele's submissions, then Mr. Nsuku's uh, submissions, and then lastly, Mr. Mpofu's submissions. If I might start then on the question of urgency, and very briefly, my lord, because of course we think there's something of a surreality for us all at this hour still to have heard submissions about how the matter is not urgent. And uh, after all of the papers and the heads of argument and the detailed submissions. But my Lord, it is important just to get rid of this point by highlighting how it's an opportunistic one. And it's very straightforward, my Lord. If one looks at SFA2 in case lines 004-41, 004-41, my Lord, you'll see this is a letter from the Office of the State Attorney it's on the 21st of September 2021, my Lord. And if you look over the page at 004-42, you'll, you'll see that the state attorney says, we hold instructions not to oppose part A in all three matters and to comply with your request for reasons and in, they say, compiling the report. And uh, they then also go on, my Lord, you'll see at paragraph eight to say subsequent to the consultation, uh, a decision was made to compile the record. And then finally, my Lord, they say, at um, paragraph 11 of that letter, 004-44, they say, we therefore propose that the legal representative should seek a hearing with the DJP for a directive on how this matter should proceed and to further request a special allocation, my Lord. All of which, of course, speaks to the idea that they've accepted that there is urgency. But most, most critically as a cut through, my Lord, yours, as I've just said to you, they say they've hold instructions not to oppose part A in all three matters. Now, my Lord, when one goes to part A of this application, and my Lord, part A, you will see the notice of motion at 001-1. You'll see two important things that they are not opposing in part A, my Lord. First of all, you'll see that part A, at paragraph one, there's the usual prayer for dispensing with the forms and service provided in terms of the rules, disposing of part A as one of urgency. And then very importantly, my, my Lord, you'll see at paragraph four, which they also don't oppose in light of what I've just read to you from the state attorney's, let, uh, state attorney's letter at 001-3, you'll see they're directing the parties to approach the DJP for the allocation of an urgent hearing date for part B. So my Lord, with respect, it's simply opportunistic for them now in this <clears throat> late stage of the case to try and contend against urgency. 
Lord, separately, there's a second feature of the National Commissioner's argument, and that's around the decision of the National Commissioner, who, as our learned friend suggested, has a discretion to decide, and therefore implicitly we understood his argument to ignore the board's recommendation. Well, my Lord, our learned friend never once dealt with the law which we'd highlighted around objective jurisdictional facts. He didn't once explain why the trite proposition from the Kimberley High School judgment by his Lordship, Mr. Justice Brunt in the SCA, wasn't binding on them. And it's just as well to recall, my Lord, that our learned friends, neither for Mr. Zuma nor for the National Commissioner, ever contested any of the four constitutional principles that I highlighted for my Lord at the outset of my address. They've also never explained, my Lord, not once, once in terms of the Similani test, why the board's decision as a jurisdictional fact can be rejected or overruled. They have never once explained that, my Lord. What they've attempted to do instead is to argue that the regulations, as our learned friends put it, can't be used to interpret the act. And they suggested it can't be used to introduce processes and procedures into the act. But my Lord, there are two fatal problems with that argument. The first problem is that it totally ignores that a process has been stipulated in the act under section 79, subparagraph three. And they've just, nobody, not, not a single one of our learned friends has referenced section 79, sub three, my Lord, because they can't, they can't get around it. That section 79, sub section three says, the minister must establish a medical advisory board to provide an independent medical report to the national commissioner in addition to the medical report referred to in subsection 2C. My Lord, it's, we understand why they've not dealt with it, but simply ignoring a statutory provision doesn't mean that it's not there. It's binding on them, and they have not given my Lord an answer as to how they could possibly sidestep it. In any event, my Lord, the regulations that they rely on have to be read consistently with the Act. Those regulations are binding on them. They've never been set aside. And Regulation 29A7, which sets out the process that our learned friends acknowledge is there in the regulations, was binding on the National Commissioner. There's no excuse for him not to have followed it, my Lord. The next point by our learned friends is around Dr. Marfa. And of course, both our learned friends um, embrace Dr. Marfa enthusiastically. But in doing so, my Lord, there are a number of problems with that embracing. First of all, they say that, this is um, for the National Commissioner's Council, they say that, well, the National Commissioner can look at both Dr. Marfa's report and the board's report and can decide, my Lord. Well, no, no, that's simply not so, my Lord. How does the National Commissioner decide? He's not a medical doctor, my Lord. Remember what Mr. Zuma's own concession was in his papers at case lines 005-154 that I read for my Lord from paragraph 237. There he said, the National Commissioner is not a doctor to have been expected to make medical conclusions on my medical health. Well, precisely, my Lord. And of course, we know here that it's not a case of the medical commissioner being able to pick and choose between two medical reports, my Lord. Our learned friends repeatedly in their argument failed to deal with the chronology, the chronology which shows that Dr. Marfa's report came early on. It came early on in July, and it came before um, Mr. Zuma had been sent away under Section 44 for treatment, and which then stabilized his condition. And it's the board that then decided later on the 2nd of September, my Lord, on the basis of expert reports on an up-to-date basis that Mr. Zuma's conditions had been stabilized. Mr. Mkhele <clears throat> also then highlights Dr. Marfa again, but with respect, he misreads 004-110, the form that was filled in by Dr. Marfa. I've already read from my Lord earlier, and it's all set, it out, set out in our heads as to why this is a misreading. It's just a basic set of propositions, again, which our learned friends have never dealt with. Dr. Marfa did not give a straight answer. That's the first point, my Lord. He did not give a straight answer in filling out the form, which categorically said that Mr. Zuma is suffering from a terminal illness or severe physical incapacity. It's just not there. Secondly, Dr. Marfa's report is outdated, as I've said, my Lord. It's the 28 July report, and that report was given before Mr. Zuma was stabilized. The board had the benefit of that stabilized evidence from experts who explained the position, and the board came to its view, five doctors, my lord, um, deciding very differently to Dr. Martha, with the benefit of 
expert reports up to date and which Dr. Marfa didn't have. And all those findings, my Lord, by Dr. Marfa, another point critically against our learned friends, which they simply ignore, is that those findings by Dr. Marfa that they now so enthusiastically embrace, my Lord, ex post facto, were not contained in the reasons given by Mr. Fraser at the time that he took his decision. My Lord will go and read Mr. Fraser's reasons. They are not in any way stating or referring to what Dr. Marfa has said. What Dr. Marfa has said, and which is now relied on by our learned friends, is all put up in the answering affidavit. So that's the third difficulty with Dr. Marfa. There's a fourth and final difficulty with him, which is, of course, the board knew what Dr. Marfa had said. It's not as though they didn't know about it, but they decided differently. Five doctors decided that they thought that whatever he had said at, his, at that particular time he made his report had been overtaken by new evidence, new facts, and the reality of Mr. Zuma having been stabilized in his condition. Lord, the next point by our learned friends is that they say that Mr. Zuma needed to be stabilized with special care. They make much of this, as does Mr. Zuma. And they keep making the point that somehow the board was in some other way uh, not caring enough of Mr. Zuma when they failed to take into account that he needed this special care. Well, my Lord, that's simply not so. The board told us in the 2nd of September report, he was stabilized. His condition was under control. They were clearly caring for him and they were worried about the position. That's why they called for extra expert reports. But with those extra expert reports, they came to the view that he was not terminally ill and that he was not severely physically incapacitated. And so, my Lord, this commission's criticism of the board for not supposedly worrying about Mr. Zuma's care is misguided. It did worry about his care. And of course, this vaunted concern by our learned friends for Mr. Zuma's need for special care is a severe own goal by them, my Lord, my Lord because the medical commissioner, or the national commissioner, I should say, released Mr. Zuma on medical parole. Where to, my Lord? Not to a specialist hospital. Not to a specialist hospital. They released him home, my Lord. And so, in that respect, that argument goes absolutely nowhere either. Our learned friend, finally, my Lord, says, well, they are not making a mistake by trying to invoke ex post facto reasons because they're simply trying to give clarity in their answering affidavit. My Lord, I don't need to do more than highlight all the cases which we've already referenced in our heads. You may not try and give clarity by new reasons, which is exactly what you'll see in the answering affidavit. For instance, the, the embracing of Dr. Marfa. Um, that is impermissible. So, my Lord, let me turn then next to Mr. Masuku for Mr. Zuma. His big point was a standing point, and he quite rightly said that it was an unenviable point um, that he had to argue, my Lord. It's unenviable, not least of all, my Lord, because he has plainly forgotten with respect to him 10 years of our constitutional court's jurisprudence when he said to, your Lord, to my Lord that we don't meet the test, any of the applicants under Section 38, because we haven't highlighted a right in the Bill of Rights that we are coming to vindicate. Well, my Lord, uh, my learned friend, Mr. Jamie, has already read from the DA case, which says that that's plain wrong. But my Lord, there's a case that the Constitutional Court has decided. I'm going to give you the reference. It's a case called JASA. My Lord will remember it. It's the case about the extension of the former Chief Justice's tenure. And in that case, JASA, the Center for Applied Legal Studies, CASAC and Freedom Under Law, my Lord, all parties like my client, the Helen Sussman Foundation, went directly to the Constitutional Court. And they sought to vindicate not a right in the Bill of Rights, my Lord. They sought to vindicate the question of tenure of the judiciary not a right in the Bill of Rights, a constitutional principle alone. And the Constitutional Court, my Lord, in JASA, it's 2011, Volume 5, Essay 388, CC, my Lord, at paragraph 17, said resign. I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Sorry, my Lord. Please beginning to think for me. My Lord, the uh, Constitutional Court at paragraph 17 in JASA, um, said emphatically, my Lord, that each of those parties had standing, and they had standing under Section 38, despite the fact that there was no Bill of Rights um, implicated um, in their argument, but that it was a constitutional principle that they were vindicating. My Lord, our learned friend then says that he has misgivings, and in fact went further and criticized the motives 
of my client as well as the, um, the, the DA, my lord. Let me just make two things very clear. The HSF is not a political organization, as our learned friend repeatedly and unfortunately stated, eliding us with the Democratic Alliance. Well, the Democratic Alliance is a political party. The HSF is not a political party and it's not a political organization. Well, our learned friend said, well, what are they looking for? And this, he kept asking that. What are they looking for in this case? Well, my lord, the answer is a straightforward one. We're looking for respect for the rule of law and a vindication of the constitutional court's judgment in this case. And our learned friend repeatedly impugned the motives of our client. Like my learned friend, Mr. Jammy, not to give any oxygen to the gratuitous statements um, that were cast, unfortunately, as slurs against the applicants. I prefer, my lord, what the Constitutional Court itself has said about my client, the Helen Sussman Foundation. It's in the McBride versus Minister of Police judgment of the Constitutional Court, 2016, volume 11, BCLR 1398, my lord, CC at paragraph three, where the court said the HSF is a non-governmental organization whose main objective is to defend the values that underpin our constitutional democracy and to promote respect for human rights and the rule of law, my lord. My Lord, if I might then turn to Mr. Mpofu's arguments very briefly. As I understood his arguments, he said there were three mountains that it was impossible for us or my Lord to scale. The first, my Lord, he said, this court, he said it very, very um, um, vigorously, my Lord. He said, this court can't second guess the medical evidence. Oh, my Lord, that's deeply ironic because, of course, what's good for the court is good for the medical commissioner, for the uh, national commissioner. The national commissioner, my Lord, also could not second guess the medical evidence. And that's the very point, Town Lord. There is a medical body, the expert body of five doctors who's looked at this evidence and they've decided the question of medical parole. It's not for my Lord to second guess that board, but it's also not for the National Commissioner to second guess that board. Our learned friend, Mr. Mpofu, went on to say rather brazenly, he said, there's not a single shred of evidence, he said, those were his words, not a single shred of evidence that the applicants bring to court, my Lord, around why Mr. Zuma should not be permitted medical parole. Well, he seems to have overlooked, of course, the most important piece of evidence in this case, which is the medical parole board's finding. That's the evidence that we brought to this court as a jurisdictional fact of an expert body, independently so, who looked at the evidence on an up-to-date basis and said, no, the man is not entitled to medical parole for the reasons that they said they'd identified under the Act. And so, my Lord, this mountain, number one, with respect, is very easily scaled. The second mountain, my Lord, is the mountain that our learned friend repeatedly attempted to um, have all of us scale, and that's this idea that somehow there needs to be an expert body or expert care or facility available on, as, I, as my learned friend put it, 24-hour basis for Mr. Zuma. But that's not the test, my Lord, under the Act. The Act doesn't say anything about this type of facility being available. My Lord, the most important point is that you'll see what Dr. Martha says about this. If you look at 004113, our learned friends embrace Dr. Martha, as I say, with much enthusiasm, my Lord. So let us go and see what he himself says about um, the care that is required for Mr. Zuma. And you'll see it at 004-113 at the bottom of the page, my Lord. It says, under the answer to the question 6.2, availability of the required healthcare services for the specific condition within the department. It says, patient is under the full-time medical care of the Psalms doctors with a specialist team assigned for the role. So my Lord, Dr. Martha himself recognizes that there was a perfectly appropriate body of expert doctors available to care for Mr. Zuma, and they had him done, indeed done so. And that's the very care, remembering, my Lord, that the medical parole, or, or the, rather the National Commissioner, released Mr. Zuma to at Nkandla when he granted him medical parole. And he has been stabilized, my Lord. You'll know that he's been stabilized because of what the board has already found. My Lord, the third mountain, very quickly, is the section 75 point. Our learned friend, Mr. Mpofu, um, now tries to silo off section 75.7 <clears throat> on the basis supposedly of a media release where he says that originally the National Commissioner said that that was the basis upon which he took his decision. We, we say with respect to him, it, there's an otherworldly nature about this argument for these reasons. First of all, my Lord, all of us in this case 
including the national commissioner who took the decision, have been speaking about terminal illness and whether there's a severe physical incapacity. Why have we been doing so, my Lord? Because those are the requirements under Section 79 of the Act. Lord. Secondly, our learned friend, Mr. Mpofu, glossed over or has forgotten that his own client, as I read to my Lord in my address, made his application in terms of Section 79. So in Section 79 terms, Mr. Zuma cast his own application, and that's at case lines 004-87. And my Lord, of course, you've already seen that the decision maker himself, who of course counts, he doesn't see his decision as being siloed in this way because the decision maker himself says that he took his decision under 75.7 as read with the requirements in section 79. My Lord, let me finalize my address very briefly by saying what it is that we think is appropriate on remedy, then I'll be one minute, my Lord. My Lord, we say that the appropriate remedy, and we've listened to the debate between all of the parties and my Lord, the appropriate remedy, if we're right, is that there must, under 172.1a of the Constitution, there must, must be a declarator declaring that the National Commissioner's decision was unlawful. And my Lord, therefore, that declarator's effect would be that medical parole is revoked, obviously, and the automatic consequence of that, my Lord, would be that the Constitutional Court's order of a 15-month term of imprisonment is reinstated. So the declarator would do almost all the work required in this case in and of itself. Secondly, my Lord, there's no difficulty with granting that. Our learned friends repeatedly try and make something of the fact that by doing so, my Lord will be sending Mr. Zuma back into some form of risky territory in, in prison. Well, with respect, it's not the case for two reasons. The only evidence, firstly, my Lord, that you have before you is that of the expert board. And that board has found, my Lord, that his medical condition is under control and stable. And secondly, my Lord, if you were to return him to prison, he would be returning to prison to receive exactly the same expert medical care, my Lord, that he's receiving right now at home and in Kandla, remembering that it's the Psalms team that are treating him at Nkandla. It would be the same Psalms team that is treating him in the hospital. And my Lord, third and finally, once returned, and really, my Lord, we don't think we should be having to say all of this because it seems to us reasonably clear. Once returned, he can then apply for ordinary parole, my Lord. He can even apply for medical parole. And if he needs any special care, my Lord, during that time, then like any other prisoner, he can apply for a section 44 temporary release as he had in the past, and he can go for specialist care if needs be. But the point is, my Lord, he hasn't yet returned. He hasn't yet returned, my Lord. And, and he hasn't yet made an application for ordinary parole. And Lord, he hasn't done so because he only gets to make that application once he's returned to prison. So my Lord, bottom line is we say that the decision by the National Commissioner should be declared unconstitutional, invalid, and set aside. And once that's done, with respect, my Lord, um, everything else that ordinarily should be the case will immediately be restored. Those are our submissions in reply. Thank you, my Lord, for the time. I know I went an extra minute and a half over. Yes, Mr. Labuskarten. My pleasure, my Lord. Firstly, uh, the applicant, my matter, active forum, is not a political party. That much is evident from the notice of motion. There is no basis in the answering affidavit, uh, or in both answering affidavits, to counter that. Mr. Zuma's counsel delivered impermissible, insofar as may be relevant, uh, testimony from the bar in that regard, which is not allowed. Unfortunately, that is the case for a number, for the greater number of submissions made on behalf of Mr. Zuma. Now, again, apart from the delivered heads of argument and the argument now, I align myself with the submissions already made by Mr. Jamie and Mr. Duplessis. It's, of course, a benefit to argue after esteemed uh, senior colleague, colleagues, for which I am grateful for. My Lord, turning to the legislation issue, and uh, the Commissioner would want your Lordship to believe that the regulations uh, do not or, or uh, can be disregarded easily. If I understand the first respondent correctly, 
uh, issues taken with the correctional services regulations as not being legislation. And this pertains then to the recommendation to be made by the medical uh, parole advisory board. My Lord, it is strike law that regulations are subordinate or delegated legislation, but still legislation. It cannot simply be ignored. The ambit of, of subordinate legis legislation, such as regulations, are determined vis-a-vis -vis the original superior uh, legislation, in this instance, the uh, Correctional Services Act. Now, my learned friend, uh, Mr. Dubassi, correctly, uh, with respect, pointed your lordship out or, or directed your lordship to, to uh, section 79.3a, uh, where it is stated in the CSA that the minister must establish a medical advisory board to provide the independent medical report to the national commissioner. Now, your lordship, if your lordship turns over, or if, if one considers the uh, section 79 sub 8, the minister must make within six months after promulgation of this act, regulations regarding the processes and procedures to follow in the consideration and administration of medical parole. And that is exactly what regulation 29A7 provides for, that there must be a positive recommendation by the medical uh, parole advisory board. Lastly, section 239 of the constitution provides that national legislation includes subordinate legislation made in terms of an act of parliament, such as the regulations made in terms of the CSA. The argument leveled by the respondents in that regard is bad in law and of no moment. My Lord, turning to standing, AFI Forum set out that it is an interested person in terms of section 58A and D of the constitution. Only one is required to vest standing. That is explicitly stated in the founding affidavit at case lines 03-15, paragraph 10.9, which is the conclusion to the subparagraphs in paragraph 10. Now, paragraph 10 consists of nine subparagraphs. What is also stated in paragraph 10 of the founding affidavit, in paragraph 10.2, is that AfriForum is an active non governmental organization involved in the protection and development of civil rights within the context of the Constitution. And it was created to promote democracy through public participation. Apart from its members, which respondents focus on in, in their heads of argument, apart from its members, in paragraph 10.3, AFRIFORUM also states that AFRIFORUM brings this application in the public interest. It goes further. In paragraph 10.4, the opponent states that this is a matter that concerns the rule of law and public accountability in the Republic of South Africa. AFRI Forum then states at paragraph 10.5 that it is committed to the continuous monitoring of the status of the rule of law in South Africa and to take appropriate action when the rule of law is at risk. AFRI Forum states at paragraph 10.6 that it is committed to the value of the rule of law and the equal application of, application of the law. The foresaid, my lord, are sufficient grounds which make make standing apparent from the nature of AFRIFORUM's interest with the issues and the explanation offered to support standing. AFRIFORUM exhibited in the founding affidavit a legal interest which is not denied and cannot be denied. Now I pause to mention that the respondents have failed in their answers and arguments to address the four set subparagraphs in paragraph 10 of the founding affidavit. I will show the court briefly how. It is striped that in terms of section 6.1 of PAJA, any person may institute proceedings for judicial review, and that the broad approach applies to standing in respect, in respect of section 38 of the Constitution and standing under PAJA in terms of the joint concepts principle. 
That is the end of the reported attack on standing. The applicant, Afri Forum, has standing, and it is acting in the public interest and has shown public interest to which the respondents have failed to answer. Instead, nitpicking on irrelevance, such as a class action on behalf of members. On that score, the founding affidavit does state that AFI Forum is acting on behalf of its members. But it goes further and also states, in terms of the report I've already mentioned, that it is acting in the public interest. Specifically, the public interest in ensuring that government abides by the law, and specifically where the system governing medical parole is being abused by the Commissioner and Mr. Zuma, makes this a matter of public interest. Now, AFRI Forum deals with the aforesaid public interest in paragraphs 10.2, this is important, my lord, to 10.8 in the founding affidavit, with the conclusion at paragraph 10.9 in respect of AFRI Forum relying on sections on section 38, sub A and B. Notably, then, Mr. Fraser fails to deal with paragraphs 10.4 with 10.8 in the founding affidavit. And Mr. Zuma fails to deal with the forced public interest grounds raised by Afri Forum in totality, safe to cause undue dispersions without the semblance of proof and into which dark pit I will also not venture. In terms of paragraph 10.3, of the founding affidavit, where AFI Forum states that uh, it brought this application in the public interest, as well as in the office members, Mr. Fraser attempts to answer in a nonsensical terrain concerning a class action or not, and then incorrectly relying on Section 38C of the Constitution and drawing broad legal conclusions without any factual basis. The high water mark of the objection is at the answering affidavit of Mr. Fraser, uh, case lines 13-19, paragraph 15.6, where he states in bold, unsubstantiated fashion that AFRI Forum is not genuinely acting in the public interest and has no stand. Now, my Lord, without providing any semblance of an answer to the subparagraphs I've already alluded to in the founding affidavit. It's thus perplexing why the legal representatives for the Commissioner can state in paragraph 3.8 of their heads of argument that whereas AFRI Forum attempted to explain its public interest but has failed to do so and then only refer to paragraph 10.8 of the founding act. That's, that's uh, uncalled for an improper one. There's no factual or legal base for that conclusion in the heads of all. The logical conclusion is that AFRI Forum has been standing in cause. My Lord, insofar as urgency is concerned, if I may quickly re review my notes in that regard, I agree with Mr. Duplessis that urgency has been overtaken to a large extent. Um, but that in any event, insofar as it may be relevant, it, it bests on two legs. The ongoing illegality perpetrated by the Commission in respect of the medical parole decision and the rule of law and public interest, as well as legitimacy of the judiciary, which is central to relief sought and which must be vindicated. Now, in Kasu, the ongoing assault on the integrity of the judicial press is continuing unabated at the hands of Mr. Zuma and Mr. Fraser. It makes this matter inherently urgent. It concerns the rule of law and the effectiveness of the sanction imposed by the Constitutional Court. The respondents wish to, wish to advance an argument that Mr. Zuma will still be serving his sentence, albeit on medical parole. Now, my Lord, it's a, with respect, a logical fallacy. It's a red herring. 
it's a diversionary uh, it's a diversionary argument which f fails to avoid the key issues. The sanction imposed by the constitutional court is that of incarceration. A lesser sanction was not imposed. The apex court ordered imprisonment only for Mr. Fraser to break the law and override the constitutional court. There is a patent difference between the sanction imposed, incarceration, and parole. The latter, parole, which affords a privilege to a sentenced criminal to avoid incarceration. Properly construed as parole, whether ordinary or medical, is not a criminal serving his sentence, but being afforded the privilege and thus avoiding the sentence. That's for the Correctional Services Act provides in Section 1 a definition for parole. And it's defined as to means or to mean a form of community corrections as contemplated in Chapter 6. And if one considers Chapter 6, uh, Section 50, Community Corrections, the objection objectives of community corrections are, and this is 51A, Roman 1, to afford sentenced offenders an opportunity to serve their sentences in a non-custodial manner. There's, there's a patent difference between the two in that regard. One cannot, can does not equate medical parole to the serving of, of an imposed sentence. Mr. Zuma is out of prison, whilst he should not be. Again, it renders the matter urgent. He is out of prison because Mr. Fraser, on behalf of Mr. Zuma, acted unlawfully and contrary to the empowering legislation. We know now that based on the tact adopted by the respondents, that in due course, they will raise mootness or just an equitable grounds for Mr. Zuma not to be incarcerated when a court in due course finds the medical parole decision unlawful. The respondents thus... Can you can you sum up your submission, Mr. Lavuska? The ten minutes elapsed. Thank you, Mr. The respondents thus approbate and reprobate in respect of their position on urgency. My submission is that the ma this matter is urgent for the reasons already mentioned and that there is a patent absence of substantial addressing reports. AFI Forum seeks an order uh, as per the amended notice of motion. My pleasure, my lord. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Uh, we have come to the end of the case for Mr. Mr. <laughs> Bofu. You can be Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, the right of reply, my lord. Yes. yes. If I may suffice it with the permission of the court. The, yes, my lord, um, the, before, um, I, I'm just going to use five minutes for each of the, of the points in Limine uh, as a response. But before I do that, my lord, I need to, I've said that this case is based on smoke and mirrors and half-truths and uh, downright untruths. The one, and maybe it's my fault because your lordship did raise this and uh, I, I, I thought... So it was when it was repeated. Now I realized that I probably didn't make it clear. This whole thing about ex post facto, my lord, it's a lie. It's it's well, it's an untruth to put it nicely. That this whole thing of, that uh, Dr. Mafa's report was not referred to in the reasons. It's just false. So let's put it to bed. The lordship goes to paragraph one to uh, to the zero zero five dash one twenty one which is the, the reasons that were given by Mr. Fraser. At paragraph eight, 
you'll see a lot of it says, the following documents were presented to me for consideration. Three medical reports by SAMS dated 8 July, 28 July 2021 and 5 August 2021. That second one, 28 July 2021, is Dr. Mafa's report. So this uh, falsity that is peddled here, that uh, the, the that report was only referred to in the answering affidavit, is, is, is exactly that, it's false. Fellowship goes to 005-93. You'll see that the date of, Mr. of Dr. Mafa's report is 28 July 2021. So it's very clear that in front of uh, Mr. Fraser was the report that said, that takes the word directly from the act, that uh, the offender is suffering from a terminal disease or condition uh, which is chronic. So it's not, it's not true that uh, this was a so-called ex post facto or what what. Uh, it's just false. It's, it's one of the smokes and mirrors that underlie the false uh, premises that this case is based on. But let's come then, my lord, to the um, to the three uh, points in limine. You know, the most important way to deal with this thing that I don't have time, my lord, is, is to impress upon the court that these points in limine, although we are raising them separately, obviously, because they are under separate legal headings, must be seen as one, one system. So the agency, local standing, uh, and mootness are all interrelated. The organizing question that can be asked, my Lord, is on what basis can these busy bodies be given audience on an urgent basis to bring a clearly politically motivated application and a publicity stunt uh, in, on, in respect of whose outcome is probably moot on the, for the reasons that we have said. So it covers all three. Agency, the agency is not just something hanging in the air. It is related to the type of application that is before you. This application is a mighty waste of scarce judicial resources because it will achieve nothing except pub, uh, 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 you know, um, posturing, uh, public posturing and uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to score political points. Exactly because it is moot and exactly because the, uh, the subject matter is, is, is politicized. My Lord, I can ask one rhetorical question. Why do these organizations all of them synchronized in a synchronized fashion, bring the same application. Do, is this a coincidence? All three right-wing uh, uh, organizations wake, woke up one day and decided that uh, they want, uh, they are worried about Mr. Zuma. It's just a coincidence. We must accept that. I mean, that how ridiculous. The, the, it, it's not a coincidence. Obviously, this is a caucus position in their racist right-wing uh, circles to raise uh, an issue that uh, they think is political. How many medical uh, paroles or ordinary paroles or correctional services decisions are made by correctional services? Look at section 75, my lord. It, it, it doesn't just deal with medical parole. It says uh, um, correction may be granted day parole, parole, medical parole, uh, and, and correctional, sub, sub, uh, section 79 also deals with uh, correctional supervision uh, and, and so on. Those decisions, I can assure your lordship can take judicial notice. I'm sure they are made by the hundreds every day in correctional services centers around the country. But this one, in all the to the past 27 years. This is the one that provokes uh, right-wing, uh, coordinated, orchestrated, uh, fake tears. No, this, the, our courts cannot be used for that kind of, uh, of, of, of thing. So the, why must this court, on an urgent basis, allow these kinds of people to jump the queue when there are deserving cases of people who, who really have urgent matters? to spend the whole day here in front of a court of law uh, listening to uh, you know, uh, 
falsities and, and propping up a case that is not existent. That is the, the, the gist of the thing. So the standing issue is not just um, um, isolated or the agency issue or the mootness. The mere fact that even if they get that relief, it is in, on, the case, on the facts of this case moot, underlines the fact that this is just a, a political uh, point scoring uh, exercise clothed uh, falsely as a court case. So, the, the, and, and that is a crucial thing. So it's no use, my learned friend, Mr. Jamie, quotes the case of DA versus acting NDPP, but he doesn't read again the important part of that case. Paragraph 45 of that case, NAFSA JA said the following. It, having uh, said that the, the DA uh, could challenge the NDPP's decision and so on, which this is not. It is clearly in the public interest that the issues raised in the review application be adjudicated. And in my view, on the papers before us, this is the important part. It cannot be seriously contended that the DA is not acting genuinely and in good faith in the, in, in the public interest. So in that case, it was specifically excluded, the, the fact that on the papers, it was not alleged that they were not acting in good faith, uh, 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 or, or what is it? Uh, and, in, or, or not genuinely. In this case, we've spent pages and pages showing that they're not acting genuinely. They are pursuing a political uh, agenda. So how can you rely on this case to give them local standing? You can't. This case actually is a case that shows that they should not be given local standing because they're not acting genuinely. They are, uh, you know, they have uh, crocodile tears about one de de decision of, of, of parole, which happens to include their political foe, who is black. So the, they wouldn't do this if, the, if it was uh, this medical parole, we've made that point. If it was the, their favorites, De Klerk or, or P.W. Bota or the, the, those types of, of, of people. This is done specifically because this is a, their political foe and the courts are not here for, to, play, to be playgrounds. If people want to make those political uh, point scoring exercises, they must go and they must call a rally and do it, not in a court of law and waste our time here. So the, the, that's the, how can, how can it be urgent? How can it be urgent to, how can it ever be urgent, my Lord, to take away somebody's rights? They want to take away his right to deprive him of his constitutional right urgently. The, the, the yes. Constitution is there to protect uh, rights, not to take them away, urgently or otherwise. Yes. Anyway. Mbufu, I see you have five minutes. Can you sum up your submissions? Yes, Mr. Mr. Mpashele, you're also going to reply. No, Mr. Patel has said that this time yes. to me. <laughs> oh, yes, continue. Yes, I'm going to okay. reply on the on the two preliminary points. That is agency, and the point that they raised. Yeah. Let's, let's, I'll, I'll okay, let's afford Mr. Mr. Mbofu to wrap up, and then we we'll move on to Mr. Pashana. Yeah. Thank you, my lord. So the, the 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 issue really is that, and on the issue of mootness specifically, my lord. I, I did say uh, after Mr. Masuku that unfortunately that point cuts both both the as a, a preliminary point, but also on the issue of remedy. And the, what we say there, my lord, is very simple. These uh, people, the DA Afri Forum and uh, Helen Sussman Foundation, uh, they they say that when you because remember one of the bases for substitution must be is bias. So they are caught between their own uh, 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 misrepresentations. Because for bias, they then say no, because Mr. Fraser was um, appointed by the, uh, uh, Mr. Zuma uh, for some position in the national intelligence or whatever. Therefore, he, he, he is biased. Fine, let's say that is the case. But then that submission is an own goal because then, if that is the case, then you cannot attribute that same bias to Mr. Tobakhale, who is the current national commissioner. So you can't have it both ways. You can't want bias uh, against Mr. Fraser, who is now out of the picture, and then want substitution against Mr. Tobakhale, who is not accused of, of that bias. 
that's just uh, cheating the system because you are using the, the ground based on Trancon uh, and, and using it against an innocent person, so to speak. So again, the, 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 it just shows the bankruptcy of the, of the um, uh, blood test relief that they want. Uh, because, and I want to end it on this, my lord, on this point, that the, the what, what's the, Mr. Duplessis calls a concession when we say the National Commissioner is not a doctor and he cannot make medical conclusions. That's not a concession, that's a correct statement. That's why he relies on medical practitioners who make recommendations to him. How can you make recommendations to somebody and then you say that person is now uh, second guessing. <laughs> What's the point of making a recommendation to a person if they cannot make the decision? They're not second guessing. But the fact that the National Commissioner is not a doctor is exactly because Mr. Duplessis is also not a doctor. Neither are you, my lord. So none of, of uh, nobody can second guess the, that's the point I made when I, I opened here, that just as the National Commissioner could not make medical conclusions, neither can the DA or the Helen Sussman Foundation, nor a court. But then what the National Commissioner was doing was not to make medical conclusions. He, he was receiving a report directed at him. But what you, my Lord, are being asked to do is to make medical conclusions, to say, oh, no, uh, that 24 hours uh, means that it can be done by this one. No, this word chronic doesn't mean those are medical conclusions, which you are the law, the case, the court is being asked to, do, to, to make so as to come to the conclusion that uh, the decision was irrational. So there's no case here, my Lord. It's just a waste of time, a waste of, of the court's time. It's not urgent. It's, uh, there's no standing on, on, on behalf of these uh, 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 parties. They have not shown any, and, and they are not acting in good faith, and uh, they are pursuing a, a political agenda using our courts. And it must come to a stop, because it happens all the time that they have to pursue their political opponents using uh, the courts. But if the courts are happy with it, that's fine. But at least for our part, we don't want to be part of that political football and yo-yoing uh, of these parties, as the court pleases. Thanks, Mr. Thanks. As the as the court pleases, my lord. I think I'll just be brief and I'll deal firstly with the issue of agency. Uh, your lordship would see that after all, there are two requirements of agency uh, that needed to be complied with by the applicants. They've always been dealing with the first one, which relates to the, the reason why the matter is urgent. But however, the second issue, they've all ignored to deal with it. And 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 this one was and we referred to, to, in my heads of argument, to the case of O'Sullivan and another versus the National Director of Public Prosecution, where in um, Smeggy J, aptly stated in paragraph 16 that Rule 612 provides for a, that a judge in agent application may dispense with the forms and services provided for in the rules and, and dispose of the matter as he or she deems fit. And after that, in support of the application in terms of 612, shall set forth explicitly the circumstances which an applicant averse renders the matter agent also given reasons why he claims that he could not be afforded substantial redress at the hearing in due course. And the issue of absence or, or presence of substantial redress in due course is a main, in the main, determines the agency of the matter. And, and we have pointed out that the applicants have always been alleging that the they've they, been alleging that they that the the mr zuma should be sent back to jail and that the term when he was not in prison should not be counted in in in, in determining the period of his incarceration and we said that that in itself is a substantial redress which they could have sought in terms of, of the normal opposed motion and therefore, the fact that they then now making reference to the, 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 that, that the, the, the sentence is expiring in October 2022 is of no assistance to them. That's the first point. And the second point we pointed out, and with reference to the Patash case, was that because Mr. Zuma is serving his sentence, and therefore is now serving his sentence under community corrections, it can therefore not the fact that his 
is, is, is not in prison be regarded as not a punishment. Because whether it's in prison or not, that still amounts to serving a sentence. So it, 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 it doesn't help them for them to say that uh, the only way in, in which to vindicate or to, to deal with the fact that the, the Constitutional has imposed a sentence that it, 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 to take away the rights of now the other organs of state of state to deal with a sentence offender as provided for in the law. The law gives the right to now the administrative organs to now deal with an, a sentence offender. And and if the the, 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 the the national commissioner now decided based on the on the discretion that he says that you know on the on the evidence that was before him that he's now going to put Mr. Zuma on medical parole that is still serving a sentence. That's still part of the sentence that has been serving because he is not free. That's the first point. Now, on the issue of which was raised by Mr. Labos on just an equitable remedy. Malot, we, we have made reference in our heads to to the case of Mosema Road Constructions uh, versus uh, kind civil engineering contractors, I think it's page, page 34 of our heads, where in the, the court said the following, the Supreme Court of, of, of Appeal said the following, when a review is eventually considered, issues such as public interest, pragmatism, and practicality will become relevant in exercising a judicial discretion whether or not to set aside an award of a 10. And this was in the context of the tender. And the court then said, the consequence of setting aside that award will play no part where the award is void because of fraud or corruption and seriously of it like However, there is no suggestion such behavior in this case. And then the court then went on that, while the principle of legality generally requires that invalid administrative acts should be set aside, the court has a discretion to refuse this remedy in the interest of justice. This normally arises in the context of third parties having altered their positions on the basis of the administrative action was valid and such suffers prejudice if the administrative action is set aside. Now, in this case, Mr. Zuma was not involved in the decision on whether he should be placed on medical parole or not. And therefore, he has actually and that altered his position in line with that decision. And this is one of the issues in the exercises of the court, you know, jurisdiction on what is just and equitable, that it has to take that into consideration to say he has altered his position. He was not the one that is responsible for taking the decision. And he has therefore, you know, the, the 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 third respondent was not a party and and therefore and would suffer prejudice if the administrative action is set aside so that is one of the consideration that the honorable court has to take into cognizance if it has to decide on whether to set aside that administrative action or not and 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 that the, the just and equitable jurisdiction is, a, is is what is provided for in terms of section 174 of the constitution well, that would only be our, that would be our our our. No, no. The last point, my lord, is the issue that was raised that by by Mr. Jamie to say the report of Dr. Marfa is old. I think also Mr. Dipple says that well. After all, if you look at it, it's something that happened before before the uh, medical parole and adversary board took the decision. Now, my lord, we we. I want to refer your lordship to Regulation 29A1. It says, if it is established by the health status examination, as contemplated in Section 65 of the Act, or any subsequent health status examination, that a sentence offender is suffering from a condition of which prognosis indicates a condition listed in Subsection 5, such facts must be recorded in the in, in the in the in the prescribed register. And 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 now, if one make reference to what is said in section 65 section 65 refers to the the health examination that is normally conducted when a person and a sentence officer uh, arrives in prison it says the following um uh, as soon as possible after admission every inmate must be undergo a health status examination which must include testing for contagious and communicable diseases as defined in the health act now so that information 
the health information of an offender or not is relevant, irrespective of whether it was taken when the prisoner enters the prison, or whether that particular status is something that was subsequently uh, uh, determined when the offender is still. So it is, it is wh whether it was done in, in August or it was done in, 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 in July, it's of no relevance, it, it doesn't matter. That information would have to be taken into consideration. And it was, it was therefore within the ambit and the, the discretion of the National Commissioner to consider the, 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 the report of Dr. Mafa. And therefore that report, it was not outdated. Mala, those, would, those are our submissions, unless your lordship would want us to deal with any other aspect as the court pleases. Thanks, 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 Mr. Mpazele. Thanks to all the captains for your insights and helpful heads. Judgment is reserved. I will be time to consider the matter because, as is clear, the matter is voluminous and it raises issues of public interest. I will need time to consider the matter, but I will endeavor to deliver the judgment as soon as possible. Dr. James, you are all excused. As the board is. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.